Publisher's Preface of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Pictures. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Pictures by Palmer Cox. Publisher's Preface not only is truth stranger than fiction but it is funnier also just as some men have no eye for colors but are color-blind so some men have no eye for fun but are fun-blind happy is the man who can see the humor which bubbles up in daily life doubly happy he who having seen can tell the fun to others and so spread the glad contagion of a laugh but thrice happy is the man who having seen can tell the fun and having told can picture it for others eyes and so roll on the rollicking humor for the brightening of a world already far too sad palmer cox is one who sees and tells and pictures all the fun within his reach as this volume of frontier humor will certainly attest end of publisher's preface Section 1 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. Ah, Ty that deadly pie i sing the woe and overthrow of one debased and sly who entered soft a baker's shop and stole a currant pie and not a soul about the place and no one passing by chanced to detect him in the act or dreamed that he was nigh the moon alone with lustre shone and viewed him from the sky and broadly smiled as musing on the sequel by and by ah ty began while fast he ran to gobble down the pie determined that if caught at last no proof should meet the eye for not the fox for cunning famed the crow or weasel sly could with that erring man compare the heathen thief ah ty but blessings on the pastry man oh blessings rich and high upon the cook who cooked a rag within that currant pie dim was the light and large the bite the thief to bolt did try and in his haste along with paste he gulped the wiper dry so thus it proves that slight affairs do oft as none deny for good or evil unawares but waiting with reply the influence of every plot or action bold or sly or good or bad mistake or not will speak we may rely he strove in vain with cough and strain and finger swallowed nigh or in or out to force the clout or turn the thing awry but tight as wadding in a gun or cork and jug of rye the choking gag but halfway down fast in his throat did lie not finger point or second joint or heaving cough or pry did seem to change its posture strange or work a passage by the lord was there as everywhere his ways who can descry he turned to use the rag that missed the cook's incautious eye the race was short as it must be when lungs get no supply of ever needful oxygen the blood to purify it matters not how large or small the man or beast or fly a little air must be their share or else to life good-bye slow grew his pace and black his face and bloodshot rolled his eye and from his nerveless fingers fell the fragments of the pie the broken crust rolled in the dust while scattered currents fly but all the fatal part had gone upon its mission high then down he dropped a strangled man without a witness nigh and death the grim old boatman ran 
his noiseless shallop by. End of section one. Read by Carrie Adams, your book voice, at Mesa, Arizona, on the 30th of November, 2021. Section 2 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. New Year's Callers. Hi-ho! The New Year! is again upon us with its open houses its hope your wells and its bye-byes let what will grow dull or rusty the sweeping scythe of old time is ever sharp and busy how tempered must be that blade which nothing can dull or turn aside now as i sit by my window and look pensively out upon the streets i see them crowded with callers all anxious to increase the number of their acquaintances they ring, scrape, and wait. The door opens, and they disappear from my view. The fancy pictures them out as they doubtless appear inside, embarrassed because of a painful dearth of words. The weather, fortunately, is a standing theme of conversation. It will always bear comment, and but for this, how many callers, who perhaps can hardly come under the head of acquaintances, would wish themselves well out upon the street again even before sampling the customary wine and cake. But fashion is king, and when he nods, his satellites and minions must obey or perish. But I, who come not under the awe of his scepter, have few calls to make. With a leaking roof and no bolt to my door, I can keep open house, without going to the expense of procuring cake or wine. And for this left-handed blessing, may the Lord make me truly thankful. I have been sitting by my window most of the day, watching gentlemen who were not so fortunate as myself, and I notice with considerable pain, for as reader and writer cannot understand each other too soon, I may as well inform you at once that I am a philanthropist. Some of these callers present an aspect in the evening quite different from their festive morning appearance. Here, for instance, is a sketch of an exquisite as he appears when starting to make his numerous calls. Mark what grace is in every movement as he struts the pavement with military precision, adjusting his lavender-colored kids as he goes. There is something in the airy set of his stylish new stovepipe, and the very easy elegance of manner with which he holds the crystal orb over his left optic, that bespeaks the born gentleman. Not to a rise in stocks, he would tell you, or a lucky lottery ticket, does he owe his carriage, but to a line of ancestors, which he can trace back, perhaps, to the very loins of William the Conqueror. Look now upon this picture. The unpractised eye could hardly recognize the gentleman, and yet this is the same sociable but absent-minded individual as he appeared in the evening frogging up the steps in the dwelling opposite to make his third call upon the same family. He is evidently turned around, poor fellow, as this mixing of coffee, tea, and wine, not to mention stronger potations, will play the mischief with a man, and no mistake about it. The young ladies, with mouths ajar and dilated eyes, look out upon him through partially closed blinds, but he recks not of it as he leans backward, pulling and jerking at the bell knob as though he was drawing on a tight boot. The bell hanger will doubtless have a job in that house tomorrow question naturally arises. Will they chalk the gentleman down on his collar each time he favors them with his presence? Now that I think of it, they might do so with an easy conscience, for he is certainly not the man he was when he first offered the compliments of the day. End of Section 2 Read by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida Section 3 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humour in Verse, Prose and Picture by Palmer Cox Scenes on the Sidewalk I sit at my window and view the odd sights, and whatever to study or action invites. Upon the white paper before me is spread, by aid my constant companion, the lead. A lady of fashion sails by like a queen, with ruffles of lace and her satin de sheen. Her shimmering train, as it now sweeps the street, is sadly ensnaring a gentleman's feet. It is painfully plain an apology's due, but which should apologize first of the two? And next an old man full of years shuffles by, his nose to the dust and his back to the sky. The few snowy hairs that still cling to his head, far down o'er his collar untidily spread. And who now would think that the feeble dry hand, that hardly can free the rude came from the sand, once swung a long sabre that cut its way through the cuirassier's helmets at famed Waterloo. Old time warps the figure firm knitted and square, he sharpens the features, he blanches the hair, and bows the proud head, be it ever so high, this much hath he done for the man passing by. Away to the fields of the diamond and ruby, the miner sets out, like a consummate booby. What loads the poor fellow proposes to pack, his rifle, his shovel, his grub and his sack, his rifle to guard against numerous ills, his shovel to shovel his way to the hills, the long leather sack he bears in his hand, to hold the bright gems he may pick from the sand. I fancy I see him ascend the steep hill, or traverse the plain with his sack empty still, while down on his head ever scorching hot rays descend from the unclouded sun like a blaze. Too far from his friends and too nigh to his foes, who welcome the stranger with arrows and bows, and rifles and war clubs and hatchets of stone, and weapons for scalping and lances of bone. Trudge on to your treasure, poor dupe of the knave, and prey of the savage, pass on to your grave. Now stepping as one, see the new married pair, emerge from the church, what a contrast is there. Come haste to the window and gaze out with me, ere they enter their carriage, the pair you may see. O oh, May and December, extremes of the year, when linked thus together, how odd they appear! The bride in her teens, with a mind as unstable as ladders of fame or the medium's table, with riotous pulse and her blood all aglow, with the fervour of passion, of pleasure and show. The bridegroom is pussy, rheumatic and old, his teeth are in rubber, his blood thin and cold. His nose tells a tale of inordinate drams, the gout has laid hold of his corn-laden yams, the hairs on his cranium scattering stand, like ill-nourished blades on a desert of sand. I muse as I gaze on their arms softly twined, how soon some young maidens can alter their mind. Tis scarcely three weeks since I heard her declare, when speaking of him who now walks by her there. In marriage she never would give him her hand, though rolling in gems like a horse in the sand. She clings to him now as a green sappy vine embraces the trunk of a time-honoured pine, while her looks and her manner would seem to imply that she never before on a man cast an eye. But I, delving back through the layers of time, exhume the pale ghost of a youth in his prime, whose feelings were tortured, whose reason was muddied, whose pistol was emptied, whose temple was rutted. Because of coquetry so heartless and strange, her passion for diamonds, her longing for change. 
pass on happy bride with your beaming young face may happiness still with your moments keep pace and never mistrust pierce the groom at your side that wealth and not virtues have won him his bride End of section three recording by Alan Mapstone Section four of Frontier Humour in Verse, Prose and Picture. This is a Librivox recording. All Librivox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit Librivox.org. Read by Adrian Stevens. Frontier Humour in Verse, Prose and Picture by Palmer Cox. Sam Patterson's Balloon. Last night, while a party of us were sitting around the table in the cabin of the New World, talking about the aviator and aerial sailing generally, our conversation was interrupted by a dark, raw-boned hoosier who had entered the cabin shortly after the steamer left her wharf. He kept squirming in his chair for some time and was evidently anxious to take part in the conversation. "'Oh, you say, boys, I'm Sam Patterson. He commenced at last. And if this year dish is free and no one had no objections, I'd like mighty well to dip my spoon in. All turned to look at the speaker, even the fat old gentleman who, during our conversation, had not taken his eyes from the Christian guardian he was reading, stretched up and peered over the top of the paper at Sam. Before anyone could reply, the hoosier gave his chair a hitch near the table and went on. I say, boss, he continued, addressing his conversation to me, perhaps because I had just been expressing my opinion. I don't go a pickin' on navigate in the air. They ain't no need of talkin' and gassin' about crossin' the Atlantic or any of them foolish venters. I happen to know something about ballooning, and understand pretty near what you can do and what you can't do with one of them fellers. I'd a plaguey sight rather undertake to cross the ocean in a dugout than venture in one of them tricky cobwebs. You can't depend on em. They're like a flea. When a man thinks he's got em, he ain't. Perhaps you are misled by prejudice, I ventured to remark. No, I ain't nother answered the hoosier. I speak from experience. I've been there. Oh, you've given the aeronautic science some attention then, I said. An inventor, I presume. Well, no, I don't exactly claim to be an inventor, he replied. I reckon I follered on the old plan, excepting in the material used in constructing. Did you ever make an ascension? I asked. Well, yes, I've been up some, he answered dryly. Have you ever been very high? inquired the fat old gentleman, who seemed to grow interested. Perhaps not so high as eagles or turkey buzzards fly, but a mighty sight higher than barnyard fowls venture answered the hoosier. You see, he continued, I was staying down to Orleans once for about a week, and there was a professor at a balloon in the park itched to a stake, and he was hesting people up the length of the rope for two bits an head. I stepped into the cradle that was hanging to it and went up the length of the rope. I liked it pretty well. I went up three or four times and made considerable inquiries about the manner of constructing and inflating as I was collating to rig up one when I got home to Tuckersville. When I got back, I told Sal what I was bent on doing. She tried pretty hard to get the notion out of my head, but was stuck there like a burr to a cow's tail. I told her it might be the making of us, so arter a while she'd gin in, and her silk was too off hard expensive. Sal gave me a lot of bed sheets and helped me sew em together down in the cellar. We put it together down there, 
because I didn't want any of the neighbours to know what was up until I could astonish them some fine morning by rising above the al caboodle for once looking down on some of them that were snuffing round and trying to look down on me mighty bad. I used a rousing great corn basket for the cradle, and arter she was all ready for inflating, I had my life insured, cause I didn't want Sal to suffer by any of my ventures. Then I went to Sal Spence, the lawyer, and had him draw up the writings of a will, and while he was doing it, he worked the balloon secret out of me, and wanted me to take him along. I told him twas pretty risky business, and that he'd have to run some chances, as I was collating on seeing what clouds were made of before I came down. He said, them were his sentiments exactly, that he always had a great anchoring to get up there and see what sort of spongy thing they were, anyway. I didn't object much. I reckon the sheets were good for it, though he went over two hundred, but I calculated he'd do it instead of ballast and be company besides. So I took some bed cord and slung another corn basket below the one I was going in, and after dark we owed the great floppy thing out into the back yard, and arter we got it histed up on the stakes, we commenced building fires under her to get the gas up and getting things ready generally. After sun up, we had her all set ready to step into. Spence had his sketchbook along, calculating on taking some bird's eye views, and I had a bottle of tea calculating to empty it going up and fill it with rainwater while up there. The thing was a walloping and rolling round the yard mighty impatient to get off. I itched her first to the grindstone frame, but she was snaking that around the yard and the dogs commenced such an all-fired yelping and scudding round and watching of it through the fence that we were obliged to put them in the cellar "'cause we didn't want the whole neighbourhood attracting by their barking. "'Then we fastened the balloon to the shed post "'and left Sal to watch her while we were eating a snack of breakfast. "'But he soon after we heard Sal a-shouting "'that she was a-going off with the woodshed. "'So we ran out mighty lively and had no time to spare neither. "'I jumped up and caught one rope and Spence got hold of another. We couldn't fetch it down till Sal caught hold of my leg, and between us three we pulled it back again. She gin a sort of puff and came down putty sudden when near the ground, and one of the posts of the shed came fair onto the back of a little pet hog that was rooting round the yard and knuckled his back down into the chips, leaving his head and oinder part sticking up. He commenced such an uproarious squealing, you could hear him mourn two miles, while Spence and I were fussing at the ropes to unloose her from the shed. She took another sudden start up again and shot away from us quicker than scat. Sal happened to have hold of a rope at the time, and up she went into the air, scooting like a rocket. Sal was a plucky critter. Shoot me if she wasn't as full of grit as a sandstone. She could have let go of the rope, but she wouldn't. She wanted to fetch the corn sarn down again, and was bound to cling to her until she did. Blow me, if I didn't think for a while I was going to lose the old woman. There she was, hanging on the end of the rope, hollering like a whole regiment charging a battery, and trailing and swinging about without any notion of letting go. We had a lively time of it, getting her down again too, now I can tell you. I jumped over a fence into the garden, and snatching up a rake, commenced to scrape at her, and finally the teeth caught in her dress, and then I had a putty good hold so long as Sal was good for it. Spence got hold of another rope that was dangling around, 
so between us we got her down the second time. Then I swung out to Spence. Spence, says I, climb into your basket and let's be off, or the whole town will be here and stop us going. So we climb into our baskets and flung out Sal's flat irons that we had for ballast, and up we shot like a spark in a chimney. I hollered back to Sal to put the hog out of pain and stop the squeaking. And the last I seed of her as we went round the gable, she was a whacking him over the head with the back of an axe, and he was a hollering worse and worse. The wind took the balloon over a swamp back of the village where no person seemed to see us, and then the world began to drop away putty nicely. Twant long till I heard Spence calling out, mighty scared, like, I guess, Sam, you might as well land her and let me get out. Are you afeard, Spence? says I, just that way. No, he answered, I ain't afeard, but I reckon my family would be mighty uneasy about this time if they knowed where I was and I began to feel pretty salacious about them. This year thing is coming like lore, I says. When you're into her, you've got to keep going till something gins out. She hasn't got a rope a holding her down now, Spence. And as for your family, I reckon they're a mighty sight safer than you'd be. So, if you have any spare solicitude, you had better be tucking it under yourself. Sides, I continued, I ain't studied into the letting down part of it half so much as the rising. Jerusalem, he shouted, I thought you were familiar with the whole thing, or I had soon as thought of going up in a whirlwind. I fancy I do know considerable about it, I says. Then why can't you stop her right here, he hollered, looking up, putty pale. I calculate we've got to keep ascending while the gas holds out, I answered. Thunder and lightning, he hollered, just that way. And what are you going to do after the gas runs out? I reckon, says I, we'll come down again. A flukin? he asked. Perhaps so, says I. I calculate we'll come down faster than we're going up but I'm hoping to catch an undercurrent of that air that will sweep us along and let us down sort of gently. Just as we were talking, something gin a whopping crack overhead, and she began to drop down by the run, putty lively. What's that? shouted Spence. I think I hear a sort of tearing noise up there. Ain't something ginning out? I reckon the old woman's sheets have commenced to gin out, I said kind of careless like and beginning to feel mighty nervous all to once on looking down i seed spence was a craning out of the basket and looking down just as pale as could be suffering pilgrims he shouted can't you throw out something sam and lighten her a little she's dropping straight down like an air light i ain't got anything to throw out except in the tea bottle and that hour is almost empty, I says. I calculate we've got to take our chances, and if you hain't forgot your childhood prayers, you might as well be running of em over, for things are beginning to look mighty scary just now, I could tell you. Pretty soon I heard him a mumbling to himself, and I allus aloud he was praying. We were now about steeple eye, as I had expected, the wind caught us and began to sweep us around pretty loose as we went walloping over St. Patrick's Church. Spence's basket struck the spire and was a spilling of him out like a lobster out of a market basket. I peered over and seed he was almost gone, so I hollered, Go for the spire, Spence. It's your only chance. He seemed to be of the same mind, for as I spoke... He was a grabbin for it, and managed to get hold of one end of the weather vane. I reckoned if he had got hold on both ends, he'd have been all right, but things were getting desperate. 
and he had to take what come. The balloon rissed some when he got out, and as it was moving off, I looked back to see how he was a-making it. He was hanging there like a gymnast, a kickin' and a wormin', and the steeple a rockin'. But he was too awful heavy. He couldn't draw himself up nohow. But he soon the tail of the fish gin out, and down he slid along the steeple like a shot coon down a simp tree. Fortunately, he struck the roof, and over it he rolled, clawing and a scratching the shingles as he went. But it was all go and no war, as the boy said when he was a sliding the grease banister. Old Father McGillop was just coming out of the vestry door after matins as Spence came a scootin' over the eaves and down kaflummix right on top of him. This, you see, sort of broke the fall for Spence, but it spread the distress. He was so heavy and come down with such force he disjinted the neck of his reverence and shoved it so far down into the body that his ears were resting on his shoulders. They had to get a shovel to dig him out of the ground, and Doc Willoughby was a-fussing over him more than five hours, a-yanking his neck out of his body and pressing his ears into shape, and... Stop now, said the fat old chap, who was worked up to the top notch of attention. Do you mean to say he lived after his neck was dislocated? Well, I reckon, boss, said the narrator as he took a fresh quid of tobacco. I ain't made no such unreasonable assertion. I was saying they hold his neck back and put his ears in place again, or rather one of them, for the butcher's dog ate t'other one before the sexton could get to it, so that he might make something like a decent appearance in the coffin. Soon as Spence went over the eave, I lost sight of him, for I was driving putty briskly over Kent's corn patch, and as I came sweeping down by the widder O'Donald's, she was in the yard getting an apron full of chips. I reckon she heard a burn sound overhead, cause she looked up, and when she seed the balloon, she gin a squall and cried out something about protection. I reckon she was calling on the saints but had no time just then to listen. Before she'd gone many steps, she dropped, and I allowed she'd gone down in a fainting fit. I was a-driving and a-drifting over the village like thistledown for more than two hours, and the dogs were a-barking, and the men and women a-hollering and a-running arter it wherever it drifted. The barnyard fowls wore a cracking and a screaming chulicans. Didn't I make a rumption amongst them, though? You'd think that there were thirty thousand orcs and turkey buzzards a hovering over the village by the way they scattered against the winders, behind stunt walls, into the wells, under lumber piles and currant bushes. Such a scrounging, a squatting and scooting I never did see. Parson Jones had thirteen lights of glass smashed by fowls battering against the windows trying to get in, and Dud Davis, the blacksmith, fished seven dead ends, two turkeys, a guinea fowl and two small pigs out of his well next day where they sought refuge and were drowned. Dad Kent gave me six traces of good seed corn next fall. He said, barn the killing of Priest McGillop, it was the best thing that ever happened in Tuckersfield. He said I did more for his crop than if he had a scarecrow standing astride every ill. There wasn't a crow flew within two miles of the village for more than a fortnight, and by that time the corn was grown so they couldn't pull it up. Pretty soon the balloon came down about the house high and drove over towards the depot. I was hoping she'd catch on the telegraph wire, but she skimmed over like a swallow over a fence, 
and immediately riz up tree high again, where scrape, slap, slash, she went into an old pine that stood alone in the field. I was scratched pretty bad, but hung on to the limbs, and after a while slid down the tree, leaving the balloon hanging in the treetop. Great turnips! If old Tucker's field wasn't down there in five minutes, there were young uns running around half dressed with corn dodgers in their hands and women with babies in their arms. It was like a dog fight, only, as the fella said when describing the nigger by the mulleter, it was more so. The train was delayed half an hour that morning because the engineer, conductor, and all hands jumped off the cars and ran down to the balloon. Pegleg Dibley, the Mexican war veteran, was there hobbling around among the rest. He was in such an hurry to get down to the tree he wouldn't go around by the road, but started to take a short cut across the marsh with the crowd. And he had a sweet, sweating time of it too. Now, I can assure you, first his cane would stick, and just about the time he would get that out, down would slide his iron-shod leg fully a foot into the mud and take him there like a scarecrow. Then he would look down to where the people were standing and jerk and swear until the want of breath only would make him let up. He got down there after a while, though. He had to crawl considerable before he could do it. And after he got there, he was bobbing here and bobbing there, trying to get a better look into the tree, until at last he stumbled and fell across one of Dud Davis's young uns. And gin her left leg a compound fracture. She set up a screaming, and he was so weak and frightened he couldn't get up again no how, but lay there grunting and sprawling and kicking his one leg around. The blacksmith was there himself. When he seed his young un down in the mud with her leg broke, you never seed a man so mad in all your born days. He just run and grabbed the old pensioner by the coat collar and slung him more than fifteen feet, landed him sliding on his back in the mud like a crawfish. About the same time, Tubbs, the cooper, was looking up and he seed a bough springing up and he allowed the balloon was coming down. So he started to run and stepped on the foot of Kent's snapping bulldog that was setting there looking up the tree, thinking there must be a coon up it. The cur whirled round mad and set his teeth into the nighest thing to him, which happened to be old Polly Alien's ankle. But he got more than he bargained for, though, for she was so tough that his teeth stuck there, and she was a-screaming and a-running him, dragging him arter her more'n half the way. I never did see such an exciting time. School was dismissed, and there wasn't a lick of work done in Tuckersfield the whole day. The whole talk was Sam Patterson's balloon, Sam Patterson's balloon. I didn't have to pay a picoon for anything for more than three weeks. Parson Jones preached a telling sermon about the balloon, and there wasn't standing room in the church. They had to keep the windows open and let people standing on the outside stick their heads in and listen. He likened it first to youth when it was a rolling round in the backyard where nobody seed it, impatient and ambitious to rise, then like unto manhood where it was up, a busting and dropping down again. Next, he said, it resembled old age when it was in rags, a flopping around in the tree, more for observation than use. There wasn't hardly a dry eye in the owl meeting house. Hard hearted old sinners cried like teething babies. The balloon hung in the tree all summer, and every day there'd be a crowd of people staring at it, like cats at a bird cage. A photographer came the whole way from town and took 
lots of views of the remains, and one of Frank Leslie's special artists came ratting down there and sat on a stun wall for two days drawing sketches of it. He say it was the most spirited subject he had set eyes on since he sketched the oop skirt Jeff Davis was captured in. But I'm getting rather dry. Ain't some of your fellas are going to call on the stimulants? End of section four. Section five of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jared Shaw. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. My Canine. If you have tears, Prepare to shed them now. Shakespeare. Some fond poets sing of their lady love's eyes, of lovers who sail the seas over, but poet-like I shall gaze up at the skies and muse of my little dog, Rover. The canine I sing to disease as a prey, the mange, the distemper, and flea have all had their turn and have worn him away, his shadow you scarcely can see. From earliest light until late in the night, he's dodging hot water and sticks. I'm ashamed to confess it, but truth I must write, he's a football that everyone kicks. I hear his thin cry and his frightened ki ye almost any hour of the day, and Bridget's bad cess to the likes of your sky. Sure he's here, and he's there like a flay. Upon his poor body the hair has all dried, "'Tis smooth and as bare as your hand. "'I vow, I believe, there's no life in his hide. "'It looks just as if it were tanned. "'His blood is so thin that he never is warm, "'and keenly he feels the cold weather. "'He shivering stands with tail end to the storm, "'and his four feet all huddled together. "'He suffers sad woe as his body doth show. "'His face bears a hopeless expression. "'He seems to be wondering why he's a foe who never commits a transgression. He's only a dog in the dark, to be sure, but I, who am mourning his plight, no accident often exalts the low boar, and crowds may it down out of sight. How oft do we see the chief dunce of the town, with head like a turnip or melon, advance to the bench or the clergyman's gown, though thought to be born for a felon. Dost laugh at my song? Well, I care not a pin, my notion I never shall lose. I know that my dog hath a spirit within, that cannot be crushed by abuse. End of section 5 Section 6 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox Jim Dudley's Flight That babbling Hoosier, Bob Browser, has found me out and paid me a call, boring me with his confounded stories. Even as a hungry parrot when crackers are in view, or as a miller's hopper when water is high and the farmer's meal bags low, he rattles right along with copious discourse. What's that you say? Did you know Jim Dudley? What? Him as the boys in Gosport used to call Carrot Top Jim? Well, I'll be rattled if that ain't queer. Wasn't he the all firest shirk you ever did say? Perhaps you remember how sudden he left Gosport just before the war. Oh, that's so, sure enough. You went north some time before that. Wow, that chap was eternally getting in some scrape or another. I do just think I've helped that Jim out of more close corners than there are buildings in this there town. You see him, and me was a great chums, and roomed at the same house on York Street. 
Jim was a court and a butcher's daughter that lived out near the cemetery for about a year before he left. Leastwise, he was a totin' of her around considerable, taking her to picnic, circuses, horse races, and the like. I kind of had my doubts about him getting married, because he was a pooty sod old patch, and sometimes I'd ask him when the nuptials were a coming off. But he'd all really shuffle out of it by saying when they did come, I'd get an invite, and kind of larf it off just that way. One night, pretty soon after I had gotten to bed, I heard someone thumping at my door, and before I had time to say anything, Jim Dudley was plumb across the room and standing by the bedside. Bob, says he, just that way, we've got to part again, and I've come to gin your pa a shake afore I leave. "'It's up now, Jim,' says I, pooty surprised and setting up maze and fast in bed to strike a light, cause I always liked Jim. Drat my picture if I didn't. He stuck to me like a hoss leech when I was down with the yellow fever. I was peeled down so mighty thin I didn't make a shatter only after I'd been eating corn dodgers or something that wasn't transparent. As soon as I got a light, I seed his face was tombstone white, except in some long red scratches onto it that made me think there had been a cat's a clawin of him. I ain't time to gin particulars now, but water's getting too plaguey shallow for me in Gosport, says he, just that way, and I'm going to pull out for deeper soundings. I want to head off the night express, and I've only got fifteen minutes to do it, and it must be a movin' and givin' my hand a rattlin' shake, he turned before I could say scat, he was going down the stairs like a bucket falling down a well. I thought he hadn't more than got in the middle of the flight, when I heard the door slam behind him. I lay awake thar for hours thinking and wondering what on earth could have turned up to make Jim dust out of town so all fire sudden, being as how he was doing pretty well, peculiarly that is, for him. I kind of mistrusted something had gone wrong with him out at old Hurley's, the butcher's. So the next day, being kind of curious, I took a stroll out that way, to look around a little and see what was going on. I see the glazer a fussin' round a winder, and old Hurley sittin' on the steps, lookin' mighty solemn at a hat, which I knowed was Jim's, that was a hangin' on a bush in the garden. Some months after this the war was a billin', and I ginned a company and went down to Cairo to go into camp. By Jinga, would you believe it? Almost the first man I ran again was Jim Dudley. He'd enlisted in the horse regiment up to St. Louis, and came down to camp for a few days before me. We were both mighty tickled to meet one another right thar, until we pinted for a place where we could have a straight-out chat. And while we were sitting thar, talking about old times, says I to him, Jim, now we're going down into this blamed muss, and the chances are pooty good for us to get chawed up down thar, and nothing more to be heard about us. Now, supposing you tell a fellow that made you pull up stakes and dust from Gosport so amazing fast last fall. Well, Bob, says he, seeing we've met again, I don't mind if I do lighten you a little in regard to my leaving so sudden. You remember I had been over to Franklin some time afore I left, and just got back to Gosport that day. In the evening I started out to see Mag. I was a-hoping the old man wouldn't be to hum. He generally was away Saturday nights. T'was dark afore I got there. Leastwise the bats were flitting round the gables and apple trees, a looking for that supper's. I gin the bell knob a jerk anyhow, and pretty soon old Hurley himself came to the door, with a candle in his hand. He was in his shirt sleeves, and I reckon he had just come home from work. Kind of gin a start as though he was surprised to see me. And I gin a start too. And I jumped back from the door pooty quick for I thought I heard him grit his teeth a little, something like a sharp arter she'd been eating beans, but I wasn't certain. Come in, Mr. Dudley, says he, kind of low and coaxing like. I hope you've been enjoying good hell. I hope you come prepared to stop with us a while. Thanking him for his kind wishes, I followed him along, wondering what in time made him so amazing solicitous for my health all too once cause I knowed the old man hated me worse than a rat does pizen. He didn't stop in the parlor where some folks were sitting, but kept on into a small room, beckoned me in to follow her, which I did, though I was beginning to feel pretty suspicious about the old feller's movements. Stay here a minute, Mr. Dudley, says he, 
Carter I had sat down. Make yourself comfortable until I come back again, he continued, just that way, and then he stepped out. I tell you, I began to feel wonderful fidgety and kind of prickly down along the spine, and when I heard the old man coming back, and I heard his feet slapping down heavier and faster than when he went out, then I knew there was trouble ahead. I could feel a distress and resentment just a bubbling through my veins and limbering up all my gents. Pretty soon the old man came in, a hold his left hand in front of him doubled up tight, as though for boxing, and keeping his right hand behind him, kind of careless like, as though twas there by accident. I know twas not no natural position. I kept peering round, for I expected he had a cowhide and was calculating to gin me a sound tanner. But when he went out to shut the door behind him, I got a glimpse of the all fire at his great butcher's cleaver you ever set eyes on a shining just as bright as could be. Jerusalem! If that bone splitter didn't make me begin to feel tarnation uneasy, then there's no use saying it. My heart flopped up so far into my throat, it actually seemed as though I could taste it. I've got very pressing business downtown, and I guess I better be a moving, says I, rising up. Sit down says he easy as that as though he wasn't disturbed any though i seed he was awful pale don't be in a hurry he went on keeping his back flat against the door the whole time you've been poking around here about long enough said he and i think at time you tended to business i've sent for father quinn he continued calculating to have you join to the family right off before you leave the house, and he gin the cleaver a sweeping flourish. But while he was a-doing it, he sort of took his eyes away from me, and before he could say scat, I just shut me eyes tight and made one determined lunge for the winder, head first, like a sheep through a clump of briars, and went a-crashing plumb out on all fours into the garden, taking the whole lower sash along with me. The old man gin one rat and shout like a wounded gorilla, when he seen me go, I knowed he'd be arter me mighty quick, so I broke through the garden for the toll road. The blasted old sash a hangin' round my neck like a hog yoke, catchin' on everything as I ran. I had more than struck the road and begun to dust along it, when I heard the old man comin', a snortin' and a spatterin' down the turnpike behind me. I lowed he'd overhaul me if I kept right on, cause I hadn't got the sash off yet. And the blamed thing was just chinning my necklace, so flouncing aside pooty sudden. I flopped down behind a sassafras bush, and I hadn't more than got nothing when old Harley went a rackin' and a rearin' past, the bloodthirsty great meat axe a gleamin' in his hand. He reckoned I was still ahead, so he went a flukin' down the road, clearin' that toll bar at one bounce, without so much as dustin' it, and keepin' right on to Gosport. Thunder! Didn't I tear off the ruins of that winter mighty fast, though? Then I climbed the fence and took across lots through Harem Nye's corn patch and down by Blake's orchard, coming into town by the lower road. I think more than likely old Harley kept a go and had plumbed to Gosport before he mistrusted that I dodged him. And I do just think if he had got hold of me, a villain as he was, he wouldn't have left a piece of me together large enough to bait a mink trap. Was not an all-fired close dodge, though. I reckon you'll not see me in Gosport again. Least the way's not while well old Hurley's a livin. I've no notion of getting married in no such haste as that. That's the bugle callin' to muster. Let's hurry up and go. End of section six. Read by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 7 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jared Shaw. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. Trials of the Farmer. I want to be a farmer, and with the farmer stand, a whetstone in my pocket, a blister on my hand. 
I sing to be a farmer, without the right of way, across my neighbor's lot to drive my ox cart or my sleigh. I long to be a farmer, and own a breachy mare, that oft will leap the boundary line, and make my neighbors swear. I pine to be a farmer, and own a kicking steer, that I may feel his horny heel whenever I draw near. I sigh to be a farmer, and plant my field of corn, that crows may flock down and pull it up before the streak of morn. I shout to be a farmer, how much I would adore to drive a big and stubborn pig some five miles or more. End of section seven. Section eight of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jared Shaw. Frontier Humor and Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. A Cunning Dodge There was a certain citizen of this place, a butcher by occupation who... Deeming the remuneration he received small in comparison to the amount of service done, resolved to discontinue butchering cattle and become a butcher of men, or in other words, to assume the responsibilities of a practicing physician and surgeon. It seems in his travels he had collected quite a number of receipts and prescriptions from old almanacs and doctors' books. With this limited stock of medical knowledge, and an unusually large amount of cheek, he thought to work himself into a lucrative business. As an invoice of smallpox was expected by every steamer, he imagined he might pass among other professionals as though his scientific acquirements were excelled by none, and his vocabulary of Latin names surpassed Dr. Hornbrook's. Hiring an office in a central locality, he hoisted a board reaching nearly across the building, on which his name and calling were made known in large characters. Then sitting down amidst a beggarly account of empty bottles, he patiently awaited the result. Whether the city had suddenly become remarkably healthy through the sanitary exertions of the health commissioners, or he had not his proportionate share of the medical practice in requisition, he knew not. But certain it was that from morn to noon, from noon to dewy eve, he sat in his room, as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. One day, however, while straying along North Beach, musing on the strange vicissitudes in human affairs, and thinking how weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable were all the uses of this world, a happy idea presented itself. In the vicinity of the county hospital, he had noticed the invalids coming out to sun themselves, like seals, along the beach. What a glorious attraction to custom they would be, congregated around his door. Entering into conversation with some of them, he soon struck a bargain with thirty or more. They were to visit his office once a day, those who could walk there without much trouble or pain receiving fifty cents per day, while those who traveled under greater difficulties were to be paid accordingly. So, every morning after breakfast, they took up their line of march in twos and threes along the street towards the charlatan's place of business. They were indeed a motley crowd, that cripple brigade, as they hobbled through the thoroughfare. There came the maimed, the halt, the withered, and the blind, shuffling into his office thicker than diseased Jews to the troubled pool of Bethesda. If any stranger chanced to drop in for medical treatment, the crowd of hired specimens began at once to converse among themselves of the wonderful skill of the physician. One remarked how his sight had improved under treatment, how he could see two objects now where he used to see but one. Another related in glowing terms the ravenous appetite the doctor's bitters had awakened in his system. Through all hours of the day, he was now as hungry as a whirlpool. A third would eulogize his method of treating contagious diseases in general. In this way, the real patient, though receiving no actual benefit from the watery portions administered, 
was retained in hopes of an ultimate cure. At length, the curiosity of the resident physician of the hospital was aroused. He couldn't imagine where his patients filed away to every morning, as regularly as liberated geese to some well-known pond. Following up the bandaged crew and investigating the matter, he soon learned the state of affairs and forbade their leaving the hospital yard without a permit. This sudden falling off in the would-be doctor's patients made a material change in the appearance of his office. In short, it leveled his business and his hopes, and again the quack sank into that obscurity from which he so energetically struggled to emerge. End of section 8《Section 9 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Incia Akbarli. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. A Terrible Take-In. Today, while taking dinner in an eating house in a western town, I witnessed an amusing incident. It appears the proprietor had often been imposed upon by bummers who would walk boldly into the dining room, and after stowing away a supply of victuals that would fill an ordinary carpet sack, would shuffle up to the counter and in an undertone of voice inform the person there officiating that they were unfortunately dead broke. Of course the law doesn't allow any ripping to be done on such occasions other than swearing. Then the well-filled rascals would walk off picking their teeth with the utmost composure except in extreme cases when the outgoing party would be assisted over the threshold by an uprising boot, but even kicks would not bring the coin into the till or bring back upon the table the vanished edibles, so this treatment was seldom resorted to. Finally, the proprietor bought a large syringe and placing it in a drawer in the dining room, bided his time. It happened while I was sitting at the table, an individual whose cheek the proprietor had reason to believe far exceeded his checks, entered the room and sat down directly in front of me. A plate of hot bean soup sat invitingly before him, from which the savory steam rose up in clouds and not only filled the nostrils of the hungry man with delicious and enticing odors, but served to wet the hungry edge of appetite, lifting a large pewter spoon that lay beside the plate he was about to introduce it to the hot decotion before him. Already the limber hinges of his jaw began to relax preparatory to admitting the well-filled spoon. His attention was suddenly arrested by the proprietor, who with one hand behind him and the other laid upon the spoon arm of the would-be eater, demanded the price of the dinner before he went any further. The man, it seems, was not a member of that class of individuals which the hotel keeper thought him. He was justly indignant, therefore, at the demand and sharply informed mine host that he guessed after he had eaten his dinner would be time enough to pay for it. But the off-swindled proprietor thought differently. The man has scarcely got the words out of his mouth before mine host produced a syringe, large as the trunk of a small-sized elephant, and slapping the nozzle of it into the soup, ran it circling around the plate, and with one long, slobbering draught, like that of a horse drinking through his bits, the soup plate was left lying before the hungry man, as empty as his own stomach. The astonished individual looked first at his plate, on which not even a bean was left, and then at the dripping, steaming muzzle of the syringe and lastly at the landlord who stood with a look of triumph spreading across his face, silently waiting for the man to either come down with the coin or leave the table. Though not liking that summary way of treating a person, the man was either too hungry or too limited in time to go further for a meal, so he fished it out of his pocket, the change, and handed it to the proprietor. The latter thereupon discharged the contents of the syringe into the soup plate again and walked away, leaving the customer to proceed with his dinner. End of section 9. Section 10 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Daryl Nobles. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox, A Family Jar. One night while passing through the street, a stranger paused to hear the tumult from a cottage nigh that stunned the listening ear. As he stood without the door, the sound of war arose, as when Baru the Irish king engaged his stubborn foes. 
So drawing nigh the window sill, he studied matters fair, and lo, the husband and the wife engaged in battle there. The former with his doubled fist the battle sought to win, while to his head the wife applied the heavy rolling pin. And as the stranger stood without, he thus communed with care, for he was shrewd and thought it best to weigh the danger there. This is some family affair, some question I opine, that I should not discuss with them, nor make the quarrel mine, for I am newly risen up from off the bed of pain, and they perchance will turn on me and send me there again. So turning from the window sill, he journeyed on his way, and went not in, but left the pair engaged in doubtful fray. And when he was a great way off, the stranger paused once more, and lo, the noise of battle fell, still louder than before. Then he remarked, This is indeed a battle fierce and great. I now repent me that I went, not in to remonstrate. Then taking to his road again, he moved repenting still, and turned not back to enter in, but slowly climbed the hill. Not many minutes later on, behold, another man was passing by and heard the war that through the building ran. And lo, the tumult that arose was like the clamor high when Michael's host and Satan's horde did mingle in the sky. And while he paused, he heard the stroke the active husband sped and heard the fall of rolling pin upon the husband's head. And he communed thus with himself for he loved ways of peace, delighting not in heavy strokes, but thinking war should cease. Said he, a family jar, no doubt, now falls upon mine ear, and I should promptly enter in the house to interfere. Or soon, perchance, a murder will be done beneath this roof, and I appear like one to blame because I stood aloof, or passed along upon my way and took no noble stand, nor raised my voice, the war to stay, nor caught a lifted hand. So then the traveler left the street and bravely entered in, through porch and hall, and gained the room when rose the fearful din. And on the husband's lying hold, he cried, Why do ye go? Beyond the brute that roots the side in this contention low, and neither spare the sex nor kin which you are bound to do. Now use no more your ready hand, or you the act may rue. Then said the husband, turning round, Why is she not my own? My flesh of flesh, as we are told, and also bone of bone. And who are you that here comes in at me to rail and scout, when I, by neither word nor line, send invitation out? Do I not answer for the rent, and all the taxes pay? And say to whom I will come in, or stand without, I pray? Then also did that warring wife not rest her rolling pen, and thus addressed the stranger too. I, wherefore came ye in? Come, let us beat him soundly here, and throw him down the stairs, and teach him not to interfere with other folks' affairs. So hands they laid upon the wretch while edging for the door, and beat him freely out of shape, and dragged him round the floor. The wife would hold him down a while, the husband's blow to buy it. And then the husband held him till the wife her weapon plied. They rent the garments from his back and from his scalp the hair, and from his face in handfuls plucked the whiskers long and fair. And there, contrary to the laws and to his wish to boot, he swallowed teeth that in his jaws in youth had taken root. At last uniting at the task, they hauled him to the door and sent him howling home in pain, a man both lame and sore. Who showed the greatest wisdom here? The one who heard the fray and went not in but later stood, repenting in the way? Or he who turned from his path went in to stay the route and after wished with all his heart that he had stayed without. The observations of a life prove eight times out of nine. They best can meddle with a strife 
who bear official sign, but notwithstanding all the facts this lesson has laid bare. Of reaping good for noble acts we never should despair. Not here below reward will know, but virtue still prevails. And valor, love, and rightful deeds will count upon the scales. End of section 10. Section 11 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Incia Akbarelli. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. The Rod of Correction. It is not often that a poor fellow like myself can have a good laugh at the expense of a high dignitary to-day however an opportunity presented itself and happily i was in the right humour to appreciate it passing along a narrow street i saw an old irish woman unmercifully beating her boy with a rod which if it had not been divested of twigs and leaves would have served as a christmas tree for a good-sized family this of itself was nothing to make one smile and perhaps no person would more readily endorse such a sentiment than the boy himself but the end was not yet it appears that while on the way from the grocery with a pitcher of beer for his mother the little fellow tripped up and spilled nearly the whole contents in the street this was something that temperance folk might well rejoice over but it was a serious matter for the boy the old woman with parched lips was standing at the gate impatiently awaiting her youngster's return she saw him emerge from the store pitcher in hand her quick eye caught sight of the light foam rising in airy bubbles above the brim and she knew the grocer had sent her no stinted measure in fancy she was already quenching her thirst with copious draughts of the cooling drink when she saw the boy measuring his length upon the planks worse and most lamentable of all she saw the delectable beverage coursing down the sidewalk in a dozen foaming streams her rage knew no bounds the moment the boy put his foot inside the gate she seized him with the grip of a virago and belabored him with the cudgel till he roared so great was the outcry that every window in the vicinity was immediately crammed with heads taught by the lessons of my youth that he who meddles in other people's affairs often treads upon his own corns i maintained a wise silence but i mentally prayed that the wrath of the old fury would be appeased for the cries and wild antics of the wretch began to grow monotonous there chanced at that moment to be passing an eminent minister who weakly fills his fashionable spacious church with a glittering congregation he saw the woman was in a towering passion and he ventured to remark my good woman the rod of correction should never become the weapon of passion the remark which seemed good and to the point caused her temporarily to suspend hostilities but she still retained her hold on the collar as she turned around sharply to ascertain who dared criticize her method of training up a child in the way he should go for a minute she glared upon the clergyman with flashing eyes as if astonished at his interference surveying him from the soles of his boots to the very crown swirl of a silk hat she drew herself up to her full height and in the most indignant voice shouted away wid der caudations you old sermon thief it's not from the likes of yees i learn me duty the clergyman was nonplussed he quailed before the fiery eyes and sarcastic tongue of the old vixen and i fancied his face lit up with joy when he discovered he was nigh a corner around which he quickly disappeared end of section eleven section twelve of frontier humor in verse prose and picture this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Incia Akbarelli. Gone from his gaze. There was a little man, and he had a little dog. And he said, Little dog, you must stay, 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 playing here by the house, as peaceful as a mouse. And never hoist your tail, and away, way, way. And never hoist your tail, and away. Then said this little pup, at its master looking up, I know, little master. You are cute, 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 but if you will allow such a question, tell me now. What the dickens do you want with the brute, brute, brute? What the dickens do you want with the brute? Then the little man did stare, and up rose his little hair, and his cheeks with fear grew pale, pale, pale. As he said, I do propose, 
soon as you have found your nose, to kill by the dozen little quail, 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 to kill by the dozen little quail. At this the puppy grinned, like a mischief-making fiend, as he whined, you cannot come it upon me, me, me. You would have me lie around, in a backyard like a hound, and become a paradise for the flea, 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 and become a paradise for the flea. When the toil of day has flown, little man with little bone, went out where the little dog ought to be, be, be. He whistled and he called, he patted and he bawled, but nary little dog could he see, see, see. But nary little dog could he see. Next day he chanced to stop by a sausage maker's shop, and something that he saw made him holler, holler, holler. For there in the street, all bloody at his feet, lay his poor little dog's leather collar, collar, collar. Lay his poor little dog's leather collar. End of section 12. Section number 13 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose and Picture by Palmer Cox. St. Patrick's Day. Aaron Gobra, St. Patrick's Day is upon us, and the city seems wrapped in a mantle of green. So numerous are the Irish flags flying in the breeze, from hovel roof and church of size, alike the harp and sunburst flies. The ear of morn is stunned with the bray of at least a dozen blatant bands as they discourse old Aaron's soul-stirring airs it is an easy matter for a person to imagine himself sitting by some shielding door in county kerry instead of this great american city by the sea the ancient order of hibernians and the fenians are out in full force with clean boiled shirts and soap washed faces marshals charge around upon their caparisoned steeds like real heroes and sitting gracefully as a sack of potatoes upon the back of a spavined mule trotting over a corduroy road evidently some of them have never before bent over anything that came nigher to an equine than a sawhorse it is plain those who always rode now ride the more and those now ride who never rode before well they love the country that gave them birth and that is a virtue that is certainly commendable a natural excellence often wanting in other nationalities besides celebrating the old gentleman's birthday makes business lively with the stable men and the shoemakers and that of itself is a good reason why the demonstration should be encouraged it is hardly probable that any of the great powers will be materially weakened by these loyal manifestations here is a sketch of a spirited member of the ancient order of hibernians as he appeared passing my window in the morning full of life and loyalty tripping the ashbelton pavement lightly as though transversing the springy surface of his native bogs and following is another sketch of the same individual in the evening when full of oats and whiskey lying in the gutter with all that ease and abandon which characterizes the celtic race wherever dispersed in every land and in every age in the morning the different races of men have their different weaknesses it may seem an extravagant statement but i venture to say if there had been no rice plant in the world the chinese would not have cared to live i will even go further and say perhaps there would have been no monoglian race and now the thought occurs to me this deficiency in the human family would not have been such a terrible thing after all true we should have been obliged to get along with catnip tea instead of sautrong which would have been pretty heavy on old women we also would have been obliged to worry through without old confucius which might have made some confusion in metaphysics or political morality 
but as the latter could hardly be worse than it is at present with all his teachings we possibly might have managed to exist very well without the moon-eyed philosopher in the evening the teuton dotes on his well-seasoned balanga the grisly empire william the first standing upon an emissance near resinville overlooking the battlefield with a spyglass in one hand and a large balanga sausage in the other furnished indeed a striking sketch for the special artist of the occasion the humour of the situation came in when the emperor forgetting himself in the excitement of the moment raised the sausage to his eye instead of the spyglass and because he failed to see the squadron of ulins that a moment before were charging upon a battery concluded they were blown to smithereens and losing his usual equanimity commenced to swear fearfully and order up another division to take their place there was a broad and sarcastic humour couched in the remark of the officer at his side who observed the mistake and ventured the suggestion if your majesty will take another bite from the sausage perhaps you will be able to see through it and then there is the jovial careless free-hearted yet quarrelsome irishman who thinks a new jerusalem without a little whiskey still in one corner of it overbayant the throne and fornish the black deer for instance would be just no paradise at all i believe there is not a race of men on the face of the earth from bering straits to terra del fuego round and about over and under or down either quarter that can extract the same genuine soul-satisfying bliss from a flattened rose or swell lip that a real irrepressible county carry irishman can let him have that and a good stiff horn of whiskey to keep the blood running freely and my advice to you is keep upon the other side of the street if you intend to sit for your picture that afternoon or visit your sweetheart that evening or expect to take up the collection during divine worship the next sunday at such a time he is no respecter of persons this set-up irishman you may be the rector of the finest cathedral in the place the mayor of the city the judge of the supreme court or even the governor of the state and should your hat chance to blow off and roll in front of him though it should cost him a fall upon the pavement that man will kick it i tell you he will kick it at, and soundly too he will make no menacing about it but go for it as he would for his neighbor's pig should he find it in his garden of cabbages at such he is full of words also and can bestow upon the stone that trips him up the same flow of abuse that he can shower upon the man who assists him to his feet end of section number thirteen read by agni section fourteen of frontier humor in verse prose and picture this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Mary Balmer. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose and Picture by Palmer Cox. The Contented Frog. The frog that once in Selby's dam its weird music shed now lies as mute as stranded clam because that frog is dead. So sleeps the plague of former days, so noisy nights are o'er, and he now on the pond decays who long cried, Sleep no more. A frog upon a log one day in meditation sat and gazed upon his pond that lay still as a tanner's bat. No fish swam in his fetid lake, no current seaward run, but hemmed by grasses, weed and brake, it mantled in the sun. At length from reverie he woke, and thus to free his mind, 
He, in the guttural jargon, spoke, peculiar to his kind. Give me my slimy pool, quoth he, before a river wide, where cranes are found, still wading round, and hungry fishes glide. Here light first dawned, here was I spawned, and here I make my home. Those longest live, who are not inclined, in foreign parts, to roam. Upon this log or stone I sit, the water fly to view, or watch the glossy whirligig describe his circles true. How foolish are some pollywogs before they've lost their tails. They often class themselves with frogs and leave their native swales. And while exploring down some ditch beneath a scorching ray, upon a sandy bar they hitch and bake as dry as hay. Had they but waited till the tail had from their body dropped, and in its stead four legs shot forth, away they might have hopped. Thus, while he sat above the pool, commenting on his lot, he heard a truant boy from school come whistling to the spot. Aha, quoth he, I hear, I see, an ancient foe of mine. He stones will throw, that well I know, and straight ones I divine. The sparrow on the picket fence, the squirrel on the limb, the swallow flying overhead, alike look out for him. There are some hands I scarcely fear, so ill a stone they guide, but when Bob Stevenson is near, tis meet that I should hide. So, prompted by the fearful thought, he leapt in with a thud, and diving to the bottom sought concealment in the mud. Now burrow, burrow, little frog, as you will trouble find. Think not because your eyes are shut that everyone is blind. Then burrow deeper, deeper far. Leave not one claw in view, or swifter than a falling star. A stone will cleave you through. While well, here, said he, I'm safe enough, and here I'll peaceful lie until that little whistling rough has passed the water by. But ah, while he did reckon that the host was not around, the youngster saw him quit the log, and soon a stone was found. He stood beside the circling pond and gazed a while below. The tell-tale mud the frog disturbed rose from the bottom slow. But ah, for childhood's searching eyes, what can escape their darts? Projecting from the mud, he spies the crooker's hinder parts. Ho, ho, then laughed this cruel boy, as downward he did stare. If you from trouble would be free of every part, take care. Then down he sent the ready stone, nor went it down in vain. Dead as the missile that was thrown, the frog came up again. Along the river's ferny banks, the frogs still chant their lays, while floating on his native pool, that stone-killed frog decays. End of section 14「Section 15 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Mary Balmer. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox All Fool's Day This is All Fool's Day, and judging by the number of people who are passing along the sidewalk with strings and rags dangling from their coattails, the custom of making people appear ridiculous is not obsolete. What delight the youngsters take 
and covering a few bricks with an old hat, and leaving it temptingly upon the sidewalk, while they withdraw into some nook to watch the bait and halloo at the person who is thoughtless enough to kick it. Though the custom has age to sanction it, I am decidedly opposed to making people, either on the 1st of April or upon any other day, appear ridiculous in their own eyes, as well as in the eyes of every person with whom they come in contact. People will make fools of themselves often enough without the assistance of others. I wonder why men are not more upon their guard upon this day. Just now I saw a newspaper reporter, who certainly should have known better, kick an old hat from his way and go limping to the office denouncing everybody in general, but children in particular. Speaking of reporters calls to mind something I have often thought. I believe if I had been endowed with more cheek and less scruples about overstepping the line of veracity, I long before this would have made my mark in the world as a newspaper scribbler. My unconquerable modesty always rose up like a barrier between me and repertorial fame. It would never allow me to dip into trivial, baseless rumors and magnify them into scandalous reports. My pride, too, was a clog that blocked the wheel of progress. I could never throw it aside long enough to intrude myself, uninvited, at select gatherings, or creep and crouch under a window sill or behind a door like a base eavesdropper to hear words that were not intended for the public ear, in order to work up a stirring article. But for these drawbacks, I cannot help thinking I would have done well at the business, because, by a singular decree of fate, I am generally present whenever any strange or amusing incident transpires, or even when scenes of a serious nature furnish work for the pen, and many a time, too, when I could well wish myself suddenly removed far enough from the distressing scene before me. This afternoon, for example, a terrible assault was perpetrated in the backyard of the house adjoining the one in which I reside. There is no use talking. I will have to get up and bundle out of this locality before long. It is becoming too rough a quarter for me. Its poisonous air would tarnish the brightest reputation that ever shone upon a forehead. With my usual luck, I happened to witness the affair. Thus far, I have kept it to myself, as I have no desire to figure in a court of justice in any such scrape. Some people, perhaps, would rush forward and volunteer their testimony, but I am not of that turn of mind, and calculate to keep my mouth shut until it is pried open by a legal bar. I have been looking over the evening papers, but they make no mention of the case. So, perhaps the authorities are keeping the matter quiet, fearing that by giving it publicity, they would defeat the ends of justice. With this thought in mind, and to help them along in their efforts, it being All Fool's Day also, I will say no more about it. End of Section 15Section 16 of Frontier Humour in Verse, Prose and Picture This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Ware Tortoise Frontier Humour in Verse, Prose and Picture by Palmer Cox Finding a horseshoe. Upon this day, and at this time, while the fire burneth in the grate, and the warm drink steameth in the bowl, I speak as with the tongue of a scribe of the olden time, and this is the burden of my speech. A certain man, a citizen of this place, as he journeyed to his home, that looketh toward the mountain which is called Lone, and at the base of which the dead are entombed, 
found a horseshoe in the way. And he was exceeding pleased because of his luck, insomuch that he rubbed his hands together joyfully, and said within himself, How blessed am I in finding this shoe in the way! This bodeth good to me and mine household, because it pointeth in the way that I am going, and it would show a lack of understanding in me, should I not pick it up. So he placed it carefully in the pouch that was sewed in the hind part of his garment, which is called the tail, and hastened on towards his home, and as he went his countenance was bright to look upon. And it came to pass, when he had arrived at his house, and was entered in at the door, he said unto himself, for he was an eccentric man, and his ways were not as the ways of sensible people, now will I make all haste, and fasten this shoe above my parlour door, that it may continually bring good towards my house. For my grandmother hath often said there lieth a charm for the good in the horseshoe that is picked up by the way. So, reaching forth his hand, he took a hammer and a nail, such a nail as builders use when they would have their work outlast themselves, and stepping upon a chair, essayed to transfix the shoe to the casing above the door. Now it chanced that this man had a wife, a woman who was not eccentric, neither had she the patience to spare on those people who had eccentric ways. And as she was at work in the kitchen, for upon the whole sea coast there was not found a more industrious or tidy woman, she heard the sound of the hammer proceeding from the room which was her pride. And she made haste, and dropped the dough that she was kneading for the oven, and looking out into the apartment she beheld her husband standing upon the chair, attempting to transfix the horseshoe above the door. And she was exceeding displeased because of his action, and of his provoking eccentricity, and she remonstrated with him mildly, saying, "'Soul of the innocents! Is this a barn, or a blacksmith's shop, or are ye gone stark staring mad?' Or has old age benumbed your senses beyond all hope, that thus you would establish the unsightly object above the door to be a jest for visitors, and a shame unto us? But the good man of the house, looking down reprovingly from the eminence upon which he was now set up, being nettled because she had likened him to a man stark staring mad, answered the woman sharply after this manner, saying, "'Go delve into thy dough, old woman!' Did ye never have a grandmother, or is thy memory as short as thy wind? Know ye not I fix it here, that it may bring good unto our house, as hath been said of it in the olden time? So he left off speaking with his wife, but turned him about, and once more essayed to establish the show above the door. For his mind was firm on that point, that he would nail it there, that it might bring good unto his house. Then waxed the woman exceedingly wroth, for she was the house of O'Donoghue, whose temper caused him to be cast into prison, because he smote the anointed priest within the chapel. And bending her body, she laid hold of the rounds of the chair upon which her husband was builded up, and pulled it suddenly from beneath him while he did reach to drive the spike. And, behold, he came down quickly, and lay upon the floor like a cedar felled. And so it happened, as the woman attempted to pass out by the door which led out to the kitchen, lo, a hammer followed after, and overtook the woman, and lodged upon her back, even between the two shoulder-blades, and caused her to cry out with a marvellous loud cry. But turning herself around, while yet the cry was proceeding from her mouth, she lifted the hammer from the floor, and cast it from her, even at the countenance of her rising husband." Now it came to pass, when the good man of the house looked upon the weapon as it left the hand of his wife, and saw it was drawing nigh unto his head, swift as a javelin hurled from a Trojan's arm, he said within himself, As my name is Bartholomew, my hour is come. And as he spoke, he dived to the floor that it might pass over and work him no harm. But even while he stooped, the weapon caught upon his scalp and peeled it backward to the very nape. 
Then went the woman out into the kitchen, and when her husband was risen from the floor, he ran out into the street, seeking where he might find a surgeon. And as he ran, people stood and looked after and communed with one another, saying, Surely this man hath escaped from the Murdochs. But he was sorely troubled because of his scalp, so he heeded not the people. Neither loitered he by the way to enlighten them concerning the wound. But when he had entered at a surgeon's door, he entreated him to make all haste and bind up his wounds, that he might become whole again. And when the surgeon drew nigh and looked upon the wound, he was exceedingly astonished and cried, Of what tribe was the savage that hath done this? But the injured man answered him sorrowfully, saying, Nay, but my wife hath done this thing. And bowing his head between his knees, he wept bitterly, even as David wept when he learned that Absalom had perished in the boughs of the great oak. And when the surgeon had poured oil upon the wound and sewed it together, even as a housewife soweth the rent in a garment, and spread plasters on his head in diverse ways, he arose and journeyed to the hall of justice, which is by the plaza, and entered a complaint against the woman. And it came to pass, when the magistrates and the wise men of the place heard his complaint, they looked upon him as a person altogether given over to falsehoods, and they questioned him, saying, How may we know if ye indeed speak the truth in our ears? And removing the bandage from his head, with which the surgeon had wrapped it round, he answered and spake unto them, saying, Ye ask for proof, and behold, I give it you. And when they drew nigh and looked upon his head, they saw that it was covered over with plasters, insomuch that it resembled a bolt of linen fresh from the loom, and they were sore displeased because of the assault. So they called together four men, the chosen officers of the force, and commanded them to arrest the woman, saying, Take ye the woman into custody, and lodge her in prison, that on the morrow we may sit in judgment over her. So these four officers, named Murray the Brave, and Flynn, styled the Blinker, and Curran and Flaherty, surnamed the Beat, armed themselves with pistols and clubs and knives, and went forth to arrest the woman. And a great crowd followed after, for they said amongst themselves, Surely some murder hath been done. So when they had come nigh to the house, they laid plans how they might surround it. And this was the manner of their approach toward the house. Murray on the east side, and Flynn, styled the blinker, on the west side, and Curran on the north side, and Flaherty, surnamed the Beat, on the south side. So they did compass the house about and enter it, and this was the manner of their entrance. One by the front door, one by the back door, one by the window that looked out at the west side of the house, and one by the window that looked out at the east side of the house. And they did converge and meet in the centre. And they found the hammer and the blood thereon, and the horseshoe and the nail sticking therein. But they found not the woman. And they searched the house, beginning at the cellar, and ascending even up to the loft. But it be known unto you the woman had fled, and her whereabouts remaineth a secret to this day. End of section 16 Read by Ware Tortoise, Manchester, 14th of February 2022「Section 17 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dana Olson. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. An Evening with Scientists. This evening, I accepted an invitation from a member of the Academy of Science to attend a regular meeting. I started out almost under protest, thinking it would prove a very dry entertainment. 
it had been said that at their meetings they conversed only about fossils or strata or grew warm while arguing some point about the Azoic or Cerulean Age, that period before the Dinotherium or even the Mastodon ran bellowing across the flinty earth. I was agreeably disappointed, however, for I found it not only instructive but amusing to others than scientists. The president announced to the academy that a feathered mouse had been sent by an unknown friend from a distant town. A vote of thanks was then tendered the donor. The feathered mouse, however, proved to be a cruel fraud, for a subsequent examination revealed the painful fact that the feathers were stuck to the skin by some adhesive substance. The vote of thanks was then rescinded, and the feathered mouse was informally introduced to the office cat. A communication was then read from a man in the interior. He informed the academy that he had in his possession a large sow, which, when quite a small pig, had been severely bitten by a black dog, which made a lasting impression upon her. In after years, if any of her litter were black, she singled them out and devoured them with as little remorse as an old woman would a dish of stirabout. The sow had that day died from the effects of eating a tarantula, and he offered to donate her to the academy, providing they would bear the cost of transporting her to the city. By a unanimous vote, the communication was laid under the table. Quite a discussion then took place as to whether pigs really do see the wind, and if so, why? A member then presented the academy with a new species of snail or slug, which he found in the mountains, and which had but one horn. He proposed having it called a unicorn snail. Quite a controversy followed. Several members maintained that the snail imprudently left its horns out overnight, and one, getting nipped by the frost, dropped off. This proposition angered the generous donor, and reaching forth a hand trembling with emotion, he lifted the snail from the palm of the admiring president and laid it down gently upon the floor, as a mother might deposit an infant in the cradle. And while the academy stood spellbound, before a tongue could be loosened from the roof of the mouth, or a hand stretched to save, he planted the sole of a number 11 boot upon the crowning back of the little gastropod, and when he lifted his foot again, all that was visible of the one-horned snail was a little grease spot upon the floor, the size of an average raindrop. This inhuman act seemed to throw a gloom over the academy. No further business appearing, the meeting adjourned. End of section 17. Section 18 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Julie Taylor. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. Our Table Girl. Oh, those girls, naughty, laughing, beautiful girls. Old Song I commenced boarding in a new place today, and am completely smitten by the charming table girl. Oh, she is young and bright and fair, with midnight eyes and inky hair, which, unconfined without a check, falls round a plump and snowy neck. Oh, sweet, she bends above my chair like Juno when old Jove's her care. And as she stoops to hear me speak, soft falls her breath upon my cheek. And I forget, true as I live, the order that I fain would give. Before her dark and earnest eyes, my appetite distracted flies. And though I hungry sit me down, I rise full as a country clown, who by a picnic table stands and shovels in with both his hands. Tis true at times the humbled board does but a scant repast the food. At times we grumble at the bread, or at the butter shake the head. And oft the whisper circles round about the mystery profound that may within the harsh repose and any fateful stir disclose. But still we linger, still we stay, and hope for better things each day, thus proving that one winning face can keep from bankruptcy the place. 
End of section 18. Section 19 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Kathy K. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. Section 19. An Old Woman in Peril. Yesterday, while in the back country, I saw an old woman in what would have been a very laughable predicament had it not been a very pitiable one. An unusually large vulture had for some time been soaring in the neighborhood, occasionally scraping acquaintance with one of the fat ewes grazing in the valley. Several of the farmers had felt the vexation of seeing him perched upon a lofty eminence and making the wool fly from some favorite Cotswold. They were justly enraged and resolved to put a stop to his depredations. They accordingly posted themselves nigh their flocks, and with guns heavily charged, awaited the advent of the rapacious bird. But he was no booby, and though his gizzard could digest a good-sized rib or a hoof, with all the ease of a Ballyshannon woman making away with a mealy potato, yet he hadn't the least inclination to test its grinding power upon a charge of slugs or buckshot. For several days thereafter he was known in the neighborhood as a high flyer. With a pining maw he would sit upon some heaven-kissing crag, and with a drooping head watch the fleecy fox gazing in the green valley below. He found it difficult, however, to cloy the hungry edge of appetite by a bare imagination of a feast, and emboldened by want began to drop to a lower level when flying across the fields. Yesterday, as mutton was out of the question, he resolved to try his beak upon some tupper viand, and while in the vicinity of the village he swooped down upon a little old woman who was gathering chips in the front of her cottage. The poor old body had not the least warning of the vulture's approach, as she stooped in the act of picking fuel enough to cook for her evening meal, he dropped upon her like an arrow. Fastening his powerful talons in the strong material of her loose-fitting garments, he spread abroad his mighty wings and began to haul her heavenward. The astonishment, anxiety, and indescribable antics of the poor old lady when she found herself slowly but surely leaving terra firma by an unknown agency were indeed terrible to witness. She knew not whether it was a gold-tinseled angel or an iron-rusted demon that was thus, in open day and while she was yet in the flesh, unceremoniously translating her to some remote planet. She had no means of discovering she was only certain she was going, that her direction was onward and upward. Her favorite hollyhock tickled her nose as she swept over her little garden, and the clothesline, that for a moment seemed to baffle the vulture's flight, was now stretching beneath. She deployed her feet, regardless of appearances, first to the right, then to the left, above and below, vainly endeavoring to come in contact with something that would give her an inkling of what was responsible for this mysterious movement. There was a vague uncertainty about the whole proceeding, well calculated to alarm her. Even though she succeeded in shaking herself loose, her fall would now be fearful, and each moment was adding to the danger. What could I do? I was powerless to save. I had no gun and even if I had there would have been some grave doubts in my mind as to the propriety of firing, as I generally shoot low, and such an error in my aim could hardly have been proved otherwise than disastrous. There is no use striving to make the bird loosen his hold by hooting. If there had been any virtue in that sort of demonstration, the old woman would hardly have raised above the eaves of her shanty, for she was screaming in a manner that would have made a modic blush. The only thing that suggested itself, and that rather hurriedly, was to get out my pencil and paper and take a sketch as she appeared passing over her cottage in the vulture's talons. The blood, which at first forsook her cheeks through fear, was almost instantly forced back into her visage again by the pendant position of her head. She beat the empty tin pan which she still retained in her hand, but the voracious and hunger-pinched vulture had no notion of relinquishing his hold on account of noise. On the contrary, he seemed to enjoy it, and with many a sturdy twitch and flap, and many an airy wheel, 
he still held his way toward a rugged promontory situated at the head of the valley. Fortunately, when he was 20 feet from the ground and about 80 rods from the cottage, the calico dress and undergarments in which mainly his talons were fastened gave out and the liberated woman dropped on hands and knees in the muddy bed of the creek over which the bird was passing at the time. While hovering over her, about to pounce down upon her and try the elevating business again, a sheep herder who had seen the bird approaching the cottage gave him a dose of buckshot, which broke one wing and left him at the mercy of his captor. End of section 19《Section 20 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Adrian Stevens. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. For better or worse. Jonathan, I ain't got no tongue for soaping of ye. Susan Jane, I mean business, I do. Will you have me? Susan Jane, I don't know much about ye, Jonathan Junket, but I'm willing to risk it, anyhow. Here's my hand. I'm yawn. Old volume. This afternoon I attended a private wedding on Howard Street. I may safely term it marriage in high life, as the combined height of the couple was something over twelve feet. The groom was a bachelor who, for many a year, had stood around the fire like the half of a tongs, very good as a poker, but not worth standing room as a picker-up. He looked as though it wouldn't require much advice to make him, even at the eleventh hour, prove recreant to his vows and back out from under the yoke the reverend gentleman was about to place upon his neck. His companion, however, was no novice in the business in which she was engaged. She was fearlessly putting forth upon that sea on which she had twice been wrecked, but she was nothing loath to try it again, were she only skilled in navigation as well as in embarkation. She would have been the one to send on expeditions to either the North Pole or South Pole, as the case may be. It was truly encouraging to the timorous and uninitiated to see with what a broad smile she regarded her husband that was to be, and with what a readiness she responded to the momentous question propounded by the minister. And when they stood as husband and wife, her Milesian face lighted up with irrepressible joy until it beamed like a Chinese lantern. Her emotions went far to convince me that there is in those matrimonial fields a balm for every ill, a perfect bliss worthy the seeking, even at the risk of receiving the bruised spirit, if not the bruised head. End of section 20. Section 21 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Mary Balmer. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox Ode on a Bumblebee O oh, busy, breezy bumblebee, a fitting theme in you I see. At once you backward turn my gaze to orchard, mead, and pasture days, to watch your movements to and fro with wondering eyes as years ago. Come, let me set my mark on thee as thou hast oft remembered me, when, with a seeming special zeal, you hastened to affix your seal. I've heard your gruff good morrow ring when meeting kinsfolk on the wing. Now coming zigzag, light and airy, 
now going laden, straight and wary, still mindful of the spider's snare and kingbird, pirate of the air. I've seen you upward turn your eye when clouds began to fleck the sky, the winds to chafe the village pond, and thunder rumble far beyond, and threaten storm ere you could fill your honey sack so empty still. I've heard you whining forth your grief when rain commenced to pelt the leaf and made you take the shortest road that brought you to your dark abode. I've marked your grumbling when you found the working bee had been around, had left his bed and waxen door and reached the field an hour before. For still, with early bird or bee or man, the maxim does agree. They all must be content to find what early risers leave behind. Against the bell I've heard you storm, because it kept your burly form from passing in the honeyed way that opened to the emmet lay. Thus, human folk are oft denied what in their judgment or their pride they should enjoy, though kept instead for meaner things that creep ahead. I know how apt you are to cling to locks of hair, to hide and sing, and keep the victim still in doubt just where the mischief will break out. I know full well your angry tone, and how you stab to find the bone. What with a brave, heroic breast, ye strike for queen and treasure chest. Like Sparta's sons at duty's call, compelled to win or fighting fall, not fearing odds nor counting twice, ye fix your bayonet in a thrice, and charge upon the nearest foe, and break the ranks where'er you go, for not the stroke of halberdier nor thrust of Macedonian spear can check your onset when you fly, with full intent to do or die. Beneath your straight and rapid dart the foe will tumble, turn, depart, and leave you victor to report your doings at the queen bee's court. And proudly may you bear your brow in presence of your sovereign bow and tell her why you came so late, thus panting to the palace gate, and show your limbs of wax bereft, your right arm crushed and sprained the left your twisted horn, exhausted sting, your wounded scalp and tattered wing. But how, in spite of every ill, you struck for independence still, until the acre lot was free of all that would molest the bee. Tis said that youngsters have a knack to take you prisoner by the back, to catch you by the wings in haste, a piece above the belted waist, and hold you thus to struggle there, and use your sting on empty air. But once I tried, and once I missed, for you're a great contortionist, and somehow turn and manage still to plant your poison where you will. Ah, they are wise who meddling cease, and let you go your way in peace. Though many things may slip to my mind, before the narrow bed I find in fancy's field, I'd often see the busy, burly bumblebee. End of section 21。section 22 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. Dudley and the Greased Pig Boyle stricken Job had his comforters, who, despite his timely injunction, Oh, lay your hands upon your mouths and thereby show your wisdom, would still drum in his ear. Hear us, for we will speak. Poor old Falstaff had his evil genius in Bardolph, 
his impecunious follower, with his, Lend me a shilling. And I have my burdensome Jim Dudley, with his, Let me tell you a story. I was kept awake last night, listening to his crazy yarn about the greased pig, as if I cared anything about his villainous adventures. Oh, yes, that scrape with the greased pig. I never told you about it, eh? It's worth hearing. That was a tearin' old race, and I came mighty nigh getting shoved out of the village on account of it, too. Now, I can tell you. Down on me? Well, I reckon you'd think so if you heard the hollerin' that was goin' on for a while arter that race. Some cryin' one thin and some another. Tard and feather the cheat, one would holler. Lynch the blamed humbug, another would shout. Put him in a sack and hissed him over the bridge would come from another quarter. A doctor was never so down on a patent medicine as they were on me arter that race, especially Parson Coolridge, who was one of the principal sufferers, you see. It was May Day amongst them, and the whole village seemed to be out there enjoying themselves. They had sack races and wheelbarrow races. That was the day blindfold Tom Moody ran the wheelbarrow through the grocer's window, and old Shulkin knocked him down with a ham and a dog ran away with it. He charged Tom with the ham and the bill, along with the broken winder. They had a greased pole standing there with a ten-dollar greenback tacked on top of it, and no person could get within ten feet of the bill. The hungry crowds were standing round all day, gazing longily up at the fluttering greenback, like dogs at a coon in a treetop. I didn't try the pole, but when they brought out the greased pig, a great slab-sided critter, just in good condition for racing, I got sort of interested in the performance. His tail was more than a foot long, and it was greased until it would slip through a feller's fingers like a newly caught eel. Several of the boys started out of him. they just made one catch, and before they were certain whether they had hold of it, they would go one way, and the hog would go another, then the crowd would holler. I was standing there leaning over the fence, watching of him for some time, and I see the pig was in the habit of forming a sort of ring with his tail. Leastwise, he'd lap it over so that it he had most formed a knot. All it lacked was the end wanting drawn through. I calculated that a feller with pooty nimble fingers could make a tie by just slipping his fingers through the ring and hauling the end of the tail through. That would make a plaguey good knot and prevent his hand from slipping off. Arter to think it over it some time, I concluded... If I could get up a bet that would pay for the hardships that a fellow would be likely to experience, I would try a catch anyhow. So I says to Jake Swayze, who stood alongside of me, Jake, I believe that I can hold that pig until he gins out. Hold, he sees, surprised like, and raising his eyebrows just that way. What's the matter, ye? Ain't you sleeped well? You might as well try to hold old Nick by the tail is that big, slab-sided critter. Well, now, just wait a bit, says I. So I went on and told him what I calculated to do, and arter he looked a while, he says, Wow, go ahead, Jim. I'll back ye. I reckon we can get any amount of odds so long as we keep the knot business to ourselves. So pulling off my coat, I gin it to Jake to hold. And jumping on the fence, I hollered, I'll bet ten to twenty that I can freeze to the pig's tail till he gins out. Great fish hooks, you ought to have seen them rustling towards me. I couldn't see anything but hands for five minutes, as they were holding em up, and a gig and signalin', and a hollering. I'll take that bet, Dudley, I'll take that bet. I got rid of what money I had about me pooty soon, and Jake Swayze was just a spreadin' out his greenbacks like a paymaster, and arter he exhausted his treasury, he started arter his sister to get what money she had. I hollered to him to come back. I was fearin' he'd tell her about the knot business, but he wasn't no fool, and know too well what gals are to trust her with a any payin' secret. Old Judge Perkins was thar, jolly as a boy on the last day of school. Well, he was holdin' of the stakes and his pockets were crammed chock full of greenbacks. He was a pooty good friend of mine, and couldn't conceive how in thunder 
I was a-gwin to get my money back. Beckon of me one side. Dudley, says he, kind of low that way, and confidentially like. I know you're as hard to catch as an old trout with three broken hooks in its gill, but I can't help thinking a greased pig's tail is a mighty slippery foundation to build a hopes on. Never mind, Judge, says I, winking. I can see my way through. Yes, Dudley, he says, a shaking of his head dubious-like. That's what the fly says when he's a button his head against the winder. Well, says I, without the tail pulls out, I could lay to travel mighty close in the wake of that swine for the next half hour. And with that, I moved off to where the pig was standing and listening to all that was going on. I fooled round him a little until I got betwixt him and the crowd. And when he flapped his tail over as I was telling ye, I made one desperate lunge and made a go of it the first time. I just hauled the end through while he was turning round and grabbing hold above my hand, rolled it down into the tightest knot you ever sought eyes on. It was about two inches from the end of the tail, and he scalloped round so amazing lively nobody could see it. The crowd allowed I was hanging on the straight tail, and they didn't know what to make of the performance anyhow. Go it, piggy, I says to myself, just that way. I guess it's only a question of endurance now, as the gal said when she had the flea under the hot flat iron. The gate was open and ordered a few circles round the lot. The hog painted for it, and away he went. Pig first did I order. He ran helter-skelter under old Mother Sheehan, the fruit woman, just as she was coming through the gateway with a big basket of apples on each arm. I did hate like snakes to hoist the old lady. Bounce me if I didn't. I would rather run round the mountain than do it. Cause you see, she had just been getting off a bed of sickness that came nigh shrouding her, and she wasn't prepared for a panic by any means. I did my best to swing the critter round and get him off the notion of going through, but his mind was made up. There was plenty of room outside for him to pass along without disturbing the old lady. But a hog is a hog, you know. Contrary, the world over. Besides, he allowed he could brush me off by the operation. But I wasn't so easily got rid of. The money was up, you see, and I had no choice but to follow where he led and stick to the rooter till he get out. Where thou goest, I will go. I seized to myself remember the passage in the scriptures and ducking my head to follow him. I scratched down as low as I could and keep on my feet, for I calculated to do my best. The old woman would get elevated pretty lively. She hollered as though a whole menagerie, elephants, kangaroos, snakes and all, had broke loose. Her sight wasn't any too clear, and the whole proceedings had come upon her so sudden that she didn't exactly know what sort of an animal was there. She would have been satisfied if it was a hog if it hadn't taken so long to get through. I followed so close to his hams that she reckoned we both made one animal. The hog gin a snort when he started in to run the blockade, and she sees to herself, There goes a big hog. And about the time she reckoned he had got out of the other side, I come a-bumpin' and a-boomin' along in my shirt-sleeves, and gin her a second boost, throwing the old woman completely off her pins and out of her calculations at once. She did holler good. There's no mistake about that. The crowd hurrayed and applauded. The older ones, of course, sympathized with the poor old woman. They could do nothing more, because the whole catastrophe come as sudden as an earthquake, and nobody seemed to be to blame. I wasn't, and they all could see that plain enough. The youngins went for the scattered apples, but the pig and I kept right on attending to business. Now and again he doubled back towards the crowd, and they commenced scattering every which way, tramping on each other's feet, so I group. The cashiered man of war's man stepped on Pat Cronin's bunion, and he responded by fetching the old salt a welt in the burr of his ear, and at it they went, tooth and nail, right thar. A few stopped to see fair play, but the heft of the crowd, about three hundred, kept right on arter me and the hog. Jake Swayze managed to get up pooting eye to us once and hollered, Are you making it, Jim? Frustrate, I answered. I calculate to stick to the swine through bush and bramble till I tire him out. That's the feeling, he shouted, and with that we left him behind. The old judge was a puffin' and a blowin', strivin' his best to keep up, 
and for some time he actually led the crowd. We didn't hold on very long, but gradually sank to the rear. Rod Munyon, the tanner, stumbled and fell while crossing the street. His false teeth dropped out into the dirt, and while he was scrambling on all fours to get him again, a fellow named Welsh, who was clattering past, slapped his foot down and bent the plate out of all shape. Munyon snatched him up again as quick as the foot riz and wiping him on his overalls as he ran, chucked him back into his mouth again, all twisted as they were. They did look awful, though, sticking straight out from his mouth and pressing his lip chalk up against his nose. You couldn't understand what he was saying any more than if he was Chinook. Bow-legged Spinney, the cabbage and tailor, was thar. He met the crowd while carrying home Squire Lockwood's new suit and catching the excitement of the moment tossed the package into Slauson's yard, and it bounded into the well quicker than scat. He didn't know it, though, but hollered to the old woman as he ran past the window to look out the package till he got back. Not seeing any package, she allowed he was crazy as a cow with her head stuck in a barrel and flew the bowl out of her doors pooty lively. He had been once to the lunatic asylum, you see, and they were still suspicious of him. The crowd thought to head us off by taking down a narrow lane, and it was a while they were in that, that they began to surge ahead of Judge Perkins. He was awful quick-tempered, and Pooty conceded, and when Bo Liggett Spiney was elbowing past him, he got mad. Catching the poor Stitcher by the coat-tail, he hollered, What? A miserable thread into a machine claiming precedence? And with that he slung him more than ten feet, landing him on his back in a nook of the fence. That was the day they buried old Mrs. Redpath, the doctors disagreed over. Dr. Ludy had been doctoring her for some time for bone disease. He said her backbone wore decaying. He didn't make much of it, though. And they got another doctor. The new feller said he understood the case thoroughly. He ridiculed the idea of bone disease and went to work doctoring for the liver complaint. He said it had stopped working and he was going to get it started again. I reckon he'd have accomplished something if she had lived long enough. But she died in the meantime. When they held a post-mortem, they found out the old woman, some time in her life, had swallowed a fishbone which never passed her stomach, and eventually it killed her. Thar, sees Dr. Ludy, what did I tell you? You'll admit, I reckon my diagnosis of the disease was right out her all. Only I made a slight error in locating the bone. Bone be splintered, says the other feller. He and I have been working neither the ailing parter than you. So they went on quacking thar and disagreeing over her until old Redpath got mad and hollered. Ye old melon heads, isn't it enough that I'm a widower by your fumbling malpractice without having ye wrangling over the old woman? So he put them both out and chucked their knives and saws ordered them. But as I was saying, that was the day of the funeral, and while I was proceeding from the church to the burying ground with Parson Coolridge at the head, with his long white gown on, we hove in sight, coming tearing down towards the parsonage. The minister was a feller that actually towed him on flowers. When he wasn't copping his sermons, he was fussing round among the posies. He had his garden chock full of all kinds of plants and shrubs. There you could see the snapdragon from Ireland, the fuchu from China, the snowball from Canada, the bachelor's button from California, and every kind you could mention. He had noticed the garden gate was open when the funeral passed and it worried him considerable. So when he heard the hooting and hollering and had sight of the crowd surging down the street and see the pig and I pointing in the direction of the house, he couldn't go ahead and know how. Turning round to the pallbearers who were puffing along behind him, he says, Ease your hands a minute, boys. Let the old woman rest till I run back and see if Dudley is going to drive the hog into my garden. Confound him! he continued. He's was to have round the neighborhood than the measles. With that, he started back on the run, his long white gown a-flying the way out behind, the most comical-looking thing you ever see. And he could run, that Parson Coolridge, in a way that was astonishing. I reckon he hadn't stirred out of a walk before for thirty years. Yet he streaked it over the ground as though he was an everyday occurrence. His joints cricked and snapped with the usual motion, like an old stairs in frosty weather. He didn't mind that so long as he could get over the ground. He was thinking of his favorite plants and the prospect of their getting stirred up, and transplanted in a manner he wasn't prepared to approve. 
He did jerk back his elbows, pretty spiteful now, I can tell you. Tried to make that get away fast, and put in his best strides. But when he saw he couldn't, he hollered, Keep that hog out of my garden, Dudley, or I'll take the law of ye. Don't get wrathy, Parson Coolridge, I shouted. I can't prevent the pig from going in. I have hold of the rudder. But I'll be boosted if I can steer the ship. With that, through the opening we went. Pig fussed and me arter, and the whole crowd of clattering behind. The judge was amongst them, but got left in the hind end of it, where the women were a-trotting. The parson's flowers went down with a broken necks quicker than lightning. It wasn't more than ten seconds until they were six inches underground, for the hog kept the circle around, and the hurraying crowd followed in order, paying no more attention to the parson than if he had been a young'un running around. When they saw the crowd, the pallbearers and most of the people who were just following the remains through sympathy turned back on the run and left the mourners standing thar by the coffin. Oh, it was the most exciting time the village ever seed. The ground was too soft in the garden for the pig to get around well. And pretty soon he get out. I was awful tired, too, and was hanging a dead weight on him for the last ten minutes. When the boy see the knot on the tail, you ought to hear him a-hollering. Bats off! Bats off! They were suddenly claiming a foul, and surrounded the old judge demanding our money. But as the crowd was increasing, and the parson was even most crazy, the judge told him to come with him to the courthouse. He wouldn't decide nothing in the garden. As the hog couldn't walk, the judge took his tobacco knife, and cut the tail off, and took it along with him to introduce us proof. He decided in my favor. He said that I had held on to the tail, and touched nothing else. And if I managed to tie a knot while running, I had performed a feat never before heard of in the country. So he paid over the money. The Parson Coolridge was the most worked up of any of them. He had had legal advice on the matter. But the lawyer told him to gin it up, for the judge was on my side. Besides, he shouldn't have left the gate open, if he didn't want the pig to go in thar. After a while, he gin up the notion of suing me, but while he stopped in the village, he never got over it. The boys had pictures chalked up on the fences and shop doors, so that wherever you'd look, you see sketches of the parson running back from the funeral, and me holding on to the pig's tail. He paid out more than ten dollars in small sums to one boy, hiring him to go round and rub out the pictures whenever he happened to see him. But every time the parson would start out through the village, thar on some fence or door, or side of a building, would be the same striking picture of him, a streak in it to head off the hog. So he would start the rubbing out, boy harder that one. One evening, he happened to catch that self-same little rascal hard at work, talking out the identical sketch on the cooper shop door. And the parson was so billy mad, he chased him all over the village. The young speculator had been carrying on a lively business. But after that discovery, there was a sudden falling away in his income. I tell ye, he made a plaguey stir thar for a while. And I reckon if Judge Perkins hadn't been on my side... I've been obliged to get out of the place. End of section 22. Read by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 23 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. Cora Lee Would you hear the story told of the controversy bold that this day I did behold in a court of low degree? where his honour sat like fate to decide twixt the state and a wanton villain's mate named cora lee the bold chief of stars was near as a witness to appear by his order cora dear was languishing below and for counsel she had got a descendant of old wat noted for his daring plot some years ago it was he commenced the fuss for said he by this and thus here i smell an animus as strong as musk of yore and it's my condensed belief 
that in language terse and brief i can trace it to the chief e'en to his door then to all it did appear that the chief was seized with fear to the lawyer he drew near and to him muttered low i could never think that ye would be quite so hard with me you had better let me be and travel slow then the lawyer quit his chair as if wasps were buzzing there and with quite a tragic air addressed his honour thus at your hands i claim protection keep your eyes in this direction take cognizance of his action this animus then arose the chief of stars and his visage shone like mars when he wrecks not battle scars but charges to the fray and his hand began to glide to his pocket deep and wide where a weapon well supplied in waiting lay ho oh, he cried you shyster hound if you go on nosing round till an animus you found my dear sir hearken you i will open by my soul in your carcass such a hole you will think a wagon pole has run you through you would prate about the law you would magnify a flaw you would touch me on the raw so now sir say no more keep a padlock on your jaw not a sentence or i'll draw and i'll scatter you like straw around the floor now the judge's face grew red as a turkey gobbler's head when a scarlet robe is spread on the lawn or fence i adjourn the court he cried till that animus has died and is buried head and hide far from hence then the rush was for the door from the corridors they pour three old women were run o'er within the justice hall and above the tramp and patter and the cursing and the chatter and the awful din and clatter rose their squall when the open air was gained then the epithets were rained and the passer's ear was pained with profanity flung loose back and forth the worldly pair shameless swapped opinions there till all parties got their share of vile abuse when the man of briefs would flee chieftain followed like a bee or a shark a ship at sea when hunger presses sore till enraged the lawyer he cried if fight you want of me wait with patience minutes three not any more till i hasten up the stair to my office and prepare like yourself for rip and tear and piling bodies dead then if you can blaze it faster carve designs for probe or plaster quicker work a soul's disaster just waltz ahead but alas his hasty tongue vulgar name or sentence flung and the chieftain's pride was stung down to the marrow bone now upon him head and tail pitch policemen tooth and nail hot as bees when they assail a lazy drone and upon the evening breeze rose the begorahs and the yees of a dozen moroonies as they roughly hail the poor lawyer through the street sometimes lifted from his feet sometimes o'er the novel beat toward the jail now upon a truss of straw lies the counsellor at law wishing satan had his paw on wily cora lee for himself to grief is brought while the animus he sorts running is as free as thought or like his fee End of section 23. Recording by Alan Mapstone. Section 24 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dana Olson. 
Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox A Brilliant Forensic Effort Having learned that a highly educated and respectable lady of this city had instituted a suit in one of our courts for the purpose of obtaining a divorce from her husband, I stepped into the Hall of Justice to learn how the case progressed. The fact of a young wife demanding a separation in a country like this, which is proverbial for its separations, is nothing to be wondered at, and I was considerably surprised on reaching the courtroom to find it so full of people that I could hardly gain admittance. I was not so much astonished at the great rush, however, when informed by the bailiff that the ground on which the lady rested her case was that her husband snored. As I entered, the plaintiff's lawyer commenced addressing the court. He entered into the case with the spirit and fire of a clay or a webster. After reviewing and commenting largely upon the testimony given in the case, he ended his argument in the following words. Now, sir, whatever other people may think of this application, I take a bold stand, regardless whose corns or bunions I tread upon, so long as I put my foot down where it belongs. We have too many snorers among us. They are in our places of amusement, introducing groans and thunder where none were intended to play. We find them in our places of worship, breaking forth in the midst of the pastor's prayer, or while he is picturing to the congregation the wreck of ages and the crash of worlds. I maintain that this application is a righteous one that it is a shot in the right direction, which will in all likelihood eventually bring down the game, and were I a judge invested with power to decide a peculiar case of this kind, I would show no hesitation, but grant the plaintiff her natural and very reasonable request more readily than if the grounds on which she sued for a separation were drunkenness or desertion. The absurdity of an irascible wife seeking a divorce from a husband because he indulges too freely in the flowing bowl must be apparent to all. She rushes into the crowded courtroom and, figuratively speaking, catches the astonished justice by the ears as Job in the extremity of his distress laid upon the horns of the altar and requests him to sever the chafing bonds with his legal shears. Again. What a pitiable lack of discretion that woman exhibits who appeals to the court merely because her husband deserts her, leaving her to pursue the even tenor of her way. Why, in nine cases out of ten, this is a consummation devoutly to be wished. She is left untrammeled and has no husband to support. I will not allude to the many other failings which wreck a home and put out the cheerful light of many a hearthstone. But, sir, it is with no ordinary thrill of pride that I espouse the cause of the woman who seeks a divorce from a snoring husband. I say, and I may remark that I say it boldly, that I rejoice it was reserved for me to raise my voice in her defense. I hold that a man who with malice aforethought takes from her peaceful home a tender and confiding maiden without first informing her of his trouble commits a grave and unpardonable crime. The dogs of justice should be loosed at his heels to hound him from Puget Sound to Pamasquity Bay. He should be made to repent his villainous act. Think how the tender nerves of a sensitive creature must be shocked on being awakened by such an outburst. Picture to yourself her husband, not breathing her name in words of love, but lying flat on his back and snoring with the behemoth of a stranded porpoise. Now, sir, I ask what mercy should be shown the monster who has himself shown none. He has doomed a fair representative of that sex whose presence civilizes ours, to an ever-new affliction and a life of perpetual wakefulness. What course can she pursue? There are but two roads. Which shall she take? One leads to the courtroom and the other leads to the cemetery. She must either be freed from her husband or go down to an untimely grave, perhaps to have her place quickly filled by another unsuspecting victim. No, Your Honor, this man, and I regret to say it, this husband and father, should not be permitted to destroy the peace and bright prospects of more than one female. Let it be known to the world that he has ruined the hopes of a loving wife. Let it be blazoned upon the housetops and upon the fences that he snores. Then let him get another mate if he can. The wife should not only have a divorce from the deceptive monster, but she should have the custody of the children. She deserves them by virtue of her long-suffering and patience, while he who has so heartlessly deceived her cannot be competent to guide their little feet aright in the dangerous walks of life. On behalf of this sorrowing wife, all other wives, and of the wives yet to be, who are ripening into womanhood around our hearths, I cry separation. 
and the name of confidence betrayed, of hopes blasted, and of a life aged before its time, I repeat, separation! Separation! He sank into his seat, and despite the order of the bailiff for silence in court, generous applause swept throughout the room. The judge took occasion to compliment the lawyer for his able argument, and said it was the greatest forensic effort he had listened to since he assumed the responsibilities of his office. The prayer was granted, and the children awarded to the plaintiff. End of section 24. Section 25 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. Visiting a School. Accepting an invitation extended by the principal of an uptown school, I visited that institution today. The masses of young humanity a person finds in these temples of instruction is something amazingly impressive. Eight or nine hundred scholars are attending the one school on which I bestowed my attentions today. This article must be embellished with a faithful sketch of a boy who stood at the head of his class. How he felt at the moment, I couldn't say, never having any experience in the position myself. He looked happy and confident, however, and snapped eagerly at the words as they fell from the teacher's lips, much as a hungry dog does at the crumbs falling from a table. But my sympathies were decidedly with the little contortionist who stood mournfully at the foot of her class. I knew how that was myself. I had been yar, and I regretted I wasn't a ventriloquist, that I might from afar whisper in her ear and assist her over some clogging syllables. If she could have gone into the yard where I noticed a scholar of the senior class throwing herself in a delirium of joy brought about by a skipping rope, she would probably have acquitted herself in a credible manner, and won the praise of all. For however inferior a person may be to another in some matters, when they can choose their game they often reverse the order, and peradventure the poor stammering scholar could have skipped the skirts off those jogging ahead of her in the common speller. End of section 25 Section 26 of Frontier Humor and Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor and Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. The Rejected Suitor Not often does a sadder sight wake sympathetic strain than glimpse of some rejected wight whose suit has proved in vain who often pinched necessities for bouquets sweet and rare for tickets to the carnival the opera or fair whose pocket off was visited the candy box to fill the dollar spent that should have gone to pay his laundry bill especially the case is sad if he who seeks a wife has step by step encroached upon the shady side of life the fly no darker prospect views than in the inkstead peers than he whose unrequited love must leak away in tears at such a time how ill the smile becomes the rival face the ha ha ha's the winks and nods seems sadly out of place and then comparisons are drawn at the expense no doubt of him whose overflowing cup seems full enough without while he who moves away alas of every grace so free to criticism opens wide the door as all may see his mind is not reflecting now on fashions style or art on proper pace 
or rules of grace but on his slighted heart he now but sees his promised joys all foundering in his view his castles tumbling down that high in brighter moments grew to know that now those ruby lips another's mouth will press and now that soft and soothing hand another's brow caress oh dark before and dark behind and full of woe and pain is life to him whose heavy loss makes up a rival's gain the gravel walk beneath his feet cannot too sudden ope together in the wretch who mourns the death of every hope the swallows whispering in a row seem mocking at his tear and in the cawing of the crow he seems to catch a sneer the cattle grazing in the field a while their lunch delay to gaze at him who moves along in such a listless way perhaps he'll know a thousand griefs ere death has laid him low perhaps beside an open grave he'll shed the tear of woe perhaps he'll turn him from the sods that hide a mother's face a father's smile a brother's hand or sister's buried grace but there can hardly come a time when life will look so drear or can so little reason show why he should linger here end of section twenty six read by greg giordano newport ritchie florida Section 27 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Mary Palmer. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by palmer cox a night of terror i am not the oldest inhabitant and don't know what sort of storms they used to have here before the flood but i'll wager a corner lot against a plug of tobacco that this section for the last twenty years has not snoozed through a rougher night than the one just passed it would have been a glorious night for a revivalist to stir up the masses Converts would have crowded in like grist to a mill after harvest. Since the last great earthquake, I have not felt so much concern about my future state as I did about twelve o'clock last night. I arose from bed and went to rummaging books, trying to find the description of a storm that would equal ours. I found the tempest that Tam O'Shanter faced the night he discovered the witches and the one in which King Lear was cavorting around, bareheaded, and that which made Caesar take an account of stock and turn to interpreting dreams, and jumbled them all together. But the product was unequal to the fury that was raging without. There was no more similarity than a baby's rattle bears to a Chinese gong. Then I fished out the storm that howled, while Macbeth was murdering Duncan, and tumbled it in with the others. This edition made things about even. The lamentations heard I the air of Macbeth's tempest were a fair precedent of the clamorous uproar from the fire bell in the city hall tower. Only an earthquake was lacking to enable us to say the earth was feverous and did shake or boast a night outvying four of the roughest on record, all woven into one. It had one good effect, however, one for which poison and bootjacks have been tried in vain. It did silence the dogs and cats. Their midnight carousals were as rare as they were in Paris, just before the capitulation. Quarrelsome curs postponed the settlement of their little differences and defiant barks until such times as they would be able to discover themselves whether they barked or yawned 
and cats sought other places besides a fellow's window-sill to express opinions about each other or chant their tales of love. I know the rain is refreshing, the wind purifying, the lightning grand, and the thunder awe-inspiring, but, as the poor landlubber advised, when he was clinging to the spar of the wrecked vessel, praise the sea, but keep on land. So I say to those people who want to prick up their willing ears like a war horse to catch the sublime rumble of heaven's artillery or sit by their window and blink at the blazing sky like a bedazzled owl at a calcium light. But I know one individual who could have got along quite as well if there had raged no war of the elements. He would have slept soundly and never mourned for what he had lost. End of section 27section 28 of frontier humor in verse prose and picture this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by dana olson frontier humor in verse prose and picture by palmer cox my drive to the cliff I am woefully out of humor, and what is worse, out of pocket, and have just been settling a bill for repairs to a buggy which was knocked out of kilter on the Cliff House Road the other day. At the present writing, I feel that it will be some time before I take the chances of injuring another. The moon may fill her horn and wane again, the seals howl and the ocean roar, but I will hardly indulge in the luxury of a drive to the beach for many a day to come. I had a couple of ladies with me. Splendid company, ladies are, so long as they have unlimited confidence in your skill as a driver. But they try one's patience after they lose faith and want to get the lines in their own hands every time you chance to run a wheel into the ditch or accidentally climb over a pig or calf. Those who were with me on that occasion are not particularly loud in their praise of my driving. The fact is, I didn't equip myself in a manner calculated to draw down encomiums in showers upon my head. I drove a span that day. They were called high-strung animals, but I don't like high-strung horses anymore. If they would only run along the track like a locomotive, I could hold the ribbons as gracefully as anybody, but I am very much opposed to all of their little by-plays. This getting scared at a floating thistle-down or a grasshopper swinging on a straw is something I don't approve of in a horse. There is no reason in it. No profit accrues from it. But my trotters were frightened at different objects at the same moment, one at a snail peacefully pursuing his way across the road, and the other at a butterfly winging his wobbling flight across the ditch. At once they became unmanageable, and vied with each other in extravagant antics. From the first, the ladies had no very exalted opinion of my manner of handling the lines. Even before we were well underway, I had the misfortune to run down a calf. Then a Newfoundland dog thought to stop the buggy by taking hold of one of the hubs, but he made a misdive and, shoving his head between the spokes, kept us company for twenty rods without any effort on his part whatsoever. I also ran over a wheelbarrow loaded with bricks. The Irishman escaped with a crushed hat and overthrew an applewoman's stand while turning a corner. I can yet hear, ringing in my ear, the shouts and execrations of the old vendor when she saw the wheels mounting her baskets and squeezing the cider out of her choicest bellflowers. Until I passed the next street, I could look back and see the old lady in her embarrassing situation. There she sat, caught under a broken table, and kicking about wildly in frantic efforts to free herself while her bonnet was knocked askew by the fall, and stuck on one side of her head in the most jaunty position imaginable. At this point, the horses became more frightened and commenced cutting up strange didos. Things were getting badly mixed, so much so that one horse turned his head to the dasher. The ladies took a hurried view of the situation, and voting me an incompetent driver began to desert me by back-action movements over the rear end of the buggy. I shall always think that I could have managed the animals without any difficulty if they had not 
both been frightened at the same time. But with one bucking like a Mexican plug, evidently bent on crawling under the buggy, and the other seemingly striving to reach the stars by an invisible ladder, they were indeed difficult to control. My companions concluded they had sufficient buggy riding for one day, and took the cars into town, while I patched up the harness as best I could and returned to the livery stable, fully concurring with the women folks that as a driver I was not a success, and that hereafter promenades would suit me better. End of section 28section 29 a frontier humor in verse prose and picture this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org frontier humor in verse prose and picture by palmer cox second sight a singular case of second sight occurred in the western part of the city last evening while I was there. An old Irishman named McSweegan, who lived in that locality, is the possessor of a multiplying pair of eyes. That is, they have the strange faculty of making two objects of one. This natural endowment is particularly distinguishable after he has been indulging freely in strong decoctions of old rye. Yesterday he was attending a primary election, at which he expected to be brought before the public as a candidate for a fat local office. An influential friend had been entrusted with the highly important and vital mission of bringing his name before the delegates for which service he was to receive some petty office if the election was effected. McSweegan stood back in a recess of the hall, hat in hand, impatiently waiting to hear the familiar name pronounced. In fancy, he already listened to the shout of applause that would follow his nomination. But he stood with a quiet smile and an attentive ear in vain. Candidate after candidate was announced but the ancient and honorable name of McSweegan thrilled not his oracle nerves. The ticket was at last declared full, and he was not one of the happy number. His friend had played him false, to use a common expression, had gone back on him, and he was justly indignant. On his way home he took lethean draughts in which to drown his troubles and keen disappointment and by the time he reached his clapboard front was in capital condition for seeing double the hour was late as he entered his house but he found his industrious better half sitting at a table sewing by the flicker of a tallow candle his red and multiplying optics were riveted by the wannish flame which to him had the semblance of two well-defined and separate lights this was an extravagance he could not countenance. To have found his wife up at such a late hour would have been severe enough strain upon his already ruffled temper, for he had no wish to discuss the result of the primary, but to find her needlessly consuming two candles showed a wastefulness on her part, evincing an utter disregard for the low condition of his exchequer. He was exceedingly provoked, and with a view of curtailing home expenses, attempted to puff out one of the flames. After several ineffective attempts, in which he scorched his whiskers and eyebrows, he succeeded, but found himself enveloped in Egyptian darkness. His rage increased. He at once accused his wife of blowing out the other candle through spite. Her contradictions only fanned his fury and the performance ended by putting her out of the house and keeping her out all night, for which unhusbandly treatment she had him arrested, and he now languishes in the lock-up. End of section 29 Section 30 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox The Thief Richard Rowe was a thief whose temptation to steal always grew more resistless when wanting a meal. Once he entered a store when no person was by, took a box of sardines and attempted to fly. But although he could slope when occasion required, like a stag to a stream when the forest is fired, the scoundrel was spotted and nabbed at the door by officers Murphy, McManus, and Moore. And away to the jail midst a crowd you should see went the thief, the sardines, and the officers three. The next day came his hearing, and people were there from all stations in life on the prisoner to stare. There were gamblers, street pavers, stevedores, undertakers, ship chandlers, brick masons, and umbrella makers, corn doctors, reporters, clerks, tailors, and teachers, fruit peddlers, horse trainers, clairvoyants, and preachers. A few women also jammed in with the rest, with their bonnets awry and their clothing sore pressed, and their uplifted faces perspiring in red, full ear-deep in the back of some person ahead. And like peas in a kettle or bees in a hive, ever shifting position so they were alive, all impatiently wedging around in the stew, in the hope they could better their chance for a view this one grumbling because someone crowded so near that he shot his hot breath in the depths of his ear, that one cursing because someone's elbow so rude on his ribs was inclined to encroach and intrude, and another one howling and looking forlorn just because someone trod on his favorite corn. Over all the hoarse voice of the bay-lifted wheeze, Order, order in the court, gentlemen, if you please. Six feet two, if an inch, and proportioned in size, stood the thief in the dock when the clerk bid him rise. And amongst all that crowd not a man could be found, with his shoulders so square and a physique so sound. First around on the lawyers and officers there, he defiantly gazed with a bold, brazen air and then, turning around, stared the judge in the face as though he was the thief and the rogue in the case. The stern judge ran his eyes the unmoved villain o'er, from the crown of his head to his feet on the floor, while the rogue seemed to study with critical care the time-honored court with his thin crop of hair. For five minutes or more, it's my candid belief, that the thief eyed the judge, and the judge eyed the thief, as two rivals long parted in some foreign land, by mischance blown together, each other they scanned. While there rose from the concourse no perceptible sound, not a whisper or yawn, even circled around. But a charnel house calm o'er the room seemed to fall, till the flies could be heard on the plastering crawl till beneath the rogue's stare the court's visage grew red. But down choking his rising resentment, he said, Richard Rowe, he spoke quite emphatic and slow, as though weighing each word before letting it go, and inclined his head downward as men often do when they look over spectacles rather than through. Richard Rowe, you have come to the surface once more, like the ghost to the feast of the monarch of yore. I have lectured, imprisoned, and fined you in vain. You will still depredate and confront me again. From the door of the jail to the till of a store, there is simply one pace unto you and no more. As the dog to his vomit, the sow to her mire, you will glide the born slave of your fiendish desire. By my oath, it's a sin, a disgrace, and a shame, with your shoulders so broad and so robust your frame. 
with your arms like a Hercules, muscled and strong, with your wind like a staghound so perfect and long, to earn a support you're possessed of all means, and yet you've been stealing a box of sardines. I have worked my way onward year out and year in, among characters blackened and blistered with sin. Amongst men I'd have quaked to have met in the lane, as I would the archdemon relieved of his chain. But I am frank to confess, and I'd state it as free, on a Bible as large as a bed, if need be. In my thirty years practice on bench or at bar, a thief more consummate and bold than you are. I have never encountered in county or town, among whites copper-colored or greasers done brown. You're as prone to purloin as an eagle to fly, or a salmon to swim, or a lover to sigh. Not an esculent known or utensil of use, from a cantaloupe down to the quill of a goose, from a tripe in the stall to a fowl in the coop, but at some time or other in your life you did scoop. And as if in assent, Richard Rowe bowed his head, while the judge wiped his face and continuing said, Here so often of late you have taken the stand to give answer to larcenies petty or grand, that your face has become as familiar to all the practitioners here as the clock on the wall. Here he pointed it out and a glance at it through, and bold Richard turned round and regarded it too. While full back to his ears a grim smile slowly broke, for despite his position he relished the joke. I regret that our law draws the limiting line, for it seems but a farce to impose a small fine or to send you below for a week or ten days, to decline on a mat and hatch future forays. But since neither the gloom of the prison nor fine seems to work a reform in that bosom of thine, I will try a new method, throw justice one side, and appeal to your manhood, your honor, and pride. It is said kindness conquers where knuckles will fail, and a pardon may faster reform than the jail. Since the stock-raiser advocates crossing the breed, and the farmer finds profit by changing the seed, who can tell but a change may regenerate you? So we offer you mercy where none is your due. Mr. Sheriff, release that purloiner as free as the wind that awakes the dull ocean is he. But, sir, hark, Richard Rowe, ere you mix with the throng, take this friendly advice from one knowing you long. And in future, whenever your stomach does feel like digesting a fish, take a rod and a reel, a few hooks, a fine line, and of gentles a few, and go catch your own fry, as all good people do. For you'll find it more wholesome to follow a creek, and there angle for trout seven days of the week than to strive to obtain by unwarranted means e'en a box of diminutive oily sardines. Subdued was bold Richard, he gazed in surprise, and trembled while tears welled fast from his eyes, as he vowed that henceforth the right course he'd pursue, and Roe is now honest, trustworthy, and true. End of section 30 Read by Carrie Adams, your book boys, at Mesa, Arizona, on the 8th of December, 2021. Section number 31 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose and Picture, by Palmer Cox. A startling cat astrophe. Methought I heard a voice cry, Sleep no more, Shakespeare. Last night, soon after retiring, I was made aware of the exceedingly annoying fact that a pair of cats had selected the yard under my window for their trysting place, and were behaving in a most demonstrative manner. I have no objection to cats having their courtships as well as men, but I see no reason in their having such a hoodooing time over it making night hideous with rascally yowls. There is, perhaps, 
nothing more aggravating in life than to have a little saucy spitfire of a puss keep a whole community awake for hours together, because an admirer of hers happens to take a moonlight stroll on a neighboring fence. The night wore on. Their inharmonious chants increased in volume and spirits. Considering the matter, I came to the conclusion that I would rather pay the fine imposed for shooting in the city limits than lose so many hours from needed rest. I hastened to procure my shotgun, determined to make a scattering amongst them, if nothing more. As I reached the casement, a bright flash from the window of an adjoining house, and a simultaneous patter of shot in the yard, informed me that some co-sufferer had taken the initiative in the good work of demolition, for though wrought to the highest pitch of ferocity, his nerves were steady and his aim was sure. He evidently hit them where their nine lives were centered, and they dropped as they stood when the fatal tube was leveled. In short, they died as erring cats should die, without a kick, without a cry, the faintest rustle in the chips, a slight contraction of the lips which brought the pointed teeth in sight, and they had passed to endless night. Even as I write, ten o'clock a.m., they are lying in the yard as they fell, a terrible illustration of sudden transition from noisy debate to silent repose. There they lie, to compare small things with great, like a pair of shipwrecked lovers who have clung to each other through fire and water, and at last have reached the wreck-strewed beach in body, but not in spirit. The gentleman who owns the yard has just been out looking at them, after silently surveying the dead for a long time in silence, he walked away without disturbing them, pathetically murmuring the Latin motto, Requies cat in pace. End of section 31. Section 32 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Paul Cox. A Trip to the Mountains I have been taken a flying trip over the Sierras, about which the poet so mellifluously sings. There were many beautiful scenes presented during that trip, but abler pens than mine have described them fully and have done them justice so I will not attempt to set forth their various charms. It is not my forte anyway, and I am free to confess the fact. Enough for me to describe the excellent lunch which I had the good fortune to have along with me. And to speak plainly, I enjoyed it the most of anything I saw during my trip. It was no ordinary lunch, however. The backbone of it was a nicely roasted chicken, which reflected great credit upon both the poulterer and the kind-hearted young lady who volunteered to see it through the oven. Ah, that brisk little lady can prepare a dish fit to set before the gods. If that is not doing her justice, tell me what more can be said, and I will pile it higher. She is worthy of it. The virtues of that fowl live in my memory yet. It was good. If you could meet an old lady that was a passenger in that car, not one with the bunion on her left foot and the crockery teeth, who mistook me for a minister, but the mild old lady with glasses that sat opposite me, she would tell you the same. She knows. Bless her gentle heart. If she does it, I would like to know who does. She partook of the fowl. I saw her looking wistfully upon it as I dismembered it, and though I say it myself, I am not greedy by any means, so I offered her the juicy neck. Did she take it? Ask, rather, if a cat that had fasted a week would take a mouse if she got between him and his hole. As old Shylock said, are you answered? She was no novice at picking the neck of the fowl either. She manipulated it in a manner that proved to me clearly she had perfect knowledge of its construction. It was not long, perhaps ten seconds, before she had picked it as bare as a corkscrew. She did it with such ease, too, and that's what got me. She kept it revolving as rapidly as a squirrel does the cylinder in its cage. She had but one front tooth left in her upper jaw. The intelligent mind will no doubt immediately picture forth a long tooth, and the intelligent mind, in so doing, portrays the incisor correctly. It was indeed a long tooth, but it was just the thing she needed for the business before her. It seemed to be specially made for it, as it fitted into every depression or notch in the neck as nicely as a key into a lock. It ran around between the vertebrae like a turner's chisel, throwing the small particles of nutrient far back again 
against the roof of her mouth. It did me good to see her play around the fowl's neck. I grew young again while beholding the busy scene and actually regretted that a chicken did not have two necks as well as two legs, that I might repeat the generous donation and see the pleasing scene enacted again. As it was, I won golden opinions from the old lady. A stout German woman who sat nearby also seemed to be looking upon the chicken as though she would like to help me make way with it. With that magnanimity, which was ever my peculiar characteristic, I severed the Pope's noose from the trunk and proffered her the delicious morsel, when, to my utter astonishment and confusion, she whipped out of her pocket a big bologna sausage the size of a stuffed club and shook it triumphantly in my face, so close that it might have greased the end of my nose. She actually scouted the idea, independent, proud, and self-sustaining, these Germans, and no mistake, she evidently felt insulted and delivered herself of a long essay in the German tongue. She was undoubtedly given me to understand that she was able to furnish grist from her own meal. Of course, that is what she meant. I could tell that by the way she flourished the bologna and pointed to her mouth and stomach. I expected she was about to whack me over the jaw with a singular-looking weapon and pair to dodge on the shortest possible notice, but she didn't. As if to madden me, she commenced eating the sausage in a hasty, excited manner, taking about two inches at a bite. What could I do? What did I do? Why, let her eat it, of course. It was none of my business. I had no objection, so long as she didn't choke and render it necessary for me to pat her on the back, which I certainly thought I would have to do before she finished her meal. You may be sure I offered no more chicken to any person after that, but picked the bones as bare as penholders. If she liked bologna better than a choice piece of fowl, it was her fault, not mine. I washed my hands of the whole affair. I stopped a few hours at a mill in the mountains and while there witnessed an amusing incident. There was a small pipe leading from the engine and projecting through the side of the building close to the ground. Through this pipe, the wastewater was conveyed from the engine and at the end end of it quite a puddle or drain had been formed about a foot in width and eight or ten feet in length the constant dripping from the pipe kept the water warm and from it a steam was continually rising there were several indian camps in the vicinity of the mill and as wood was rather scarce the squaws belonging to the camps were in the habit of congregating around this warm drain when the cold weather numbed their poorly protected limbs. It was not an unusual thing to see half a dozen coming down the hill to squat beside the drain and there sit for hours discussing the current topics of the day, enjoying at the same time the luxury of a cheap steam bath. There were a couple sitting at the drain in this innocent manner while I was at the mill. I called the engineer's attention to the capital opportunity that lay before him to give them a surprise that would be fun to behold. This he could do by simply turning a gauge cock and allowing the steam to go out with a rush upon the squatting pair. The engineer was a sober sort of man, not at all given to humor and not inclined to take advantage of the opportunity but when i informed him that i represented an illustrated paper and wanted to make a stirring sketch of the scene he consented for my benefit as he went to comply with my suggestion i moved to the window to see how the squalls would enjoy it i had hardly reached my position when the steam shot along the surface of the water like smoke from the muzzle of a rifle at the same instant the gentle savages shot at least four feet into the air in the most extravagant positions imaginable until that moment i would not have believed the human form could assume such strange attitudes on such short notice if i had not been intently gazing upon the pair as they sat chatting sociably over the drain and had my eyes riveted upon them as they shot aloft i could hardly have thought the two dark figures performing such grotesque evolutions in mid-air were indeed human beings the sting was harmless as it had to go quite a distance before escaping but the squalls didn't understand anything about that you know no person had enlightened their untutored minds upon that point and they didn't sit there very long in order to ascertain for the sake of the squalls however let us hope that it was one thing they evidently did 
feel certain about. And that was that something had broken loose and that, too, at a very inopportune moment. The thought that followed close upon the heels of the other was to change their position in the shortest possible time. If they both had been shot into the air out of one mortar, they could hardly have shown greater concert of action. If there was any difference in their sensitiveness or agility, the one farthest from the pipe seemed to claim the superiority, for as near as I could judge, she was first to spring aloft. The back of one was towards me and the face of the other. Though quite a distance from them, I could distinguish the white eyes of the latter standing out as prominently as a pair of silver-headed nails in the end of a mahogany coffin. It may be argued that this was a mean trick. It may even be said that it was a sinful act. I admit all this. Nay, more. It may be that I will have to answer for it hereafter when you and they and all of us have ceased to be interested in things pertaining to the flesh. But in the face of this supposition, I must still adhere to the original assertion that it was indeed an amusing incident, and will go further and say that as yet I have not been brought down to that perfect state of repentance where I could sincerely say that I regretted having been the instigator of the deed. I have never learned whether the squaws returned to the drain again, but judging from the way they hustled over the hill in the direction of their camp, I am inclined to think not. While coming down the river, there was quite an excitement on board on account of the steamer grounding suddenly upon the hog's back. She was running pretty fast at the time, and the sudden stop threw several passengers off their feet, and for a few moments all was confusion. I was partly disrobed at the time, and the first thought that entered my mind was that we had collided with some schooner on its way up the river. Before leaving, a gentleman placed a lady and two small children in my charge, and my first act was to run to the stateroom in which they were. I found the lady preparing for rest, and the children were already in bed. Without much ceremony, I seized a child in each hand, and bidding the lady to follow, started to deposit them near the Davids, that they might be handy to throw into the boats in case we were compelled to take them. While hastening through the cabin, I was confused by a terrified woman in her nightclothes who jumped out of her stateroom as I was passing the door. In her hand, she grasped the nozzle of a large life preserver, which she had buckled around her and which only needed to be inflated with wind to make her comparatively safe. No sooner did she see me than she commenced dancing frantically around me in the most insane manner, at the same time shouting with all the strength of her voice, Blow me up! Blow me up! For the love of heaven, mister, blow me up! But I had had enough to do at that moment without stopping to blow her up. Besides, I didn't know, but I might have to swim to the shore and would consequently need what little wind I could muster to bear me through the task. Before proceeding far, however, I met the mate who told me to put the children back in bed and go soak my head or do anything that would keep me from making an unmitigated fool of myself, with which kindly suggestion I meekly complied. End of section 32. Read by Julie Taylor. December 8th. 2021
and learning that the only friend of the sick man was about to leave the city, he hunted him up and solicited the job of performing the last sad rite's first friend when death should have gathered him in. The request was unthinkingly granted, and sufficient money to cover the expenses of burial was placed in the hands of a third party who was to pay it to the undertaker when the obsequies were performed. The man of coffins departed smiling over his success. The only thing that remained now between him and a fat prophet was the man's life. But this was only a slim barrier and was likely to fall at every breath of air. He paid semi-daily visits to the hospital to learn how the disease was developing. Each morning as he arose and looked out upon the cold fog hanging over the city, he rubbed his hands with delight and chuckled as he thought how impossible it would be for the sick man to live through such a disagreeable day. It's not in the nature of the disease to allow it, he argued. If he is not gone already, he will be as stiff as a piston rod before ten o'clock, or I am no judge of cause and effect. But somehow, the last stone of life was indeed a tough one, and held out wonderfully. One, two, and three days dragged by, and still the invalid's cough waked the echoes of the corridors and halls of the hospital. This annoyed the anxious undertaker terribly. What if he should recover and cheat me out of the money, after all? What if he should recover and cheat me out of the money, after all? Thought he, as he sat in the gloomy office and gazed about upon the coffin standing on their ends around the room. His small gray eyes lingered longer upon the cheap burial case in the corner, which he thought would about fit the man in the hospital. There's no use of this delay, he muttered to himself. There must be some outside influence brought to bear upon him, and that immediately, or the fellow may linger along through the whole winter, and keep the money lying idle that is now almost within my reach. Taking a tape measure in his pocket, he repaired at once to the hospital and gained admittance to the sick man's room. The poor fellow was lying, apparently in the last stages of that deceptive disease consumption. But instead of thinking he was so far gone that his obsequies had actually commenced, he was promising himself long, happy years of life and usefulness. The unfeeling scoundrel approached the bed and deliberately proceeded to measure the poor fellow for his last outfit. In the meantime, keeping up a sort of rattling conversation like the following, Hello, old boy. So you're going to peg out, eh? Well, it's a road that sooner or later we've all got to travel. So there's no use of a feller making any bones over it. Rather young, though, to have to stiffen out without even having the pleasure of being married. There won't be no such enjoyment where you're going, the scripture tells us. There, that's a good fellow. Stretch out full lips so that I can get a correct measure. If there is anything I do dislike it is to see a corpse stuck into a coffin that's too short by a few inches. I would rather pinch a fellow a little in width than in length because it doesn't cripple a corpse up so bad. There, that's it, to a dot. Five feet, nine and a quarter with half an inch allowed for the stretching out of the joints just as you're going off. You know a fellow elongates a little about that time, so I always make some allowance when I measure a live man for his coffin. Now for the depth, my hearty. Jerusalem! A general caving in all along the line, eh? Why, you're as flat as a griddle cake. Ah, that consumption is the thing that plays hob with a fellow. It is, my boy. There's no use denying it. It scoops a person out mighty quick, I can tell you. Four and three quarters, four and a half pinch measurement. Why, blow me, if it doesn't seem like a waste of material to give you a standard depth. If it wasn't for your long feet, I would be inclined to shallow a little on you, old boy. Let me think now. Why, what a numbskull I am to be sure. I can twist your feet crosswise a little and make a go of it like a charm. But hold on. No, I can't do it, after all, for there's your nose sticking up at the other end. And it wouldn't hardly be doing the fair thing by you to twist your head around your ear for the sake of saving a few inches of material. No, sirree. I wouldn't do that sort of thing 
to the deadest corpse I ever should be rid of. I'll do the fair thing by me. Be he dead or living, though it should keep me poor. I can give you the juvenile handles, though, for you don't weigh any more than a Cape Ann codfish. You're going off the reel at a favorable time, too, for I've been wishing for a chance to give my light team an airing for some time. Old Skidamadink over on Market Street, I hear, is going to take out a stiff one tomorrow afternoon also, and no doubt he will be trying to forge ahead of me the way he did yesterday when I had the spothen to graze along. But he'll find out that he has got to limber up a little differently when Ma and Kate are stuck in his flank. He wouldn't have shook me off yesterday if I hadn't that soggy old sea captain aboard. He seemed to grow heavier the longer I kept him. If there is one thing I dislike more than another, it's a pussy corpse. It is bad enough to have a fat person about you while living, but when they come to peter out, it's worse. You can't chuck them under the ground too quick. I had the old emblem of mortality packed away in an ice chest for three weeks, waiting for his wife to come down from the mountains to attend the funeral. But she finally sent down word that she got married again, and if she knew the duties of a wife, and she thought she did, her place was alongside of a living husband rather than traipsing after a dead one. Oh, these women are terrible slippery sweetmeats the world over. How fast they get over anything, crying one minute, singing the next. Well, well, I often wonder whether they have the genuine feeling that we all men have. Well, business is business. There, now let me fold your arms across until I get the whiff. So we go, so we get steady. There you are, that's it. That's the posish. Natural and easy as death itself. Whew, there it is again. Never knew it to fail, follows as naturally as the fruit does the blossom, broad across the shoulders, sure sign of consumption. Show me a person broader at the shoulders than at the hips, and I will show you an individual that is not long for this world. Never knew a person of that build that didn't die of consumption. Never, sir, bound to a cave, no getting around or climbing over it. Might as well be knocked in the head at birth, for they are sure to go some time. Well, time is crowded, and I must be off as I've got to rustle around in order to have things ready for you. I'll expect to find you over your troubles in the morning, so I'll say goodbye now, while you can appreciate it. Thus did the hidden human scoundrel rattle along while his poor victim lay paralyzed with fear. Hope at every word uttered by the monster deserting his breast, and despair usurping the vacant seat. Gaping mouth and wide-opened eyes, he watched each movement of the undertaker. His face seemed to be all eyes as he stared at the bustling traitor in death. The hope of the visitor was that a speedy death would follow this disconsolate harangue, but happy to relate, patience sometimes recovers after doctors have devoted them to the yew tree shade, and strange as it may seem, the patient in question suddenly improved, as though frightened by the undertaker into health instead of into his coffin. The next day, he sat up in bed. On the second, he sat by the window. The third day, he took an airing on the veranda and passed the time of day with the undertaker, who happened to be going by. In ten days, he took his carpet bag in his hand and bade goodbye to both doctors and undertaker and started to join his friend in the country. End of section 33, read by Julie Taylor, December 9th, 2021. Section 34 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose and Picture by Palmer Cox. Sermon on a Pen. Give me that simple shining pen, so worthless in your hand. Here on my desk a place to win, and as a lesson stand. Think you no moral may be found in such a common thing, That fancy will not hover round and apt illusions bring? The poet, with observing eyes, saw sermons in a stone. So in this pen a sermon lies, a philosophic tone. 
We see it first, where placed in rows, the pins lie side by side. So children wrapped in sweet repose in peaceful homes reside. Soon from the rest it travels west or east by land or sea. So loving households part in quest of pleasure, fame or fee. Observe it well with sober mind. The head you see is flat. Thus many heads in your life you'll find beneath a stylish hat. When you, how perfect, straight and neat, how finished and how sound. So stands the upright man complete with virtues circled round. It has a point and mission too, tis seldom made in vain. So men should have a point in view if they would glory gain. If wrongly placed, twill mar your thought when one would fain be still. So man, if badly bred or taught, will treat his neighbor ill. Its life a constant service tends to keep its clean and bright. Thus men are kept, my loving friends, by application right. Tis polished like a sword or spear, and in the light will shine. Thus men of learning do appear, where wit and sense combine. It moves round from coat to dress, as trouble one befalls. Thus men should hearken to distress, and go where duty calls. It oft assists to hide one's shame, till needles can repair. Thus should it be the Christian's aim to cover faults with care. If once tis sprung, twill bend each day, and is no longer true. So thus in life one step astray will often lead to two. Then bent and blunt and black at last, who stoops to lift the pen? So thus the crowds do hurry past the crooked slave of sin. End of section 34「Section 35 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. Section 35. Dudley's Fight with the Texan. The poor cur kicked and scalded during the day. At night can lie and click his sores in peace. The scudding hare that can hold out ahead of the baying beagles, until black he Kate waves her wand between the hunters and the hunted, may hope to shake them off. The aeronaut, tiring of the clamor here below, can rise above the busy haunts of men and hold sweet communion with the gods in quiet. But I, alas, find no escape from the inexorable plague, Jim Dudley. He comes upon me like a thief in the night and mars my rest. Within the holy sanctuary even, he whispers in mine ear. Through the busy marts and thoroughfares he haunts me still, and tells of fights and hairbreadth escapes, with all the glibness of an old battle-scarred veteran who has primed his firelock in three campaigns. He talks of drawing deadly weapons as a dentist would of drawing teeth. In all likelihood, the fellow never drew a weapon in his life, except, perhaps, at a raffle. I had long noticed a scar on Jim's forehead, but never ventured to ask him how he got it, fearing a story would follow. Last night he detected me looking inquiringly, and without any query on my part, the following infliction fell upon me. You see that scar that looks something like a wrinkle over my left eyebrow, don't you? Well, you can't guess how I came by that. Cow kicked me? No, not by a long chalk nor a hoss nother. I got that scar of the summer I was gwine through Texas. I'll never forget how I got another in a hurry, for I never did have such a narrow dodge since the night Dad's old house burned down, and I got out through the cellar drain. I was traveling towards the border of Texas, went away back in Waco, and order I got as far as cars would take me, I set out on a hossback. One evening, just as I was getting into a small village, my hoss got one of his legs into a hole in the road, and falling over, broke it snap off below the knee. I felt mighty bad over it, because I didn't have any too much money about me, but I had to leave him thar and go into the village on foot, carrying the saddle along, for I calculated to get another animal the next day and continue my journey. 
I put up for the night at a small hotel, and there was quite a number of fellers a settin' around the bar room talkin'. But amongst them was one big, ugly lookin' villain, with a glass eye that was continually droppin' out and rollin' across the floor like a marble. Pupil up and pupil down. It would move along under chairs and tables. Most comical lookin' thing you ever sought eyes on. He would walk after the truant, glarin' round with the other eye as though watchin' to see if anybody was laughin' at him. And he would pick it up, chuck it back into his head again as if it was a pipe that had dropped out of his mouth. He seemed to be a bully amongst them, for when any of the other fellows went to pass, they circled around him, something like a woman round the hoss standing on the sidewalk. I judged by that that they were scared of him and didn't want to get anywhere near his corns lest they might accidentally touch him. I sat there watching of him for some time, and at last, while he was leaning on the counter, beating time with his fingers on top of it, a feller came in and called for something to drink. The bartender gin him the bottle, and he poured out a drink and left the glass sitting on the counter while he turned around to drop his quid of tobacco. As he was doing it, the big bully-looking customer hissed at the glass, drained it right thar, and smacked and licked his lips, arter it as though wishing there was more of it. Something like a young widder, arter you give her a kiss. The fellow that ordered the drink turned back, wiping his mouth, getting ready to swallow. When you see the empty glass, you rise up short of indignantly, and was a gwine to say or do something. But when he saw who it was, he changed his mind pooty sudden, tightling down about six inches, turned around, and just slid away easy-like out of the room. As he was going out, I could see his ears looking as though they were freezing, for they were getting whiter and whiter as he moved along down the steps. As I was thinking about it, a ministerial-looking man came edging up to me and says, You're a stranger in this quarter, I believe, and let me give you a little advice. It may prove valuable to you before you get away from yar. Why, what's the matter? I asked, wondering what he was coming at. Have you got the smallpox in the house? I continued. Smallpox, he answered. Was nor that, stranger, for the love of peace, he continued. Keep clear of that feller at the counter. Let him have his way. You might as well undertake to cross a crater as him in any of his bully and tantrums. Now mind I'm telling you, if his eye falls out, don't laugh at it. Don't betray your emotions. If he steps on your corns, take it as if old Jupiter himself had reached down his foot and trod on ye, and you'll come out of it better than if you did object a mighty sight. Who is he? I inquired. Why, that's Bill Cranebow. Glass-eyed Bill, they call him. He had more fights over that glass eye of his than ever a dog had over a sheep shank. Everybody's afeard of him. They hate him. Was than the lawyer does a peacemaker. No one who knows him wants to undertake the job of getting away with him. They'd rather let it out to strangers. Always oh, lighten at a fight, for all he looks so clumsy. But the butcher is with the cleaver. That glass-eyed Bill is with the bowie knife. He knows just where to strike to open a jint or get betwixt two ribs. You'd think to see him at it. He had practiced for twenty years with some old doctor, by the way he can disarrange the house we live in, as the poet says. Wow, that's sort of curious, I says. Ain't there no person around this section that has had any experience of the cutting business? He's only human, I reckon. If he gets a poke between wind and water, he's as likely to wilt as anybody else, isn't he? I says, jokingly, just that way. Thunder and mud, exclaimed the ministerial-looking man. You've been used to fighting with women, I reckon. Lose his strength? You might as well try to kill the strength of a red pepper cutting it up as that feller. Why, I've seen that glass-eyed Bill in some of his fights, he are. When he was so cut and slashed apart, that you could see his innards working like a watch, and I'll be called a downy's noodle if he didn't stand up to his work like a barber until he got through with his man. He likes to fight in a dark room best, though, cause there's no chance in getting on the blind side of him thar. And the landlord, not long ago, fixed up one on purpose to accommodate him. He had so much fighting to do. He'll work a quarrel out of the least thing, Laughing at his eye rolling off is a certain way of getting into trouble. 
is running against a wasp's nest. Though he smokes like a coal pit himself, I knowed him to pick a quarrel with a young Georgian and kill him, because he happened to send a whiff of smoke in the direction where he was setting. Ever since that, whenever he comes into the room, you'll see the fellers a-pluckin' and a-snappin' their pipes out of their mouths, and crammin' em into their pockets or under their coat-tails, anywhere to get em out of sight, like boys who are just learnin' the habit when they sight their dad a-comin' along. Take my advice and keep away from him, for he's dead certain to pick a muss with strangers, as they generally resent his insults. Plague on him, he continued. I wish he'd go away from the door. I want to get out, but it's not good policy to go a scrounging past him while he's looking so fired up glum. With that, the old man went quietly over to a chair in the corner and sat down. Something the same as a monkey does when a larger one is dropped into the cage. I went to bed pretty early that night, and I was plaguey tired. In the morning I learned there had been a fight in the dark room between Glass-Eyed Bill and a Tuscaloosan. Bill, as usual, had killed his man. I began to wonder whether I'd get into some scrape or another before I'd leave, and as there was to be an auction sale of horses and mules that morning right there at the hotel, I concluded to make a purchase and get away as soon as possible. I bid two or three times on horses, but they'd run em up too high. At last they fetched out a big mule, and thinking that would be just the thing, I went for em pooty strong, and succeeded in getting em. Glass-eyed Bill had been settin' on the doorstep thar, and didn't seem to be taking any part in the biddin'. But when I went to lead the mule off, he hollered, Where are ya goin' with that critter? Leave him standin' thar, please. I can attend to him myself, I reckon. Wow says I, just slow and easy that way, for I wanted to keep down my rising temper, knowing what I was when I got mad. If I'm any judge of auctioneering, the mule is mine, and I calculate to lead him away when and where I please. Just then the same old ministerial-looking man come chucking and pulling at my coat, says he. I'm taking ruinous risks in speaking to you now, he says. But I tell you again, don't cross him. Let him have the mule, or you'll expire quicker than a spark when it drops into a boiling pot. He doesn't want the mule no more than a husband wants two mothers-in-law, but he's just pining to get ye into a muss, and he doesn't see any way of doing it without he disputes the mule with ye. Let him have it, or it'll be worse for ye. Now mind what I'm telling ye. No, I'll be shot if I will, I answered. He ain't going to wipe his hoofs on me until... Arter I'm dead, anyhow. And with that, I began to move away from the critter. And glass-eyed Bill jumped up from where he was settin', and shouted pooty snappishly like, Hold on, thar. Drop that rope, unless you want to collapse so quick that one half of ye will be in eternity before the other half knows there's anything amiss. On what grounds do you claim the critter? I asked, just a billin' inside, because keeping short of cool outwardly. Words don't amount to a woman's sneeze in settling a matter of this kind, answered old Glass-Eye. What does, then? I inquired, quite innocent-like, as though I didn't know what he meant, though I did know sure enough what he was driving at. This does, he answered, rising up and putting his hand behind him, as I do now, and jerking out a ripping great knife about as big as the culture of a plow. That's the sort of thing to settle disputes with. No gentleman will argue a case. Well, he's got an arbiter like that to leave it to, he continued, a slapping it down flat ways into the palm of his hand as he spoke, and bringing an echo from an old barn that stood near. I see the bystanders begin to turn pale as whitewashed chimneys, and commence looking at the ground as though hunting for straws or splinters to pick their teeth with, but they only wanted some excuse to get away. Suppose I should pull out a knife about seventeen inches and a half long, I says, just that way. What then? It's just exactly the thing I want to see, he answered quickly. A young mother was never more tickled when she discovered the hoose tooth that peeping out of her young'un's gums than I am when I see a knife coming out of its sheath in a feller's hand. Wow, I reckon you must have been brought up in a fightin' settlement, I says, just like that for I couldn't hardly keep from joking. He seemed so amazed and eager. Come, 
Which shall you do? Gin up for the mule or fight? You gotta do one or harder, he says, impatiently, as he stooped to pick up his glass eye, which just then dropped out and was a rollin' under the hoss trough. Well, I says, I ain't particularly struck harder fightin', but it's bad enough for a feller to squirt his tobacco juice on to you without wanting to rub it in, and if it'll be any accommodation to you, I'll fight first and then take the mule afterwards. Enough said, he answered, just short that way, and then turning to the landlord who was standing in the door, he asked, Is the dark room ready for use? No, not quite, he answered. There are some pieces of that long Tuscaloosa lying around in there yet, I believe, but I'll attend to removing them right away, and he started off with a bucket and dustpan. So we all went into that bar room and stayed around there waiting until the place would be prepared. While we were there, Glass Eye Bill pulled out his knife and commenced to draw it backwards and forwards over his bootleg, as though to get it a fine edge on it. Well, you can wet your greatest scythe blade, I says to myself, kind of low that way, for I allowed he was doing it to skeer me. It ain't always the longest horned cow that does the most hooking. My old tobacco shaver has got point enough on it to inaugurate a new passage of the interior, if it won't cut a har. After a while, he leaned over to a feller that sat by the table, and while running his thumb sort of feelingly along the edge of the knife, he says, The man I bought this from in Galveston assured me it was the best of steel, but he lied, I reckon, for I turned the edge of it last night on that long Tuscaloosa's ribs. Yet that's not much to be wondered at, Arter, after all, for I do believe you had as many ribs as a snake. I thought I never would succeed in getting the blade betwixt em. Arter I got him down the corner and his knife away from him, I commenced jabbing in his armpit, and I prospected the whole way down to his kidney, before I could get it far enough to let his dinner loose. Gee, Wilkins, when I heard him talking like that, didn't I begin to squirm and fidget around on my chair? I wish that I had never seen the place, more especially the long-eared mule. But I see I was in for it, as the boy said, when he got his head stuck in the cream jar. There was no way of getting out without coming right down to begging off. And I was too consuming proud to do that, you know, if I was certain of being cut up in as many pieces as a board and house pie. Just then the landlord came back and said the room was ready, but remarked that it was a little slippery yet said, for a lean man you never did see a fellow that had so much blood in him as that Tuscaloosa had. Beckoning me to the counter, he says, you might as well settle your bill now before you go in there. It may be more satisfactory to you to have the settling of your own affairs, and it'll save me the trouble of hunting over your effects after you're dead. All right, I says, now if you say so. It's generally admitted that sure things sometimes get mighty slippery all to once. And perhaps somebody goggles may prove blue in the morning that were bought for green uns at night. I didn't want to let any of them think I was scared, though by jingo, I felt certain of being minced up, and the cold chills were just streaking all over me. So we started for the room, which was about twelve feet square and dark as pitch. The landlord held the door open till we were in opposite corners with our knives out. Then he shut and locked it, and left us to work out our own salvation as the missionary did the South Sea Islanders, when he overheard him talking about the best way of cooking them the next morning. Wasn't it dark in there, though? And still, you could have heard a lizard a-breathing in there, it was so quiet. I allowed Glass High Bill was expecting that I would go a-shuffling and a-hunting around for him, but I had no such foolish notion. Calculated if there was any finding to be done, he'd have to do it, for I was determined to stand right there till I dropped in my tracks before I go a-searchin' for him. I commenced breathing about twice a minute, and not making any more noise at it than a wall-bug, another. But for all that I heard him a-movin' over towards me. I'll always think that Cranebow had a nose on him like a setter dog for he somehow or another got right over thar where I was standin'. Pooty soon I was feelin' a stingin' along my forehead thar. I suspected at once that it was the knife that was feelin' around for me, so I reckoned that it wouldn't be long until he was Pride of it somewhere else, and like the boy with the candy bag. I calculated the first poke was everything, so I made one sudden, a determined plunge and sort of upward rip at the same time, calculating to do all the damage I could 
right at once, while I was about it. He heard me start, and thought to squat down before I got the knife into him, I reckon. Though his intentions were good, he only spread the disaster, like the gal who had tried to put the fire out with the corn broom, for he was gwine down the knife was rising, and the result was truly astonishing. I'll be smashed if he didn't fly open from end to end like a ripe pea pod. It was done so fire quick that he didn't realize how bad he was hurt, I think. Says he, We'll try that over again, stranger. As he spoke, he started to get up, but fell away seemingly in two different directions. Not on this side, we won't, I says, as I went hunting round for the door. I was surprised as much as him at the way things had turned out, for when I stepped into that room, I looked on it as stepping into another world. When the door was found, I commenced knocking, and pretty soon the landlord came and opened it. He couldn't see me at first, but aloud it was the bully that was there, of course, and says he, You made pretty quick work of it this time. That fellow won't want to buy any more mules after this, I'll take it. No, says I, a stepping out. We'll claim a critter that doesn't belong to him nother. What? he cried, jumping back with a look upon his face that told me at once he was mighty displeased at the way things were developing. Is it you? Where's Glass Eye Bill? he continued, shading his eyes with his hand and peering into the darkness. He's lying around in there somewhere, I answered careless like, just that way. The head half of him's nigh the door here, paralyzed, I reckon, but the leg part is somewhere over in the corner thar, where you hear the kicking. You might as well be getting your bucket and dustpan ready, for you'll have quite a job getting all the pieces together, I'm thinking. I continued, just that indifferent way, and walking out towards the bar room as I spoke. You never did see a feller so set back in your life. He looked at me as though I had as many heads onto me as the beasts we read about in the scriptures. I always believed that he was in cahoot with old Glass Eye. It just kept him there to pick quarrels with strangers so they could have the picket over of their effects. After washing my hands and plastering up the cut on my forehead a little, I went out and saddled the mule, and the crowd all came out to see me going off. I reckon if I had stopped in the village I could have had things about my own way for some time. Before I rode off, I turned round to him and says, When you get so frightened of a bully again that you daren't sneeze within forty feet of him, just send for me, and I'll open him up ready for saltin' while you be wiping your mouth. With that, I rode off and left them staring at each other, and then arter me, as though wondering who or what I was, anyhow. End of section 35. Read by... Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 36 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Mary Palmer Frontier Humor In Verse, Prose, and Picture By Palmer Cox Roller Skating Oh, skating, roller skating now, Of pastimes takes the lead. No more we take the moonlight sail, Or mount the prancing steed. No more to fair or carnival, no more to masquerade, no more along the lengthy bridge, the thousands promenade, no more we see Othello rave and roll his jealous eyes, or Hamlet leaping in the grave where loved Ophelia lies, or see the boasting Falstaff sheath his blade in Percy's course, or hear the baffled Richard shout, My kingdom for a horse. In vain the minstrels shake the bones and tell the funny tale, their blazoned bill or blatant band to draw the public fail. For those who still their millions hide and those at ruin's brink alike throw business cares aside and hasten to the rink. Talk of your bounding horseback rides or of the grace indeed. A maiden shows when she bestrides the frail velocipede 
I charge ye, if you'd see a maid, when graceful she appears. Go see her on the roller skates, as round the rink she steers. End of section 36「Section 37 of Frontier Humor and Verse, Prose and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose and Picture by Paul Cox. A Terrible Nose. I was today brought in contact with an old gentleman named Bickerstaff, who keeps a crockery store in the village where I am visiting. This Bickerstaff is the unfortunate possessor of the queerest-looking nose I have yet encountered. It was not the original intention of Providence that he should follow such a proboscis through life, for there was a time when he, like other men, had a forerunner ornamental as well as useful. But though an accident, the nose he now bears, in all its deformity, was shoved upon him. It seems one day, while furiously pursuing a little urchin who had mischievously put a stone through a glass jar by the door, he ran his face against the end of a scantling a boy was carrying past on his shoulder and set his nose well upon his forehead in a triangular lump. Strange to say, no inducements that the surgeon could hold out served coax it back to its former position. His wife, who was young and rather prepossessing in appearance, worried terribly about it. She finally left him and went to live with her mother and immediately set about obtaining a divorce from him. She would, in all probability, have obtained it if she had not died before the case was properly laid before the commissioners, because she was capable of doing better, and when you come to see the nose with which she wished to sever her connections, you could hardly blame her. Old Bickerstaff, to tell the honest truth, did look like the very old Nick in masquerade costume. His nose, as it reposed between his eyebrows, displayed an enormous pair of nostrils large as front door keyholes. At a short distance, a person would think he had four eyes in his head. He was living terror of the school children who daily passed his place of business. They either scurried past on the run or with their hands over their eyes. Even among creeping infants who had often shrunk back from the threshold as old Bickerstaff passed the door, he was known as the Boo, and there was no danger of them crawling into the street while he remained in the vicinity. Nervelessly inclined women also avoided him. They would cut across the road when they saw him coming or turn back, feeling their pockets as though they had forgotten something and hurry back go around some other way. Dogs never barked at him. If they happened to be engaged in that pastime, when he hove in sight, they would slope off the demonstration into a yelp, and as if they had suddenly recollected that they were wanted at home about that time, they tucked their tails between their legs and dusted away at a lively rate. Hitched horses even snorted lustily and pulled hard upon their halters when old Bickerstaff shuffled by. The old gentleman had a pew in church directly in front of the pulpit, and the first time he attended divine worship after his nose had been set up, he threw the minister out of discourse altogether. He couldn't keep run of what he wanted to say, no way he could fix it. He had Jonah swallowing the whale instead of the whale doing the job for Jonah. No matter how much he endeavored to keep his eyes in some other direction, they would invariably wander back, to rest upon that terrible sight, and then he would be off the track again in a twinkling. The next day the trustees of the church waited on Bickerstaff and in the most polite manner possible requested him to exchange his pew for one farther removed from the pulpit. The old fellow, who, by the way, had considerable temper, flew off the handle at once and in the most unchristian-like language denounced the church and the doctrine that would draw the line of demarcation between their fair faces and plain. He informed the trustees if the parson didn't like the looks of his congregation, he could turn his pulpit around facing the other way. Yet, though he was rough in his speech and given to storming considerably when his pride was touched, 
He was not altogether lacking in those qualities which go far to make up your real man, and when the trustees offered to give him the side pew rent-free, his voice at once grew low, and in a becoming manner he accepted the situation. After that, things were not quite as bad. The minister occasionally got a quartering view of him, but the odd-looking disfigurement didn't strike him with full force. Still, I was informed the reverend gentleman's discourse was principally addressed to the hearers on the other side of the church thereafter. But, to his credit be it mentioned, he always turned in the direction of old Bickerstaff when he closed his eyes in prayer. End of section 37 Read by Julie Taylor, December 9, 2021section 38 of frontier humor in verse prose and picture this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org frontier home in verse prose and picture by palmer cox a mass battery i learned by an evening paper that an old lady in the lower part of the city today while burning some cast-off garments through an old vest belonging to her son-in-law into the fireplace a remington rifle cartridge happened to be slumbering in one of the pockets it awakened and therefrom hangs a piece of crank this draws me on to fasten upon paper an incident that happened in the mountains some years ago i was spending a few days in the mines at the time with a friend named collier who was working a claim back of sonora he had three partners in the concern one was an old fellow named twitchell who at some time in his life had been judged in a supreme court in one of the southwestern states i forget which at all events they called him judge and he bore the title with becoming dignity another was a dark-looking one-eyed swede who wore a large green patch over the empty socket this seemed to add a double brilliancy and fire to the other optic and gave to him rather a ferocious appearance he would have passed anywhere for a buccaneer of at least fifteen years cruisin yet he was quite a mild and peaceable man for all his demoniacal aspect the third was a vermonter named theodore arthur willoughby spooner called spoon for short they occupied a small log cabin near their claim and were like miners generally hopeful if not happy one evening theodore author willoughby spooner was rummaging over some old articles left in the cabin by a former occupant among them he found an odd-looking pistol which the rust of years had rendered worthless the weapon was an uncommon one i never saw anything like it before since and it is my daily prayer that i never may it was a ten-shooter with nine chambers for bullets and a tenth and larger barrel for throwing buckshot slugs walnuts small onions or potatoes in fact it was capable of receiving almost anything not exceeding a billiard ball in size such an awe-inspiring shooting iron would be invaluable to a footpad or road agent it was particularly suited for men of this stripe for the man who would not blanch settle down on his knees and surrender up his valuables when that battery was leveled at his head must be brave indeed after we had examined it for some time and vainly endeavored to raise the hammer the one-eyed swede took it in trying to revolve the chambers he dropped it unswervingly upon judge twitchell's favorite corn it weighed about as much as a good-sized anvil and no person who had experienced the peculiar sensation that shoots along the nerves from an injured corn could blame the judge for indulging in a little profanity about that time smarting under the contusion he grabbed the instrument and in an erring moment flung it into the fire not a man of that little assemblage but would have given his days pan out to have the pistol out of the flames again but neither wished to assume the responsibility of poking for it the confounded thing hadn't been fully canvassed and we didn't know whether or not it was loaded or which way it was aiming it might be pointing out at the door or up the chimney or it might be leveled at a fellow's very vitals 
There was a sort of creeping uncertainty about the whole thing that was calculated to inspire solemn and serious reflection and make us sit uneasily upon our stools. We were not long in doubt, however, for in ten seconds after the villainous look in me trails settled into the glowing embers, there was no foot of space, no nook or corner within the wooden walls of that humble dwelling that was a good place for a man to be who was not fully prepared to exchange worlds. File firing commenced on the right of the fireplace under cover of burning brands. There was a sharp report, a cloud of ashes, and a shower of coals, and amid the general din, the stem and bow of the Mirasham in the teeth of Theodore Arthur Willoughby Spooner dissolved partnership at once and forever. At the same instant, the old water pitcher jumped from the table, mortally wounded in the abdomen. During the next few moments, there was extraordinary ground and lofty tumbling inside the cabin. Not because I was possessed of greater fear or less courage than any of the party, but because I felt that I had more to live for. I was the first to reach the open air. The judge was following close at my heels, but in his blind haste, he tripped in the doorway and blocked the passage. It was at this critical moment that the leapfrog performance commenced. The antics of Cherini's circus troupe during their most brilliant achievements dwindled into mere schoolboy exercise when compared with gymnastic efforts of excited miners out came my friend collier over the prostrate form of the judge and the one-eyed swede over collier his hair erect and his one dilated eye standing in bold relief from his dark face like the ornamental stud on a horse's blinker last though not least interested or frightened came theodore author willoughby spooner sailing like a flying squirrel over the one-eyed swede in the meantime the pistol was jumping about in the fire like a fish in a scoop net showering bullets in every direction the clock hung silent upon the wall having received a charge of buckshot full in the face and the dog lay dead upon the hearthstone chickens come home to root saith the old proverb and indeed it would seem so for poor judge twitchell whose rashness brought about the whole calamity, received a parting salute, a farewell shot, just as he had gathered himself on all fours to make a final lunge from the fusillade within. Fortunately, the wound was not a fatal one, though severe enough to keep his memory green for weeks. Some time elapsed before any person would venture back into the cabin after the firing ceased. No one had kept count of the shots or knew at what moment the battery might open again we probably would have remained out all night rather than take any chances but the coals which had been thrown over the cabin started a brisk fire in half a dozen different places and we were obliged to run some risk to extinguish the flames and save the place end of section thirty eight read by julie taylor december ninth twenty twenty one Section 39 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. The prize I didn't win. Who hath contended for prize? Who hath stood in front of an armed host? with a noble emulation warming his breast who with one eye glancing along the barrel to the target in the distance and the other closed upon the world hath pressed carefully upon the decisive trigger and who hath seen the glittering bone of contention passing away into other hands than his at the close of the contest if such a person there be then can he sympathize with me in this my dark hour of despondency today i entered the list with eighty men to compete for a gold watch at a chain of two hundred and fifty dollars in value it was to be presented to the winner by the governor of the state at a grand ball in the evening i who prided myself that i was no woman with a gun made a very fair impression upon the target and fell back for six long dragging hours i watched the marksmen striving to beat my score one by one the good shots whom i had reason to fear stepped forward discharged their pieces 
and fell back cursing their ill luck at last nearly all had fired and i in fancy could hear the elegant timepiece ticking in my pocket and was already preparing the usual impromptu speech with which to thank the generous donor at this point an individual stepped forward whom i had not included among my dangerous competitors because on former occasions he failed to hit the broad side of a mountain yet to my astonishment he bore off the glittering prize i shall always think the devil rode astride of that individual's bullets and guided them into the target for while taking aim the muzzle of his gun was tossing around like the tip of a cow's horn when she's grazing in a clover field what a picture was i as i stood that evening at the ball watching his excellency presenting the magnificent watch i had for hours together looked upon his mind had i not received the premature congratulations of my friends and been lavish of change at the bar in consequence and the watch where was it i feel that i shall never have the face to look my musket in the muzzle again end of section thirty nine read by julie taylor december ninth twenty twenty one Section 40 of Frontier Humour in Verse, Prose and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Adrian Stevens. Frontier Humour in Verse, Prose and Picture by Palmer Cox. The Countryman's Tooth. Last evening... While sitting in a physician's office, I was amused by a countryman who entered the office to have a tooth extracted. The doctor took one of the old-fashioned cant-hooks and went for the molar, but whether it was owing to lack of skill or the patient's ducking while the instrument was being adjusted, it became fixed directly between two teeth, and after a painful struggle, out they both were drawn." The operator saw he had taken out two masticators instead of one, and before the patient noticed the fact, one was chucked under some papers lying upon the table by his side. "'Jerusalem!' cried the countryman, as soon as he could speak. "'I thought by the yanking and torturing pain you had hitched the blamed thingamajig onto my backbone and was a snake in it out. Why, bless my soul!' he continued, as he ran his tongue into the awful chasm. "'Hain't you make a mistake, doctor, and pulled out the jaw instead of the tooth? There appears to be a general caving in all around there.' "'Oh, no,' said the doctor. "'There is the tormentor, sir.' And he held up the one tooth before the contorted face of the victim in triumph. "'Your teeth pull out easy, sir, for their size.' he continued, as he wiped his instruments and put them away. "'They do, eh?' he exclaimed. "'Well, dear help em that have teeth that come out hard. "'Tain't all that pulling neither, but the incredulous hole they leave behind them when they do come. "'Why, my teeth seem as far apart as two Sundays to a labouring man. "'The other teeth will crowd over after a while.' said the doctor encouragingly. It may be I'll get sort of used to it after a while, he replied, but I'll be blowed to the moon if it doesn't feel as though my tongue was wobbling around in some other person's mouth about this time. And he arose from the inquisitorial chair, paid the damages, and left the office. End of section 40 Section 41 of Frontier Humour in Verse, Prose and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Adrian Stevens. Frontier Humour in Verse, Prose and Picture by Palmer Cox. Mining Stocks. The city today has been in a state of feverish excitement 
over dispatches received from the mining regions that telegrams were fraught with startling intelligence. There has been a rich strike in the savage mine, and the stock is going up accordingly. When stocks are running high, how natural to sigh! Ah, that I a thousand shares did command, that I might drink champagne, and hold a double rein, and be counted a power in the land. The streets are crowded with men, women, and children. It is certainly, as an old woman remarked at my elbow, easier for a needle to go through a camel's eye than for a person to pass through the throng at some of the corners. At present, the person who does not own savage stock is not considered of much account. I, who am always on the alert for new developments and act upon the moment, make haste to give a sketch of the savage stock going up. It is ascending at a lively rate. There is no mistake about that. There is always two sides to a hill, however, and though the lucky stockholder today may reach the summit of his expectations, tomorrow may bring a descent that will be something to stand from under, and being possessed of quite a prophetic soul, I anticipate the event and as my companion piece for the foregoing, give another sketch of the savage stock coming down, which it will undoubtedly be before many days. Well, I can exclaim with Banquo's facetious murderer, let it come down. The decline cannot destroy my peace, nor deplete my purse. End of section 41《Section 42 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. Ode on a Flea. A lofty theme fit subject for the noblest bard that ever strung a lyre coleridge insufferable pest that with wondrous force sinks in my quivering flesh thy noxious tooth to tap life's current in its healthful course and break my needful rest and bring me ruth o oh, virulent marauder thou art a bore in truth and who that smarts beneath thy awful bite and poisonous delving but will forsooth think that sage poet may have erred a mite who ably sang in ages past whatever is is right i'll place thee foremost in the swarm of those tormenting insects that plague mankind yet greater craven from the earth ne'er rose than thou mute robber of my peace of mind in the musical mosquito noble traits we find when he at night upon his mission goes and quits the ceiling where he long has pined on his shrill bugle a lusty blast he blows to warn his drowsy prey that a raid he doth propose the vampire bats of southern latitudes that preys at night upon the throat of man quite conscious of the pain his tooth intrudes doth with membranous wings the victim fan to hold him still unconscious if he can of the dark demon hovering o'er his head drawing the blood from visage cold and wan till fully gorged it leaves the sleeper's bed and he awakening scarce believes he has been freely bled but thou black delver what virtue canst thou claim save great activity which makes me hate thee more 
through night and day thy labouring is the same insatiate ever thou never wilt give o'er but glutton like still sap and bite and bore yet truly thou art cursed in having such a jaw the champ of which doth try my patience sore and soon thou hast to scud from angry scratching claw and often thou must bite afresh ere surfeited thy maw hadst thou instead of escherotic teeth been furnished with a blood extracting bill which once insinuated skin beneath the worst were past i'd feel no thrill to make me shiver as though an ague chill did all my joints and nerves undo till i sit chattering like a fanning mill perhaps when sitting in the still church pew where i should think of heaven instead of things like you i grant there's naught on earth nor in the sea nor in the windy waste around our rolling sphere that can at all compare with thy agility when thou art taken with a sense of fear and what was ever formed that can come near thy well-knit bones thy strange infrangibility is too well known to need long mention here for who but oft has seen thee spring away quite free although between the fingers rolled most spitefully end of section forty two read by alan mapstone section forty three of frontier humour in verse prose and picture this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Adrian Stevens. Frontier Humour in Verse, Prose and Picture by Palmer Cox. Fighting it out on that line. While crossing Telegraph Hill this evening, in the vicinity of the beach, I witnessed an incident which has kept me smiling to myself for the last two hours. A couple of carters met in a street at a place which needed repairing. One cart was heavily loaded with brick, the other contained a small lot of coal. The driver of number one was in favour of suspending that time-honoured clause in common law which says, turn to the right. Having the heavier load, he wished to adopt the English system. The law of the road is a paradox quite, for as you are driving along, if you go to the left, you are sure to be right. If you go to the right, you go wrong. But driver number two was immovable as Caesar when the conspirators with ready weapons knelt around him. He was determined to enforce his prerogative even to the anchoring of his opponent's cart. Number one said he would stand there until his corns sprouted. Number two replied that he wouldn't budge until his corns not only sprouted, but until they went to seed or he would have his rights. After considerable loud talk, in which they freely expressed unqualified opinions of each other, they commenced unhitching their horses from the carts as night was setting in, and quietly started off to their respective stables. It happened they had met directly before the residence of a stout Teuton who owns a large brewery at the beach. They had scarcely left the disputed point when the brewer arrived. His flushed face showed he had been freely testing the quality of his malt liquor. He demanded of some bystanders how the carts came there, being informed of the whys and wherefores to his satisfaction, he called out his two stout sons to assist in removing the unsightly ornaments. The united efforts of the three soon started the carts down the hill in the direction of the bay, like a battery of flying artillery. It was only a few rods to the water, and in they plunged, 
one after the other, and shot out from the shore like things of life. The old man and his sons stood upon the crest of the hill, viewing the descent in silence. After they had been successfully launched, the trio retired into the house with that self-satisfied and confident air that Emperor William and his two warlike aides might exhibit when retiring to their tent after a battle in which the enemy was routed. To some of the bystanders, this seemed rather a precipitate proceeding, but to my untutored mind it was an act worthy to be ranked with the judicial hangings by the San Francisco Vigilance Committee. As I left the hill, I took a last look back at the carts, fast growing indistinct in the gloom and mist closing over the bay. One craft was hugging the shore off Black Point with a close-reefed tailboard and her wheel well under water. The other was sinking by the stern, but still scudding under bare poles in the direction of Raccoon Straits. End of section 43《Section 43 Section 44 of Frontier Humor and Verse, Prose and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor and Verse, Prose and Picture by Palmer Cox. Dudley's Fight with Dr. Tweezer. Jim Dudley called again last night, and as usual, bored me with one of his yarns. I overshot myself by mentioning to him how low he stood in the estimation of Dr. Tweezer, for that brought down the following upon my head. Dr. Tweezer didn't speak very highly of me, eh? Well, tain't to be wondered at when you know how I wrought upon his feelings once. When a feller has to go around among his patients for more than two weeks with a beefsteak the size of a hearth rug tied to his face, as he did. Ain't a gwine to hurt himself eulogizing the person who set him off, not much. Ever fight? Well, I reckon you'd think so if you had seen the doctor's yard arter we got through turning the chips over thar. He can fight, and squirm like a cat with her tail and tongs. That doctor tweezer can. You see, the doctor's place was alongside the widder gazettes, and she had a numerous assortment of hens, specimens from cold countries with feathers clear down to their toenails, and others from villain hot districts with no feathers at all onto em, except in a few downy substitutes fooling round the neck. They were continually a getting into his garden and sprawling round in the soft beds thar. He was pooty mad over it too, for he prided himself on raising early vegetables, and two or three times he cautioned her to look arter her poultry, or he'd Gin him a dose that would warm their little gizzards for him if he was any judge of drugs. The widder gazette was a plaguey stirring little woman, one that was allers willing to flounder ahead the best way she could. Being myself somewhat interested in the lady, I used to generally chime in when she got into any difficulty. She soon told me what Dr. Tweezer said about the hens, so we set in and poked them, and stuck feathers through their bills, and did all we could, except wringing their necks to keep him out of his garden. But hens are hens, you know, and the warm sand makes them feel mighty nice, I reckon. They still manage to get through the fence, or over it, and hold caucuses in the doctor's onion beds. One day, order I had been down talking politics with the boys thar. I was sitting on the widder's doorstep, smoking and mussing like when I see her hens come a-rustling home as the forty hawks were a-stirring em up. They pinned straight for the water trough, and after taking about two dips into it, commenced the wildest gymnastic feat you ever see, flip-flopping around, standing on their heads and then on their tails. Finally they quieted down, and turning their feet up, lay there dead as the chips around them. I more than suspected Dr. Tweezers had gin him a dose of arsenic or some other mighty telling drug, so I just rise up quietly, took a look over into his yard, and sure enough, there he was, a staggering and squirming around, 
holding of his sides, and even most a bustin' within hard laughter. Now this sort of upset me. Not that I cared so much about the widder chickens, but I didn't like to see a feller so mighty tickled over a mean trick. So I went prancing around to the doctor's fire, pretty darn lively, pulling off my coat as I ran. Calculated I couldn't devote much time to stripping arter I got in thar. His back was towards me, and he never suspicioned I was a coming, but stooped over warping round and sort of unwittingly inviting a kick. It's a mighty funny business, a pizzin' and chickens, isn't it? I says, just that way. And at the same time, I gin him such a hoist that I sent him playin' leapfrog more'n fifteen feet. And for a few moments, I reckon he thought he had backed up against the battering ram. He was mighty cranky, though, and turned round quicker than a dog when his tail is trot on. Dudley, he hollered, you meddlin' ruffian. You've invoked the pest, so no look out for scabs. And with that, he came at me like a clucking hen at a strange dog. I see I was in for a lively time, as the boy said when he upset the beehive. As it we went, ring and twist. Duck and dodge, hop and catch it, round and round the yard like fighting turkeys. I could play around like a box and like a cooper round a barrel. But he was grizzly on a hug, and could kick and gouge like a Mississippian. He went for my right eye like an Irishman and for a ballot box. I'll be blowed if I didn't think I'd have to go one eye on it ever afterwards. Several times you had it sticking out like a doorknob. Finally, while he was a fumbling around, he accidentally slipped his finger into my mouth. And I shut down a mighty fast now, I can tell you. Fair play, fair play, he hollered. No bitin'. Rats, says I, just that way. Twixt my teeth, all grist that comes to my mill, I reckon. And with that, I snapped it off at the second gent like a radish. Just then his wife, hearing an unusual rustling and scraping round the yard, came and run to the door to see what was up, woman-like, without inquiring into the particulars. She took sides to once and, and started with a dish of hot water, calculating to gin me with an alfired scalding. Luckily, she stumbled over the dog that was a scalping into the house to get out of harm's way, and her own youngin that was crawling round the floor munching dirt, got the hottest bath I'd ever experienced. That gave her something else to look harder, so the doctor and I had it out alone. Harder we had been at about fifteen minutes. We held a sort of informal truce, just to order a simultaneous exchange of compliments, which left the doctor laying across the grindstone and me astride the pump. It was the first chance I had of getting a fair look at him since we started in. I see he was punished mighty bad. When I was retiring from active service pooty fast, while his face generally looked as if he had been bobbing for pennies in a dish of tomato sauce, I reckon he wasn't aware he presented such an appearance. For says he, you're looking mighty bad, Dudley, and you might as well gin up now as any time, for you'll eventually have to holler. If I looked one half as bad as you do, doctor, I would holler, I answered. I generally have to look about this bad before my blood gets up a fightin' heat, he says determinedly. Wow, says I, I fed at every election for the last five years, and last fourth. Put the bully and maid of Terre Haute into a coal bunker, blind as a bat, and I calculate no dermed pill mixer is going to get away with me very bad. You'll have to be born again before you can well me, Dudley, he shouted, for I'll fight while there's enough blood left in me to lunch a stall fed musketeer. We both suck through the same straw, then, doctor, says I, for I calculate to stick it with you like a Poor man's plastered to a beggar's ribs, or I'll have the worth of the widder chickens out on ye. And with that, I spit out his finger that I had forgot all about, and the whole time had been chewing on like a piece of flag root. I was so burning mad, I always will think he would have gin up the fight then, if he hadn't seen me spit out the finger. He looked down at his maimed hand, and then at me, and the awful sight seemed to spur him on again. You cannibal varmint! He hollered as he edged up to me. I'll make head cheese of ye. And with that he made a pass at me. So at it we went again, hotter than ever, hands up and heads down like fighting wasps, round and about, over the goose house and wheelbarrow spatter to kick, and down into the sink pool, roll it a roll. And the hair was a flying, and the teeth were a spinning, 
I got a left-handed wipe on his chin, while his mouth was open, swarn, and I made his jaw snap like a wolf trap, and sent one of his molars a buzzin' through the kitchen winder like a bullet from a Springfield musket. I never know when a man could lose so much blood and stand up arter it, until I had that fight with Dr. Tweezer. The blood was a-flyin' from him every which way, like the water from a sprinklin' cart. Yet he wouldn't holler. After a while he clinched and threwed me, but I managed to turn him, and commenced to shut off his supply of wind by twisting his necktie. But just as his tongue began to crop out promisingly, a couple of fellers driving by in a wagon seen us, and they allowed that I was one of the doctor's crazy patients. They got the better of him, so they came running in with a long rope, and set in to tie me right thar. The plaguey doctor turned and to help him do it, too. I cussed and hollered and kicked off both boots and broke two of my teeth a grittin' of em. I was so consumin' mad. But it was no go. I was a playin' a lone hand, with both Bowers and the ace against me. The first thing I knew they had me tied hand and foot, and heisted into their greasy old meat wagon with some dead hogs. Do lock up with him, shouted the doctor, just billin' with rage. He's crazy as a cow with her horns knocked off. They took me thar, sure enough, and I stayed thar till midnight before the mistake was known. I was pooty well scratched up, but that Dr. Tweezer was the most horrid sight you ever did see. Art of that fight, he looked as though he had been the subject in a dissecting room, with at least a dozen medical students peeling and hacking off of him in the interest of science. The doctor allowed that the Eurysipilis would set in, seeing there were so many small veins busted in his face so he painted it all over with scarlet iodine as a precautionary measure. He did look like the very old Nick, and no mistake. His face was fearfully puffed up, you see, and his nose was knocked clear away round to one side. His mouth in particular was a study that a feller couldn't get familiar with. It was a problem that the more you looked into, the more your ideas got confused. It was swelled and twisted and run around, out of all shape and proportion. He had the terriblest time you ever heard of getting his vittles into it, and fairly started down his throat. There he would sit at the table, exploring about for fully five minutes, striving to make the harbor, and when he couldn't fetch it, he would draw the spoon back and look at it a while, planning another expedition. He knew where his mouth ought to be, you see, and where it had been a few hours before, and to be obliged to canvass the whole of his head to find it was something he wasn't accustomed to. It seemed as if he never would get through jabbing the spoon about his face, and when he would finally strike the opening, he would be around on one side of his head, so much so, in fact, that a person would think he was pouring the soup into his ear. He would be all hunkadory then during the remainder of that meal, but the next time he would come to the table, the same performance would have to be gone through with. He couldn't keep run of the thing now. It was here today and somewhere else tomorrow, like a wrinkle in a shirt. The swellum kept shifting and undulating about continually, down in one place and up in another, all within an hour, and that would shove the mouth away down along the neck somewhere, or clear across the other side of the head, perhaps. The family would be sitting there eating no more than he was. They would be so busily engaged watching a singular maneuvering, and it would make him so roaring mad that he would send them all away from the table. He tried to eat by the aid of a small looking-glass. That didn't work any better than going it blind. When he saw how disfigured every feature was, his appetite would begin to get away from him pooty lively, and he would sling the glass into the corner, and fall to denounce me like a crazy bushwhacker. The yard, too, was a sight. Everything in it was painted and scratched and painted again. Old Mrs. Sharon, who was hours of smelling around about butchering time, on the lookout for a fresh morsel, was gwined by the doctors the next morning, and she noticed the blood and horror sticking to the chips and pump handle, and she allowed he had killed his spring pig, so she dropped in to ask him for the ears and a piece of the liver. The doctor thought she was running him on his late skirmish, and you never saw a man fly into such a passion in all your born days. He jumped up and pulled his pissin' pump out of a drawer, and says he, "'Yo, faded remnant, you scallop, you greasy old cinder of an Sundayary fire, he continued, just that way. I'll gin ye just seven seconds to get out of my house in, or I'll hoist the gizzard out of ye mighty quick. 
Jemmy, wasn't she scared, though? You never see a cat get from under a stove quicker when a pot boils over. Then she got out of that house. So Dr. Tweezer didn't speak very highly of me, eh? Well, now you kind of know the reason, don't you? End of section 44. Read by Greg Giordano. Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 45 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose and Picture by Palmer Cox. My Neighbor Worsted as I look from my window, I am surprised at the change the last half hour has wrought upon my neighbor and his immediate surroundings. At that time, he emerged from the shed in which he keeps his extra household furniture, with a length of stovepipe and an elbow under his arms. They were apparently just the things he needed to tone down the draft of his new stove and shoot the sparks clear of the banker's eaves. I think I never saw him look better-natured than at that moment. His face was clear and unruffled as a woodland pool. His children played around him with unsuspecting minds and unlimited speech. The household cat, with all confidence in his noble nature, familiarly rubbed his ribs against his leg, as he for a moment stood deciding which end of the length to introduce to the elbow. Even the old hen roosting on the enclosure seemed to settle her head into her body with more than ordinary satisfaction as she regarded the complacent scene beneath her. But half an hour ago, all was peace, confidence, and love, and now what a change is here! I hear the children, but see them not. Their plaintive wail reminds me how often laughter is the harbinger of tears. The hen with ruffled feathers and outstretched neck stands aloof upon the ridge of a distant dwelling. The household cat that had grown old in the family and had good reason to believe herself privileged purrs no more. She has painful reasons to think otherwise now, as she crouches in the most retired corner of the premises, assiduously applying whatever balm her tongue affords to injured parts. She doubtless muses how heavier than an infant's spoon it is to feel an adult's boot. Yet my neighbor was neither rash nor hasty. He seemed the embodiment of perseverance, as he repeatedly offered that length of stovepipe and elbow which it, like a prudish maiden, provokingly refused. Soon the drops of perspiration began to stand upon his face and neck in large globes, and I knew that patience was oozing from every pore. I knew by the scattering children, the cackling hen, and the flying household cat, that the rose-lipped cherubim of which the poet sings were abiding with him no longer. Presently his wife came to his assistance with a case-knife, and for a time it seemed as though victory would crown their united efforts. Reinforcements turned the tide at Waterloo, and laid proud France at the mercy of Europe, and how often the assistance from the mind or arm of a noble wife rolls back the enemy from the door. But reinforcements could not mend the matter here. The poor woman soon retired from the scene with wounded fingers and damaged pride. My neighbor himself has ceased to strive. Flattened, kicked, and abandoned, the pipes sly master of the situation. Ah, I am fully persuaded that neither depth of affliction, nor height of impudence, nor length of trial, nor breadth of argument, nor extravagance, nor parsimony, nor things in particular, nor things in general, can begin to compare, as triers of patience, with a couple of old frill-edged stovepipes, that emphatically set their edge against a union. End of section 45 Section 46 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Kathy Kay Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox The Breathing Spell 
As some lone reaper, tanned and sore, Doth pause to glance his acres o'er, Comparing what hath passed his hands With what before him bristling stands. Behind him lie the shocks and sheaves, While like a sea before him heaves, Far over valley, hill and plain, The waving heads of waiting grain. So pause I now, when halfway through, This growing book, my task to view, Behind lie many a sketch and line, Before me countless pages shine. Behind the thoughts are shaped and bound, Before they float in freedom round. And as that reaper stoops again, To throw his hook around the grain, And sinks amid the sea of gold, To rise when hands no longer hold, So bend I to my task anew, And undismayed my course pursue till clip on clip and sheaf on sheaf shall bear me to the farthest leaf. End of section 46
this bootjack had also caused the death of a mule, for on one occasion, the pugilist hurled it with such violence at a cat that was scampering across the roof of a shed that the heavy missile went through the boards. A farmer's mule that was standing inside received the weapon behind the ear and immediately went to gravel as though he had been felled with a sledgehammer. The farmer instituted a suit against the boy to recover damages, but the friends of the pugilist made up a purse to satisfy the demand of the farmer, and the matter was hushed. I was also shown a jagged hole in a high board fence, which it is said the boy made one night while going home from a neighboring saloon. It seems he had some trouble with a companion before leaving the saloon, and seeing his shadow dogging his steps mistook it for the substance of his late antagonist, very naturally presuming that his intentions were anything but friendly, he turned hastily around and dissipated the obnoxious shadow by knocking it about fifteen feet into the garden. The fence rattled and shook around the whole lot under the terrible blow. He made a hole in the boards through which a large goat could readily jump without sacrificing any of its hair by the performance, and permanently injured a good-sized pear tree that stood inside the enclosure about three feet distant. The concussion was terrible. A couple of turkeys that happened to be roosting in the tree at the time dropped from their limb as though shot through the head with a needle gun. Never afterwards could they be induced to roost upon anything further from the ground than the crossbar of a saw horse or the handles of a wheelbarrow. No doubt the town at one time had great expectations, as it formerly was the capital of the state. It is now a capital joke to see a person undertaking to walk through the town in the winter season without faith strong enough or feet broad enough to support him upon the surface of the oceans of mud he will find himself gazing wistfully across. On my way down, a man was pointed out to me on the boat who is said to be the meanest man in his county. My informant assured me that when the mean individual's wife died last year, he borrowed a pair of forceps from the dentist at Venetia and extracted all her gold-filled teeth. And on the morning prior to her funeral, he sat upon the doorstep, hammer in hand, with a flat iron upon his knees, cracking the teeth like English walnuts, and with a sew and all, extracting the filling from the cavities. During my journey, I didn't cultivate that man's acquaintance. He is a person to stand away from, especially when clouds are charged with electricity. End of section 47, read by Julie Taylor, December 19th, 2021. Section 48 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Too much of India. Take away the dish. I have had my fill of Modoc. Have had buck for breakfast, squaw for dinner, and papus for supper. Until at the very name of Indian, my appetite forsakes me. The appellations that for a season fell upon my ears, like a new poem from the lips of some sweet bard, have poetry for me no longer. The names Captain Jack, Scarface Charlie, Shack Nasty Jim, Rain in the Face, Old Man Afraid of His Horse, Sitting Bull, or Ellen's Man, have lost their charm. They have become dull and uninteresting, and I would hear them no more forever. I have been duped, deceived, defrauded on account of these rascally Indians. I have gazed in silent awe upon what I suppose to be the scalp of no less a personage than old Sconchin, and it now transpires that the redoubtable old chief turns up among the Indians recently captured. 
Oh, oh, how this world is given to lying. I have journeyed long and far, by water and by rail, on horseback and on foot, and purchased at an extravagant price an Indian scalp, which the seller under oath with lifted hand assured me was the veritable crown lock of that same old scuncheon. With tears coursing down his sunburned cheeks, he informed me that with his own eyes, in the full light of day, he saw it plucked smoking from the sconce of the expiring breeze. I have consequently braided watch chains of the hair, fashioned a money purse of the skin, and then withdrawn into a private apartment to shed bitter tears of sorrow because the material didn't quite hold out to make a tobacco pouch. And now the distressing intelligence reaches me that the renowned old sconchin stands manacled in the camp of his foemen with an unscarified top and as luxuriant hair as ever drew nourishment from an Indian head. Oh, where shall we turn? Or where shall we look for honesty, since it is not found in the breast of the Indian scalp peddler? End of section 48. Read by Amazing Space 48. Port of Spain, Thursday, 18th November, 2021. Section 49 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Kathy Kay. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. Going Up the Spout. Rats and mice, like ourselves, often labor at a great disadvantage while endeavoring to make a livelihood. They often make a miss of it altogether by not knowing the proper time to set out upon an expedition. Their life is a perpetual skirmish. They have to take chances and be upon their guard continually. Their mortal enemy in dread, the cat, may be asleep in the fourth story, and the poor mouse knows not of it as he looks wistfully across the intervening space between the ash barrel and the basement stairs. But after weighing the chances of escape or capture, he scurries across the opening with as much haste as though the sharp claws of pussy were raking the stunted fur from his wiry tail. The sun may pour down its genial rays, and the planks which his way lies over be warm and inviting, but he cannot loiter to enjoy its warmth or survey the beauties of nature. Oh, who would be a mouse? Sigh I as I sit and ponder over his life of inherent fear and uncertainty. He seems to have no confidence in himself. His actions are like those of an inferior checker player. Shove about as he may, the chances are he will soon regret the maneuver and wish himself safely back again at the starting point. Everything about the premises seems to be after him. He regards the old blacking brush that lies under the bench with looks of suspicion for hours together, and dare not risk a scamper past. He takes it for a horrid cat, quietly and patiently binding her time. He retires into his hole and waits fully an hour before peeping out again. But there it sits to blast his sight and cause a cold thrill to run along his spine. The fact that it does not change its position does not in the least weaken his mistrust. On the contrary, it rather strengthens it. It's so cat-like, he says to himself, for it to be sitting there motionless. In the handle projecting from one end, he very naturally thinks he recognizes the tail, and at this new discovery, he backs into his hole again in great trepidation. He feels certain now that he was right in his suspicions. Another wait follows. On again emerging, there it lies as before, and if that mouse was profane and had a soul to hazard, it would undoubtedly hazard it and roundly berate that brush through compressed teeth. It takes but little to set a poor mouse into a perfect fluster. Down rolls a stick of wood from the pile, and Mr. Mouse, nibbling at the other corner of the shed, jumps at least eight feet in the direction of his hole. The wind blows down the clothesline stick, and simultaneous with its fall upon the planks, the heart, liver, and lights of the poor mouse 
seemed to be running a steeplechase to see which can jump from his mouth first. Away he scurries across the yard so fast that though your eyes were endeavoring to keep up with him all the way, you merely know something has been moving, but can only surmise what. We sometimes think the trials and disappointments of humanity are great, but dear me, what are they compared to the miseries of these poor creatures? From their hardships deliver me, for all their care and caution they do so often miscalculate. This is evidenced by the number of times our old cat enters the house with her mouth full and her eyes sparkling with pride. There is nothing so very degrading or humiliating in a cat's life, and the thought of becoming a cat does not make one shudder as does the thought of becoming a mouse. A good household cat does not occupy such a very position in life after all. By good, I mean an excellent mouser, one never guilty of letting a mouse escape after having the second wipe at him. No scraggy creature with stove-singed back and scalloped ears, but a well-behaved, home-loving animal. The lot of such a creature is preferable to that of some men who I have met in life, that is, if there were no rude children in the house. There is always some drawback. A cat is peculiarly blessed that lives in a house where there are no children. It seems to be counted as one of the family almost, and its life, though short, is certainly a happy one. But ah, oh, these reckless children that snatch up Tommy by the tail, as they would a saucepan, and as though the tail was actually intended for a handle? On second thought, the life of a cat is not so very pleasant after all. For the last half hour I have been deeply interested in the maneuvers of a large rat in the yard of an adjacent house. He has made three unsuccessful attempts to go up the sink spout. Thrice he has glided up the slippery incline until the tip of his long tail disappeared from view. But as often has he beat a hasty retreat, assisted on his downward way by a rushing torrent of hot dishwater. He is a determined fellow, however, and sticks to an enterprise with the spirit and pertinacity of a world-seeking Columbus or a prison-breaking Monte Cristo. No doubt the hungry edge of appetite is whetted by the strong effluvium arising from Limburger cheese, the people are Germans, that fills the whole atmosphere with an odor truly agreeable to the rodent nose every time the pantry door is opened. The cheese has been lately stirred up, I presume by the trenchant knife of the pater familias, and consequently the poor hunger-pinched rat is allured up the spout at this inopportune hour while the servant girl is washing the dishes. Every living creature has its weakness. The horse whinnies when the oats draw nigh and forgets the galling collar. Sheep that at other times will not come within gunshot grow tame and unsuspicious when the salt is shaken in the pan. The hog has a penchant for clover roots. Or wherefore does the rusted wire ring ornament his nose? Is it there because it's the fashion? Ask the farmer. And undoubtedly cheese is the weakness of the rat family. It is their aim, and often their end, too. It is the shrine to bow down before which the rat will jeopardize his life every hour of the twenty-four. He dreams of it. In his fitful slumbers he beholds it, ranged about him tier on tier, as in a great storeroom, and not a cat within forty leagues. He is in the rat's paradise and happy. No deceptive poisons that consume the stomach. No insidious, subtle traps yawning ready to clutch the unsuspecting victims surround him. He is safe and at peace, and would dwell there forever and forever in one unbroken, endless night. But the heavy rumbling of a day startles him, for all sweet dreams have their wakings, alas, that it is so. He wakes, and where is he? Under the wet sidewalk, drenched and tousled with the drippings of the day's rain, with nothing for breakfast but a dry onion peel the prog of the previous night, which nothing but a forty-eight hours fast could induce him to seize. Ah, me! What chances the fellow has to take in order to secure sufficient sustenance to keep life and body together. Honor pricks me on, soliloquized old Sir John, on the field of Shrewsbury, when he withdrew from the general clash and rendering up of souls, to breathe a spell, and moralize upon the insignificance of fame or honor as against the value of life. But nothing pricks on the poor rat but his craving little digestive organs. The mill is crying out for grists. The hopper is empty. 
the stone still turning, and something must be done, and that quickly. No honor is attached to the expedition, and even though he should succeed in making the inning, which is doubtful, all that can be said is that he has gone up the spout. And in the common acceptation of the saying, that is certainly nothing to be highly elevated over. I actually feel ashamed when I think of the many projects I have abandoned through life because I met with slight reverses. Here before me is this poor water-soaked rat, his hair still smoking from his recent scald, emerging once more from behind the wood box, determined to solve the problem of the sink spout or perish in the attempt. A grim smile of resolution seems to part his pointed features as he moves quietly up to the dripping conduit from which he lately scampered with steaming ribs. They may talk of deeds of noble daring, of vaulting the breach, of traversing the wild, but for sterling courage, for indomitable perseverance and pluck, commit me to this little adventurer in my neighbor's yard. In the face of three scalding inundations, he ventures again upon the expedition, unshaken, unsubdued, unterrified. He takes more chances and subjects himself to more risks in ascending that spout than old Samuel de Champlain in exploring up the St. Lawrence among the Iraqi. What if the large flea-pasturing dog, lying indolently in the yard, would rouse from the lethargic sleep that holds him, and for once make himself useful by thrusting his bristling muzzle up the orifice after the little explorer, thereby cutting off retreat in the event of another disastrous deluge? The terrible result of such an action on the part of the dog is too painful and improbable to contemplate. End of section 49. Section 50 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. The Glorious Fourth. You need not wait to call me, to call me, mother dear, for tomorrow'll be the noisiest day of all the passing year. Of all the passing year, mother, the most uproarious day, and I, you bet, will stirring be before the morning grey. The flagstaff will be hoisted, mother, two hundred feet in air, and cannon will be ranged around the whole of Union Square and on the instant Phoebus shoots his arrows o'er the hill, there'll be a roar will shake the shore as far as Watsonville. You know the tailor's nephew, mother, they call him Squinty Ware. Last year he powdered Perry's jaw and blinded Dobson's mare, and while his poor old grandmamma was peeping through the blind, he got a whiz in her old fizz that she'll for ever mind and henrietta loring mother tied crackers to the tail of deacon reed's big lazy hound while eating from a pail and goodness gracious how he jumped and dusted for the shed and in a moment every straw was blazing in his bed and you'd have died of laughter mother i'm certain if you saw old deacon reed run out to tramp upon the burning straw and when he ran to get the hose for tramping would not do his wig blew off and down the street for half a block it flew i know it was not proper mother and i ashamed should be to stand and gag just like a wag another's loss to see but twas a sight that got me quite and i'll be old indeed when i forget the comic look of that old deacon reed i've got a rousing pistol mother the loudest in the block and i have filed a little catch that holds the thing at cock and hardly do i get the charge of powder in the bore when off it goes just with a shake and thunder what a roar so sleep on if you can dear mother and have no thought of me for i'll be up and charging round before there's light to see and when you hear a bang that makes the ring dance in your ear, then you can bet your scissors, mother, that I am somewhere near. 
End of section 50. Recording by Alan Mapstone. Section 51 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. Jim Dudley's Sermon. Hereafter, I shall have no faith in reports. Last week I heard that Jim Dudley had left the city, and was congratulating myself on at last escaping him. But my congratulations were premature. Last night he called upon me, and kept me in torture for fully two hours, at a time, too, when I should have been asleep. But what cared he for that? The scoundrel? There was no shaking him off. He sticks to a person like mortar to a brick. I had to sit and listen though I do honestly believe every word the fellow uttered was an unqualified lie. But he swears to its truth, and how can I prove it otherwise? It is better to take it as it comes, and ask no questions for conscience' sake. I never told you about the sermon I preached over in Misertown one Sunday. I had a time of it thar, and no mistake. Hold on a minute, and I'll, I'll tell you how it was. You see, Gil Bisbee, that plaguey shirk. I never mentioned his name, but what I feel like trouncing of him. But he was a genius, though, and no fooling about it. A natural-born inventor, chock full of notions as a toy shop. But somehow or another, he never could bring anything to a paying focus. All his whittling and born and planning around, though, wherever you'd meet him, he'd be hauling out of his pocket some old drawing with more wheels and contrivances pictured on it than you could think of in a twelve hours dream he never could get the cap sheaf on to his endeavor though all or something to miss a wheel too many or another one one or too many cogs to have the thing work just right he invented a contrivance for plucking chickens that was a rustler he shoved the fowls through the machine something like a corn sheller and jit him in an electric shock while passing along and shot him out of a spout at the other end of the machine as bare as weaver shuttles he didn't make anything of it, though. He had to check him through while alive, you see, and that clashed with the law. When he took the machine down to the city to introduce it to the poultry dealers, the society fellows who look out for the interests of dumb critters got arter him and sewed him up. They put a reef in his jib pooty quick now, I tell you. They were passing along through the market one day, and they saw Gil just a humping himself showing off the apparatus to the market men. He was cranking and pumping away, like a sailor when there's fifteen feet of water in the hold and still resin, and the chickens were a-screamin' and a-scootin' through that contrivance, close as if they were runnin' on a string-head against tail. There's a cloud of feathers hoverin' round over it. Didn't they fasten on to that Gil Bisbee, though? They snatched him up quicker than if he had been hoss-stealin' and confiscated his plucker, and tucked an all-fired heavy fine on to him besides. Meetin' with such poor encouragement in that direction, he went back to Scullyville, and set out to invent a thundering great machine for laying cobblestones. That was just him all over. All are starting in to get up some outlandish-looking thing. This machine was a crusher, and no getting round it. It was fearful enough to make a cow slip or cut. I'll be shot if it wasn't. It looked something like Noah's Ark, set on wheels, and filled with all kinds of machinery. He started in to explain one moonlit night in front of the courthouse, but got the main belt crossed or something. I disremember just what. And Jerusalem! Less than ten minutes he ran the whole population out to the foothills in our night clothes. There wasn't no stopping the consarned thing. Poor Gil was knocked down senseless at the first revolution. Nobody ever knowed how to control it. They rolled the whole length of the square, tearing up the stones that had pounded down the day before, and sending off of them buzzing over the village in all directions. No home was sacred, and no head was safe, as the poet has it. Poor old Mrs. Schooley lived just long enough to learn this, and no longer. She was going once too often to get her pitcher filled at the corner grocery that night, and a stone took her in the small of the back as she was entering the door, and it hissed at her clear over the counter on top of a barrel. It's true as I'm telling it to you. Poor old body. She was the pioneer female of the village, too. The first woman to wash a shirt in Scullyville. But arter all, 
the town wasn't much loser by her passin away she was a sort of panicky old critter anyhow always scary about catchin the smallpox or any other prevailing disease that came round the old village physician said he would rather see the very old scratch making towards him on the street than old mrs schooley comin from church or market as the case might be she would fasten on to him like a woodtick to a leaf and he couldn't get rid of her nohow she would have him time her pulse right there on the sidewalk and be a shovin of her tongue out for his inspection and she did have such an unlimited wallopin great tongue too it seemed when she was shovin all of it out as though she was actually disgorgin her liver it's so by jingo people would be a stoppin and styin thar wonderin what was the matter with the old gal that is people that didn't know her peculiarities though most everybody in the village had seen her standing in that position so often that they would be more surprised to see her with her tongue in her mouth than projecting it out in the rain the old doctor used to be terribly annoyed he would say kind of hurriedly like because he would be itching to get away from her oh you're all right i reckon mrs schooley but you'd better be a getting along home and not stand too long in the cold air with so much of your vital organs exposed to the weather the result may be fearful if not fatal that would generally start her off pooty lively towards her shanty they say the first time the doctor saw her tongue he was surprised so much that he looked actually scared says he i've been nigh unto eight and thirty years of practice in physician until this moment i flattered myself that i was familiar with all the ins and outs of the profession but i began to think i get over the dissecting knife too soon for here's something that i was not prepared for but that's not telling you about the sermon is it but when i mentioned that gil bisbee i sort of wandered off arter him and his contrivances well that was but to tell you gil and i were saunterin round misertown one sunday and we saw any number of gals going into the schoolhouse where the preaching was carried on so we concluded to step in and get a better look at some of em i didn't know how many of the people around there but from what i heard i judged they were the meanest closed fistedest set of sinners that ever had the gospel dispensed with amongst them i understood they had treated their minister plaguey mean when he first came thar to look arter him there was no regular place for him to stop you see and they agreed amongst themselves to take turns to keepin him until they could get a house up for him he was one of those young easy green kind of fellers that had seemingly never been so far away from home before but what he could see the smoke of his father's chimney or smell his mother's corn dodgers burnin and they soon took advantage of it and sort of play button with him shovin him around from one to another as though it was too hot to hold he first went to a feller by the name of wigglewort says wig i'm really very sorry mr sermon slice we unfortunately have no accommodations for you at present we have no place for you to sleep thought we put you in the barn the nights are rather cold for that besides the rats might annoy you sorry you happen to come just at this time of all the others the most embarrassing it's not but what i would like to have you stop with us i would indeed mr sermon slice consider it an honor to have you the minister taking his books under his arm started out into the night as though his life depended upon the most prompt kind of action he wasn't within hailing inside of two minutes he went over and succeeded in getting lodgings with a feller named joe grimsby who lived over by frog marsh joe was too darn lazy to do his own praying while the parson stopped with him he got rid of it they do say he was the laziest old curmudgeon that ever turned up his eyes he used to say a prior at the beginning of the month and on the following nights he would always allude to it in a sort of matter-of-fact way you know my feelings towards ye nothing hid from ye i reckon i haven't changed my sentiments yet if i do I'll let you know of it i'll keep nothing back from ye though it should take the har off he would go on in that business-like way and the whole time be a crawlin in the bed well as i was going to tell you gil and i poked into the building and sat down thar amongst the congregation the minister hadn't come yet and a pooty soon an old feller got up and see as he it may be the minister has had a late breakfast and will not get here for some time yet in the meantime as it's a dry season and our crops need a shower of rain we might as well have a little praying going on can't do much harm anyhow and we may be the means of bringing down a good smart shower there'll be money in our pockets in the long run he asked several to take hold and do something in that way but one had a cold 
another one was just getting over the mumps, and so they went making excuses. Finally, the old fellow turned to me and says he, Perhaps you would lead us. You look like one who has had some experience that way. I thanked him for the compliment, but told him I was something like the officers in the army. I would rather follow than lead, but he stuck to me like a Jew to a customer. Arter a while I consented, and just as I was about starting in, a feller came in and said the minister had got a terrible tickling in his throat, caused by partly swallowing a hire in the butter over to old Joe Grimsby's, and couldn't attend to his duties that day. So the old chap got up again and says, We won't have any preaching then. Without some person present, we'll volunteer to act in our pastor's place this morning. But no one spoke up. Perhaps, he says, turning to me, you would favor us by conducting the service, young man. You doubtless are competent to perform that duty. This sort of got me. Then the thought struck me. Perhaps I'd make something out of him by it. Besides, didn't want to plead ignorance right there amongst them. So getting up, I says, this is somewhat unexpected. Honors follow one another pooty fast. With that, I got into the pulpit and began to look down at him pooty seriously. There was no Bible on the desk, so I asked if there was any parson there that would loan me one for the occasion. Some of them spoke up and said they had books, but were in the habit of keeping them to follow along arter the minister and correct him when he made a mistake. Besides, they'd like to see how he worked out the text. I looked at him some time pooty hard. I thought they'd beaten anything I had come across for some time, and I had a good mind to get down again, only I allowed they'd laugh at me. So I says, All right, you can keep your books. I reckon I know enough by heart to get along with it, and then gin out something for them to sing. Short or long meter, inquired the leader of the singers, who were settin' over in the corner. I didn't exactly understand him, as I knowed he was in the habit of meeting Sal Clippercut over to Mrs. Curry's every Sunday afternoon. I allowed he was asking for something shorter, as he was long in the meter. I spoke up pretty sharp and says, You will please sing what I gin you to sing. I reckon you aren't long in the meter so bad, but what you can wait until out of the service is over. She'll keep that long, I reckon, without spilling. I know her. She isn't none of your spring chickens, nother. I continued, just like that, and he ought to have seen the way he looked, and the gals commenced to snicker and crowd their handkerchiefs into their mouths. One little red-faced critter that sat alongside of him tittered right out. Her mother, who was sitting nearby, jumped up and says, Becky Jane, you go right straight home this minute, and go to peel on the taters for dinner. But a feller who looked as though his mother had been a mulator, or even something of a darker shade, got up and says, the gal isn't to blame in the least. It's that feller in the pulpit thar. I, for one, don't want to hear any more of his lingo. Well, then you can stuff wool in your ears, I says, and you won't have far to go to get another, I continued, just that way, alluding to his own har, which seemed pretty woolly. You ought to see how they looked, fast at him, then at me. He colored up, I reckon, but he was too black to show it. I heard him grit his teeth from where I was standing. He didn't say any more, but an old woman who was sitting near jumped up, and says she, The meeting house is turned into a theater. When a mountie bank gets into the pulpit, it is high time for respectable people to be moving. I'll leave, she exclaimed, pulling her shawl around her shoulders and beginning to bustle out of her seat. Well, you can go, I hollered, just that way, for I was beginning to get sort of riled at the way things were a-going. When I'm talking politics or arguing over the merits of whiskey, I can bear crossing and any amount of contradiction. But right thar, where a feller had to be choice of his language, it was different business. You can go, I says. We can get along without you, I reckon. We're willing to chance it anyhow. Take your knitting along. Don't leave that behind, I continued, pointing to the sea as though I saw it lying thar. I didn't, though, but I wanted to give her a mighty hard rub for I suspected her piety was put on, and that she was displeased because nobody was noticing her new bonnet. The whole congregation took it for granted that the knitting was thar, and you ought to have seen them stretching and craning out thar necks as far as they could to get a look into the pew. One old fellow that was setting back pooty far craned out kind of quartering rather suddenly, and his neck in a crack like a bonbon. He commenced, Oh, 
oh, and trying to get it back to its old position again. But he couldn't make any headway until his wife went to rubbing and chafing of it right to her. But that old woman, whew, she was mad as a wet hen. She couldn't hardly find the door. She was so mixed up. When she finally got thar, she turned round and straightened of herself up. She says, Young man, before she got any further, I broke in on her, for I judged she had a tongue that was hung in the middle. So I says, That'll do, that'll do, Mrs. You can move along. You're disturbing the peace of the congregation. And besides all that, you're showing your false teeth mighty bad in the bargain. She got out arter that pooty lively, now I can tell you. I could see her as she went up the road towards her home, and two or three times she stopped and turned and round, acted as though she had half a mind to come back and try the whole thing over again. But arter standing there a while thinking like a pig, when it's listening to the grass taking root, she would shake her head and move along up the turnpike as though she concluded that she had had enough of that kind of pie. This piece of performance sort of throwed me off the track. While I was standing there thinking where to start in with the discourse, Gil Bisbee come a crawfishing up the steps to one side of me, and whispering says he, I say, Jim, you haven't got the track blocks already, have you? No, I answered. I ain't got the track blocks. But I got the ropes twisting round, and things look generally mixed up just now, I can tell you. Well, start in on the sermon at once, then, he urged. For they are getting mighty impatient now, I can tell you. You've got to be doing something pooty quick. But whatever you do, he continued, don't get up very high without having some idea how you're going to get down again. Keep steering round waters that you've piloted over before. Remember, a blind mouse shouldn't venture very far from its hole, especially if there's a whole generation of cats watching of it. With that, he backed down to his seat again, took out his pencil, and began to design a machine for picking the bones out of fish. On the fly-leaf of a book that was lying there, I started in on the sermon. It wasn't much of a sermon, to be sure. More like a lecture. I couldn't think of any passages of scripture just then, so I ginned them the line from the philosopher. Why does the frightened dog depress his tail when he runneth? You ought to have seen him rustling and turning the leaves, hunting to find the passage. One old feller by the name of Spud commenced to paw over the pages, and his wife says, Don't go that way. Turn back to the book of Job. He looked round at her with his under lip sticking out just that way, otter wetting of his thumb to start turning over again, and says, Job be biled and buttered. I can pick old Solomon from amongst a thousand of em. He was sound on the goose, he was. Two or three of them started in to ask me where the text was located, but I kept on talking right straight talking along, looking round to all of them at once, and no one in particular. I didn't give him a chance to stop me again, or get a word in edgewise. One singular-looking old coon with a weed on his hat got up and stood singling of me, and waiting and watching for a chance to ask me something. I never let on to see him. I reckon he stood there five minutes with his finger up, pointing to attract my attention, and his mouth opened so wide that from my elevated position I could tell what he had swallowed for breakfast. I gin him a sort of rambling discourse, alluding to the prevailing passions and errors of the age. Amongst other things, I touched on jealousy a little. I wanted to stir him up a trifle on that subject, because there was a great deal of jealousy in that neighborhood. The green-eyed monster was a rantin' and a raven round in a good many households, and as it generally turns out, there was least cause for it where it was most prevailing. One old feller was moved by the first remark, when I said, quoting from the poet, Jealousy in the wife is worse than trichina in the pork. He leaned over to the man sitting in the next pew and says, I can't tell you for the life of me where he gets the passage, but it's a solid truth, anyhow. So I went on and finished the sermon, or lecture, rather, and then I says, The choir will please sing the hymn beginning, Give, give, give to the needy, order which I will pass around amongst the congregation and take up a collection for the benefit of the heathen and foreign parts. Gee, Whittaker, you ought to have seen them turn around and look at each other when I said that. I can't describe it to you. I can't do the scene justice. If I had told him I was going to stay with them through the season, I could hardly have started him to think it any more than I did by telling him about that collection for the heathen and foreign parts. 
after two or three attempts the singing began. I closed my eyes and, leaning back in my chair, minister-like, commenced to estimate the probable yield of each pew. While I was thinking thar and calculating how much I would make by the preaching business, I noticed the singing dying out, and it dying out slowly, like as the prisoner said his hopes were when the sheriff was a fumbling around his neck just on the rope. So I opened my eyes easy like, as though coming back to earthly scenes reluctantly. And you can water my whiskey if I wasn't just in time to see old Ned Scullet's coat tails whisking round the door jam. The hindmost rag of the congregation. Women and children and all were gone sure enough. On looking out of the window I see em a scattering, a hustling and elbowing themselves ahead of each other along the turnpike, as though there were great danger in being left behind. Would you believe it? There was that plaguey shirk, Gil Bisbee, a craning up the hill, leading the crowd. I sat thar a while, looking after him, and then, coming down, I began to look around a little, and pooty soon I noticed that several of them left their hats. They were in such a hurry to get out, so I selected a good one, only twas a little out of fashion, and putting it on, I says to myself, If you think I'm interested enough in your welfare here, or hereafter, to preach to you for nothing, you are mistaken, I reckon. With that, I walked out, not until I had kicked the remaining hats around the room pooty lively. The next day I noticed an old feller with a dilapidated beaver on, that looked as if it had done duty on a scarecrow for several seasons, sidling up to me, and circling around two or three times, looking mighty close at my tile. I always think it was his stovepipe, but he was too much ashamed to come right out and lay claim to it. But that Gil Bisbee, I didn't wonder so much at the congregation dusting out at all, cause they didn't know me. But he, well, no matter. I'll get even on him yet. End of section fifty one. Read by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 52 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. The Poisoned Pet. It was my good fortune the other day to attend a picnic in the country. A lady friend insisted on tacking her pet boy to me on that occasion. As she couldn't go herself, she wanted me to have an eye to Sonny and see that he didn't come in contact with poison oak. She assured me he was a good boy and would mind me as if I were his father. I didn't pine for the pet's company, but could not very well refuse her request, so he went with me. I very soon found out he was one of those smart children who, by a strange freak of nature, are placed in possession of an impudence that prompts them to believe they know more at the age of eight than your average adult. My will and his wishes soon clashed. Then the thought entered my head that his mother misrepresented Sonny's obedient nature if this is obedience that an offspring manifests to a father, I mentally murmured, it were better to be destitute of the offspring. The boy sauced me. He even went so far as to call me names anything but flattering while I was sitting in the presence of a young lady I most ardently adored. Go on, Sonny, I said to myself savagely. Go on, precocious youth. There are no raging bears in this suburban park to tear the flesh from the bones of mouthy children who sauce their betters, as did the animals in the days of prophets. But nature in other ways has made provision for such as you, and has sprinkled a few shrubs around here that can pile the flesh on to a person's bone to an alarming degree, if they get a fair chance. After that I paid no attention to him. He ran at will browsed through the vines like a hungry deer, and burrowed in the very heart of the poison oak and ivy, with as little fear as a quail retiring to roost. He enjoyed himself immensely, so he informed me in the evening. I am glad he did, 
for he is having a quiet time of it now. I saw him this morning, and his face was as full of expression as a Christmas pudding new rolled from the cloth. I think my lady friend will not be over anxious to appoint me guardian over her dutiful son at another picnic. In the interest of art, I have made a sketch of Sonny, as he appeared this morning striving to recognize me by my voice, which he failed to do, however, being deaf as he was blind. End of section 52. Read by Julie Taylor. December 19, 2021. Section 53 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Kathy Kay. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. Seeking for a Wife. And it came to pass about the year 1873 being in the autumn, when the new wine was oozing from the press and the corn was hardening in the crib, a bachelor, a farmer of great possessions, dwelling in the valley of Berryessa, bent above his resting plow and thus communed with himself. My stacks are builded, my wine is dripping from the press, the ripe ears are garnered in my cribs, my flocks and herds feed fat upon the hills, and yet, because of my loneliness, I am unhappy." I will arise at eve and repair to my neighbor's cottage. Peradventure, the aged widow of the murdered gypsy, can counsel me. So when the evening hour was come, the farmer arose and sought the aged widow's abode. As he drew nigh to the cottage, he lifted up his eyes, and behold, the crone sat upon her doorstep. And when the dame looked upon the farmer, she knew his heart was troubled, but she knew not the cause. So, lifting up her voice, she cried inquiringly, what aileth, my neighbor? Has aught befell thy goods? Has Bruin descended from the mountains to worry thy flocks? Or are thy stacks consumed, that thus you droop your eyelids to the path and move as by a hearse? And the farmer, drawing nigh, replied, My flocks unharmed gray sleek upon the hills. My stacks stand unconsumed. Yet is my spirit heavy, because my walks are lonely and my heart is sad and I come as one seeking counsel. Then answered the dame reprovingly, Out upon thee for a fusty, dreamy bachelor. Go take to thyself a wife. Then will thy walks be no more lonely, neither will thy heart be sad. But he, answering her sorrowfully, said, Mock me not, good woman, but look with pitying eyes upon me, and hearken to my voice. Behold, I am now well stricken in years. My body is stooping to the grave. My manners, like my hands, are rough. My blood, like my hair, is thin. And my teeth but shine in memories of the past. How, then, can I win maidens' hearts? Alas, on the contrary, they would giggling flee from before me. No hope for me remains. If I would wed, I needs must wed a squaw. And his countenance fell. Then was the crone exceedingly displeased, because he said, I needs must wed a squaw. And she answered him derisively, saying, Go to, ye speak as with the beak of a parrot, and with the understanding of a babe. Are ye studied in books, and not know the proverb, A golden snare will catch the wildest hare? Do not your stacks dot the veil below like an Egyptian camp? Are not your tanks brimming with wine, and your cribs grinning with corn? Do not your cattle graze upon an hundred hills? and your industrious laborers follow in the furrow? And are ye still afeard, O ye of doubting mind? Go get thee to thy chest, and take to thyself suitable coin, and hasten to that great city by the sea, whose churches point to heaven, and whose people bow to gold. There sojourn for a season, and make no delay in adorning thyself with precious stones." Put diamonds upon thy bosom, and rings upon thy fingers, and be zealous to stand in the hallways, and in the marketplaces, and in the houses of exchange. Seek to be observed of the people, and take heed that ye look upon all men as being thy servants, and let thy wealth be noised abroad. 
Then shall rise up in the house of mourning the widow of a month, and dry her weeping eyes. And then shall the maid of many summers lay aside her pets, to readjust her charms and disenter her smiles. Then shall the doting damsel, when her parent maketh fast the door, creep out some other way. And they all shall come trooping as with the voice of birds, to court thy smiles and thy manners, and thy years shall be as the silk of a spider in thy way. Then he was exceedingly glad because of the crone's advice, and he went away to his own home rejoicing. And on the morrow he arose before it was yet day, and saddled his mule, and journeyed to the great city by the sea, and lodged at the house of a friend. And he made haste to purchase diamonds, and rubies, and emeralds, and onyx stones, and sapphires, and put massive rings upon his fingers, and seals upon his chain. And even as the crone had directed, he scrupled not to stand in the hallways, and in the marketplaces, and in the houses of exchange, and sought to be observed of the people, and lived as a man having great possessions. And not many days after, a fair lady of that place, looking from her window, saw that the stranger shone like a midday sun, even so much that her heart was warmed. So she called the keeper of the house aside, and questioned him concerning the stranger, saying, Who is this stranger that lodges in thy house? Who beameth with jewels like the noonday sun? Make him known to me, for he is a choice and goodly man, and my heart warmeth for the stranger. Then answered the good man of the house, he is a sojourner from the valley of Berryessa, and, lo, he is a man of great possessions. And, moreover, take heed if he cometh in your way, that ye smile graciously upon him. For be it known unto you, he is a bachelor, who cometh amongst us, seeking a wife. Then the damsel was exceedingly moved. And when it came to pass that the stranger was introduced to her, she smiled graciously upon him. And she opened her mouth, and spake knowingly of barley, and of rye, and of corn in the ear, and of tares. And she also spake of four-footed beasts, of calves, and pigs, and goats, and cattle after their kind, and of fowls, of doves, and of ducks, and of geese, and of poultry after their kind. And she spoke also of cabbages, and of squashes, and of turnips, and of new-laid eggs, and of honey, and of buckwheat cakes, and of cheese, and of sausages. And, lo, the farmer's heart was touched, for she was comely to look upon, and wise withal. And he communed within himself, saying, Surely this maid would indeed be a great catch. She would make her husband's home cheerful, and in diverse ways pluck from the palm of life the festering thorns. Beshrew me, but I will lay strong siege to the damsel's heart. So he made haste to pull wide open the mouth of his purse, and loaded her with presents, for the damsel had found favor in his eyes, and he sought to win her. And not many days after he espoused the maiden, and there was great feasting and merry-making at that house, and the same was heard of the neighbors. And on the following day the farmer took her to his own home, in the valley of Berryessa, and they lived happily together for the space of many years. End of section 53「Section 54 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dana Olson. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. David Goyle, The Miller Man. "'Tis a strange cap. Twill give and take." and fit many heads. Old Volume Oh, will you hear with patient ear the story I'll relate, about man's infidelity, and learn his losses great? There lived a little miller once, who owned a tiny mill. While there was water in his pond, the stones were never still. For not a man, the country round, from Inyo to the bay, was closer to his business found than David Goyle they say. Let people pass at eve or noon or at the break of day, they'd see the dusty miller there and hear the hoppers play. And when the narrow stream run dry, the miller was at fault. The rack attack at mill reposed as silent as a vault. The little vicious artisan had spun his silken snare across the dusty flower shoot and silent gearing there, while in the elevator's cup was heard the mouse's squeak, and village children in the flume 
dryshod, played hide-and-seek. Said David to his wife one day, I think while water's low, I'll take a business trip to town, just for a week or so. I have not ground a speck of grain, tis now eight days or more, but sat and picked and picked the stones and dressed their surface o'er. Then turned his loving wife with much concern, said she, I hope while you are stopping there that you will careful be, and shun those dark and narrow streets where rogues do congregate, and look from out their low retreats as spiders watch and wait. Have not the city papers teemed with incidents, wherein some people proved not what they seemed, and took the stranger in? Then trust not smiles or cunning wiles, be careful where you tread, the very ground beneath your feet with pitfalls may be spread. There's not a trick, a trap, or plot, or scheme of any sort, from playing fine to drugging wine to which they'll not resort. Then leaned this little miller man, away back in his chair, and laughed until his anxious wife thought he would strangle there. Said he, You much amuse me, wife. Have you forgot, my dear, that I have traveled in my life and came from Jersey here? Or can you for a moment think your husband's mind is crude, or deem that I the cup would drink by temperance men tabooed? Those who can get the start of me in country or in town by Jove must early risers be, and you can put that down. For he was vain, this miller man, who thought his mind so vast. But look with me, and we will see how he comes out at last. In course of time he reached the town, to stop a week or more, and in a large hotel was lodged upon the second floor. If you should doubt my word on this, step over to the Grand. You'll find his name recorded there, and in a scrawling hand. It chanced, but hold, ear more I say, or sentence more you read. Are you prepared with me to stray wherever he may lead? You are. All right, then. On's the word. Again, my pen I hold. But blame me not if I should jot down facts he'd wish untold. It chanced while Dave was strolling down a certain crowded street. Its name at present slips my mind, or you'd have all complete. He met a stranger in the way, who brought him to a stand. He smiled upon him as in joy, and reached a friendly hand. He hailed the stranger. No, I think. The stranger him addressed. I would not do the fellow wrong. He's bad enough at best. The stranger spoke him very free. He came from Jersey, too. For he was sharp as one can be, he thought his folks he knew. There was a goyle. Yes, yes, I'm sure. How strange that we should meet. I've passed his house a thousand times and met him on the street. The miller scarce could credit this, but frank he seemed and fair. So he resolved to step inside and talk the matter there. There is a drug that bunco men do mingle with the wine. They give to country folks like Dave for what I can't divine. Perhaps those thoughtful rascals deem the noisiness of town might not allow refreshing sleep to wear their eyelids down. But whether this the cause or not, enough for you and me to know the wine that David got was not from mixtures free. Oh, for a club to brain the knave who could not see the snare. Oh, for a spade to dig his grave and dump him headlong there. The night has passed away at last, now hand in hand we'll scout. Now here, now there, with greatest care, to search that miller out. Thus side and side we first will glide, or letter, word, and line, until we stand that house beside where Dave was drinking wine. Oh, sight so painful to the eyes, it dims them like a fog. Within the house the miller lies, as still as any log. And not until the sun was high the bells in tower spoke, from out that deep lethargic sleep he wonderingly awoke. He gazed upon the papered wall, the ceiling overhead. But strange was paper, pictures all, the footboard of the bed. Swift as the lightning's flash destroys the spider's flimsy toil, suspicion traveled through the head of the awakening goyle. As starts the lodger from repose when flames burst in the door, so suddenly that miller rose and bounced upon the floor. One stride sufficed to reach the chair, on which his robes were cast, but seemed it to that man an age until he grasped them fast. No nimbler does the maiden's hand play o'er the keys of sound, than did that miller's fingers glide in searching pockets round. In vain he felt from tail to top, the thief had gone before, and harvested a 
golden crop, while he did dream and snore. Gone was his purse, and all within, a ring he valued more. Gone watch and chain, the diamond pin, that on his scarf he wore, his little wife with miser care, and warning words, no doubt, with her own hands affixed it there, the morning he set out. Enraged, that miller waltzed around, and like his hopper shook, and swore by all the grists he ground and all the tolls he took, that since the days when he was schooled in games of pitch and toss he never was so deeply fooled or so betrayed to loss. Ten times at least that pallid man strove to insinuate his nervous limbs into his pants, but failed to guide them straight. First hop, 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 to the left he went, now hop, 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 to the right, then hop, hop, backwards, till he rent his pants asunder quite. Now, partly in and partly out, he pokled here and there, now chassis up, now chassis back, then balanced o'er the chair. At last his toilet was complete, the yawning rent was pinned, and out into the narrow street he bolted like the wind. He traveled towards the city hall, and vowed at every bound that justice he would seek and have if justice could be found. The milkmen stopped their reckless drive, or dropped the cup and can, and leaned to catch a glimpse of Dave as down the street he ran. Old women early out to mass, when Dave went racking by, would jump aside to let him pass, then to each other cry, the saints protect us, see him go upon his wild career, a crazy creature well I know from some asylum near. Suffice it here to be explained before I close the tale. The justice David Goyle obtained was not of much avail. Go net the sea to catch the whale that did on Jonah dine. Go rake the land to find the stone that slew the Philistine. But seek not her whose hoodwinked eyes proclaim her dealings just. Well hangs her balance in the skies, for here on earth they'd rust. The rumbling stones are grinding now, the water's rushing down. But do not bet that Miller yet forgets his trip to town. For every waking hour he knows throughout the twenty-four, his scowling face and muttering shows he counts his losses o'er. There's not a time he laves his hands, but what that ring is missed. It's gold he gathered from the sands, a gift the amethyst. And oh, the query gives him pain. What is the time of day? For to the missing watch and chain the miller's mind will stray. And now no more upon his breast the brilliant diamond shines. Its luster falls in other halls, where flow the noxious wines. End of section 54section 55 of frontier humor in verse prose and picture this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org frontier humor in verse prose and picture by palmer cox hills up and heads down a stout old gentleman was enjoying the luxury of a salt water bath in the bay a short distance from where I was fishing. As he was a poor swimmer, notwithstanding he had a good supply of blubber, he attached a couple of inflated airbags to his shoulders by means of a string under his armpits. During his splashing about and his repeated endeavors to strike out like Cassius bearing Caesar from the troubled waters of the Tiber, the floats changed their position from his shoulders to his hips. This change he was not prepared for, and the result was distressing in the extreme. He immediately commenced sinking, as sailors say, by the head. In vain he would make long and desperate reaches toward the bottom, striving to anchor his feet in the soft sand. Just as his toes would touch the bed below, the buoyancy of the supports and undercurrent combined would prevail against him. Up would come his pedal extremities to the surface, and consequently down he would go head first, like a pearl diver, grasping at the pebbles beneath. After making a commotion in the water, like the screw of a tugboat, which brought small crabs and crawfish to the top with dismembered limbs, he would manage to get his head above water long enough to get a mouthful of fresh air, but 
retire immediately below to digest it. Some Italian fishermen running in from the offing with their day's catch sighted the old gentleman beating off the point. They mistook him for a devilfish or some other odd-looking inhabitant of the briny deep, disporting itself in the sheltered waters of the bay. Getting out their hooks and harpoons ready for action and changing course, they bore down with all possible speed in the direction of the singular monster. The wind was blowing quite fresh, and it wasn't long until the Italians came nigh enough to ascertain the real state of affairs and rescue the unfortunate swimmer from his perilous situation. The fishermen rolled the old gentleman over a keg they had in the boat for half an hour before his stomach could be empty of its washy load, and breathing rendered easy. When sufficiently relieved to admit of speech, the bather gave his rescuers to understand that in the future the tide might ebb and flow, be warm as milk new drawn from the cow and tranquil as a frozen pond, but a common bathtub would be rivers, lakes, yea, oceans to him during the remainder of his natural life. End of section 55, read by Julie Taylor, December 23rd, 2021. Section 56 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. The Bitter End. While in one of the interior counties today, I stood beside the graves of six members of one household. The father and his five sons all fell in one sanguinary family feud. It seems an ill feeling had long existed between the two families named respectively Frost and Coates. Though they frequently indulged in small skirmishes from which black eyes, bloody noses, or slit ears were the principal trophies borne away, they had never met when their full forces were under arms and for the happy hour that would bring about such a meeting each party looked forward with interest if not impatience a day arrived at last full of promise it was an election day each party expected the other out in strength with furbished arms and then prepared themselves accordingly they took to the street resolved that ere the bat had flown his cloister flight ere to black hecate's summons the shard-born beetle with his drowsy hums had rung night's yawning peal there would be done a deed of dreadful note two planets could not keep their motion in one sphere nor could two quarrelsome families move long in a small village or freely patronize the same groggeries without a collision Towards evening they met, some mounted and more on foot, and from low just amongst themselves, respecting each other's lack of prowess upon former occasions, the controversy soon reached the point of positive contradictions. As the lie direct is equivalent to a well-developed kick to your average fighting man, hostility soon commenced. The Coates family opened the engagement with a brisk fusillade and at the first fire the grey-bearded patriarch of the frost faction went down with all his imperfections on his head the firing now became general from rank to rank the volleyed thunder flew neutral parties fled from the street and for a time transacted business with closed doors the report of the firearms frightened the horse of a disinterested gentleman who was riding through the village and despite his efforts to control the animal it dashed directly between the belligerent parties the fighting men however did not slacken fire on his account but blazed away without seeming to notice or care whether the agitated stranger went down in the general melee or not fortunately the gentleman escaped injury but it was certainly more by chance than by good guidance it is said so rapid was the fire that a steady blaze seemed issuing from the muzzle of their weapons when the smoke of the battle raised five of the coates family were lying dead on the other side frost and one of his sons were killed and a son-in-law mortally wounded p 
People say the funeral was a saddening spectacle. Amongst the mourners were mothers, daughters, sisters, and wives. But the end was not yet. Before the grass had taken root upon the graves, the ground was again broken, and another victim of the malignant feud was hidden from the sight of friends and foes. The fires of hate still smoldered, and within a year another one of the Coates family was put oars to combat while going one night from the village to his ranch. He was seen leaving for home on horseback at nine o'clock, but about ten his horse ran masterless into the farmyard. The man was found lying by the roadside, dead, a bullet having passed through his head. Suspicion reverted to the Frost family, but no proof could be brought to establish their guilt. The public finger still points toward them, however, and doubtless will continue so to do for many a day or until the mystery is cleared up. End of section 56, read by Julie Taylor, January 18, 2022. Section number 57 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Trip to the Interior A flying trip into the interior has not favorably impressed me. There were too many mosquitoes, too many graybacks. It is too far from civilization and too nigh the sun. I stopped overnight in a small city, and the first thing that attracted my attention on entering the place was the pale and sickly look of the inhabitants. This I attributed to the fever and ague, the hot weather, and impure river water which they drink. I was credibly informed by several parties that their pallor was owing to the quantity of blood that is nightly extracted from their veins by the mosquitoes. From the number of these pests infesting the place, it has taken the name of the Mosquito City. Those people who cannot indulge in such a luxury as mosquito bars have to sleep during the day. They sit up nights and wage war against their ferocious enemies with tobacco smoke, burning leather, wet towels, or any other weapon to which they can conveniently resort. To be stung by a black hornet or a scorpion is bad. To be bitten by a tarantula or rattlesnake is worse. But to be punctured to the bone by the bugle of one of these mosquitoes is terrible. They are enormous insects. When flying through the air, they are as discernible as thistledown or even hummingbirds. The sharp tube through which they sap their victim's blood is fully three-quarters of an inch long and resembles a cambric needle. This they steadily and unhesitatingly press into the flesh until they either strike a bone or their forehead prevents them from doing deeper injury. Towards evening they rise with pining maws from the low, damp land around the city, innumerable as the blades of green that carpet the vale of San Joaquin. And as they close in upon the devoted inhabitants, their blended cries swell in pitch and compass until the sound resembles the impassioned tone of a fish peddler's horn. I stopped at a hotel in the lower part of the city, and before retiring for the night looked carefully about the room. As few mosquitoes were in sight, I concluded to sleep without using the bar. Congratulating myself on being assigned a room where so few of the common enemy of man were lying in wait, I extinguished the light and turned in. Scarce was I stretched upon the couch when, at once there rose such hungry yells from every point the compass tells, that I lost no time in striking a light and adjusting the netting. I now saw them emerging from every conceivable hiding place. Trooping they came from behind picture frames, from under the bureau, out of vases and old empty bottles. They were climbing and clambering and pitching towards me with energy. I noticed a steady stream of them shooting out of the closet through the keyhole, with such velocity that they went warping halfway across the apartment before they could check themselves sufficiently to tack around and dive for the bed. They had all they bargained for to get safely through that keyhole, too. There was not much spare room, I can tell you. Before the great pressure from behind kept up by the others anxious to get through, many a large fellow would have been sticking in that opening yet. 
But once they got started in, there was no backing out. No, indeed. On, on was the cry, and they pressed forward with a rush, often sacrificing a leg or wing by the maneuver. But they didn't seem to care for the loss of one of those members so long as their bill remained intact. Deprive a mosquito of one wing, and he will seem to laugh at you while he makes the other do double duty. Brush off one leg, and he will shake the remaining ones triumphantly in your face. But damage his bill, and you demoralize him at once. He becomes immediately disheartened. He loses caste among his companions and confidence in himself. He wobbles about here and there to no purpose like an old bachelor. You deprive him at once of his song and his supper. You can hardly picture to yourself a more dejected insect, one more hopelessly down in the mouth. He withdraws to the ceiling or curtain and looks with envious eyes upon his associates gorging themselves while his poor digestive organs are drying through inactivity. We would be inclined to pity him in this sad condition were it not that we hold the whole insect race as coming under our ban. The whine of disappointment, long, loud, and quavering, that went up when they ascertained I was protected, will always remain a fixture in my memory. As they closed around the bed, so numerous were they, their flight was actually impeded. Down they settled with locked wings on the bar above me, thick as snowflakes around some old uprooted pine by the Madawaska. I had long heard of the mosquitoes of this locality, and was prepared for an introduction to formidable insects, but found them even worse than I expected. Discouraged by the mosquitoes, I fled to a neighboring city, only to find that it is the stronghold of fever and ague. In other parts, it may be more active for a few months of the year, but here it stays by the people, like their consciences. The winds may rise and comb the valley until the very grass is lifted by the roots and borne to the mountains. The sun may grow weary of well-doing, enter Capricorn, and for a season be hid. Or the rains may descend until the narrow slough, by which the city is situated, becomes a wide-spreading lake through which ships of the line might plow with safety, but the chills and fever stays by them still. There's no shaking it off. It holds its grip like a mortgage. The tender limbs of the newborn babe and the pithless bones of ripe old age shiver alike in its awful grasp. The citizens of this sad place are a serious, matter-of-fact people who seem to think it was not the original intention that men should spend any time in laughter, for they indulge very little in witticisms or humor. A good joke is often lost upon them, and the perpetrator of a bad one places himself in jeopardy. A person who attempts a pun that does not carry its point before it like a swordfish is in danger of being immediately seized from behind and hurried in the direction of the insane asylum. While stopping in this delightful place, I visited the small theater of which the inhabitants are justly proud, and shall never forgive myself if I fail to mention the orchestra that discoursed most eloquent music on that occasion. Whether the regular musicians of the theater were on a strike for higher wages, and the manager was obliged to bring in outside talent, I did not learn. But certain it was, the sole instrument that kept the audience awake between the acts, the night in question, was a large piece, a bassoon, I think, filled and manipulated by a stout spectacled representative from the Faderland. In addition to the musician's frog-shaped body, which of itself would doubtless have attracted my attention, he had a head that was truly a study. To say he was bald is to make a remark that would be applicable to about two-thirds of the gentlemen in the theater, but to say that his head was as smooth, as shiny, and devoid of hair, from the eyebrows to the very nape of the neck, as a billiard ball is hardly doing the head justice. It seemed actually peeled. Besides, it was of a conical form, and as I looked upon it, I thought what an advantage it would have been to me in my younger days if I had had some such thing in the barnyard, over which to break pumpkins for the cattle. I am certain a pumpkin or squash brought down upon such an object with well-centered precision would fly into as many fragments as the Turkish Empire. I was not the only person whose attention was arrested by that marvelous development. If a diamond the size of a rutabaga had suddenly flashed, the audience would scarcely have turned with greater haste to contemplate its beauties than they did to regard that head the instant the hat was removed. 
It had such a smooth and polished surface that the actors, as they passed back and forth upon the stage, were mirrored out upon it in Lilliputian proportions. The large globe light was reflected so perfectly upon that glossy scalp that it shed a positive light to remote corners of the auditorium, and a person would look first at the head, then up at the globe, and then down at the head again, and then hardly be prepared to decide from which object the original rays of light proceeded. The musician had one original turn which afforded me much amusement. At the commencement of a tune he would sit facing the stage, which was proper enough, but as he proceeded he would turn by degrees until he was sitting full face to the audience. The gods in the gallery seemed to consider it their especial privilege to pelt his head with peanuts, and when one would happen to hit, which was quite often, it would bound and skip from the polished object in a manner that would invariably bring down the house. Standing as it did in bold relief from the dark panelwork and drapery behind, it was a most excellent and inviting mark. Man though I am, with the sobering cares of life closing gloomily around me, I actually regretted I couldn't try a shot at the old codger's head myself. It has been said, the king of shadows loves a shining mark. If this is so, how that musician managed to escape the arrows so long is more than I can understand. For many a year, he certainly has presented a target worthy the whole archery of the realm of death. The evening's entertainment was made up of selections from Shakespeare's tragedies, Macbeth and Othello. The principal actor, whose name I forget, was the oddest and hungriest looking player I ever saw stalk across a stage, or foam and fret in histrionic effort. He looked as though he had been dangling from the lowest spoke of fortune's wheel for the last twenty years. His makeup was terrible also, and after I learned the performance was not an intentional burlesque, I could hardly keep from hooting whenever he appeared. As the evening advanced, however, he warmed up considerably. When he appeared as the murderous thane, moving toward the apartments of his slumbering victim, huskily repeating the thrilling lines, The bell invites me, I go and it is done. He looked every inch a villain, and the little theater rung again with the clapping and clattering of the enthusiastic audience. In Othello, his dress was even worse than in Macbeth. In the scene, where he smothers Desdemona, he was barefooted and looked supremely ridiculous. I would have given double the amount I paid for admission for the glorious privilege of kicking him across the stage. The customary pitcher-shaped lamp which the Moor usually bears in his hand upon this occasion and to which he alludes when he says, If I quench thee, thou flaming minister, I can again thy former light restore, should I repent me, was not procurable. The tragedian, therefore, carried a candle stuck in the neck of a large wine bottle, and under his left arm he carried a pillow about the size of a single-bed mattress, with which to put out the light of the fair Desdemona, who was lying upon a lounge at the left of the stage. I was too great a lover of Shakespeare to sit longer by and witness the terrible butchery. I rose and left the house, and as I passed out, the pitying glances of the audience informed me that they didn't understand the real state of affairs, but thought I was taken suddenly ill. I was ill at ease, and had been, during the entire evening. On the way down the next morning, an overland passenger made my acquaintance on the cars, and while conversing about the long snowsheds and tunnels he had passed, I informed him of the long tunnel through which we would pass on leaving the valley. "'Are we near that tunnel now?' he asked. "'Yes,' I answered. "'We will enter it in about fifteen minutes.' "'Is the tunnel dark?' he inquired. "'Yes, very dark,' I replied. Ten shades darker than a cloudy midnight.' "'Ah, oh, by Jinko!' he cried. "'That's just the thing for me. I forgot to put on a clean shirt last night, and I hate like the deuce to arrive at my destination looking as I do now.' Do you think a fellow would have time to put a shirt on while passing through it? He continued earnestly. Oh, he might, I answered, if he had it ready before reaching the tunnel. Well, I'll try a pull anyway, he said as he took down the valise from a rack overhead to select the garment. I'll have it all ready for a hoist, he continued. And if I don't climb into it faster than a spark into a chimney, I'm not what I think I am, that's all. And with a look of determination, he went to a seat in the rear of the car, 
and for a time seemed busily engaged in preparing for the great change. I had made an error in regard to the time that would elapse before we reached the tunnel, and the result was we reached it before he was fully prepared for it. Into it the locomotive plunged with a wild scream. Gloom closed around the passengers, hiding the nearest objects from their view. On we sped. The rattling of the trucks told us rail after rail was passed, but still a darkness that might be felt enveloped the rushing train. Those who were conversing, as the car entered the tunnel, stopped as though the icy hand of death had been laid upon their throat. The half-uttered word rusted upon the tongue, and the tunnel, like a long dash, stretched between the parts of a sentence. I thought of the passenger, doubtless by this time struggling into his linen, and turned around in my seat facing him. With considerable interest I waited the return of light. At last it came glimmering far ahead. Plainer and plainer the objects grew around, and, first and most noticeable of all, was the tall form of the passenger from over the mountains, leaning over the seat in front of him, enveloped in his snowy linen, his hands stuck in the sleeves at the elbows, and his head vainly endeavoring to shoot through the opening at the neck, which in his haste he had neglected to unbutton. Notwithstanding his head was enveloped, he was conscious that light had dawned upon the scene and his struggles and frantic thrusts became painful to look upon. Finally the fastening at the neck gave way, and his face came through the opening red as a pickled beet. Fortunately, most of the passengers were sitting with backs toward him and, but a few witnessed the terrible struggle. One old lady, however, got nearly frightened out of her wits. When objects began to grow visible around her, she became suddenly apprised of the startling fact that a white figure was bent over her, with outstretched wings fanning the air, and she very naturally came to the conclusion that an angel was about to gather her to her father's. The ashen look of the poor old body as she stole a glance over her shoulder at the white object behind showed that however fitted she was, in respective years, for the final taking off, she was anything but willing to start upon such an uncertain journey. End of section 57 Read by Lisa Gibson, Lincoln, Montana, December 21st, 2021「Section 58 of Frontier Humour in Verse, Prose and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humour in Verse, Prose and Picture by Palmer Cox. Hunting with a Vengeance that man received his charge from me shakespeare my friend butcher gale has been quail hunting under difficulties his case is a sad one and as i feel in somewhat of a rhyming mood at present i will invoke the gods and with eyes in fine frenzy rolling proceed to state his case in verse Come, leave your hog, said Lawyer Boggs, to red-faced butcher Gale. We'll take a day across the bay, and slather lots of quail. Soon guns were gone, and bags of shot, with powder, wads, and caps, and up the canyons, dry and hot, tramped those two city chaps. Old Lawyer Boggs had borrowed dogs, well worth their weight in gold. The setter had a double nose, and it of her was told that she could scent two different ways as easy as you please, while one nose smelled along the ground, the other sniffed the trees. The pointer had peculiar traits, his power of scent was small, but if he saw three birds at once, he pointed at them all for while his nose would indicate where one poor piper sat his tail straight as a marlin spike would point another at then if a third one raised its head preparing for the air that dog would balance on three legs and aim the other there with such a pair the quick to scare and then retrieve the dead 
the hunter's sole remaining care was how to scatter lead they traversed gorge and gully low and many a slippery height and though their feet did heavier grow their game bags still were light while roving o'er the mountain side it seemed that every quail within the country limits wide was piping in the vale but when they would forsake the hills and in the valleys dive it seemed as if the heights around with bevies were alive Boggs had one fault from childhood brought more marked with age it grew he never failed to shut both eyes whilst he the trigger drew this plan might do if led he through at barns or target rings but frightened quail when turning tail are visionary things and let him sight quick as he might space still would grow between and bang would go the shower of woe just where the bird had been tis said those knowing canines knew while men were taking aim whether or not twould be their lot to gather in some game so when they saw bog shut both eyes when e'er the piece he fired they dropped upon their hams and howled and from the hunt retired and he as soon could stir a stump to walk upon its roots as from a sitting posture coax the two disgruntled brutes wide was their aim and wild the game and when such facts do yoke there's many a shot goes off i wot brings nothing but the poke the grains were sown the fields were mown the crops proved rather thin oft was the raking summons thrown but slow the heads came in at last while gale just in advance was clambering o'er some logs he got a charge of shot by chance from the excited bogs then was there rustling there a spell and as you may suppose from out the shaking chaparral linked oaths profusely rose boggs dropped his gun and forward run with apprehension bleached and his poor lame excuse begun when he the butcher reached a splendid shot i quite forgot precisely where you stood the birds flew fast were nearly past behind the screen of wood i must let go or lose a show of bagging three or four and in my mind you were behind until i heard you roar he cursed the logs and kicked the dogs and wished the quail on toast but that did not take out the shot which then was needed most the doctors who had dressed his wounds have to his friends declared that though he is a sorry sight his sight is not impaired there is a moral this within and shape the times to suit but lest it should appear too thin here's this advice to boot ne'er venture on a hunting cruise with any green galoot who shuts both eyes whene'er he tries a flitting game to shoot end of section fifty eight recording by alan mapstone section fifty nine of frontier humor in verse prose and picture this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox The Art Gallery Hearing that a large collection of paintings were on exhibition at the Art Gallery, I visited the rooms this afternoon and was agreeably surprised to discover that quite a number were by eminent artists. It is pleasant to gaze upon an old picture that has come down through the dust of ages, so I made it a point to employ the hour at my disposal in sketching several subjects most admired by the visitors. I did not learn the author of the large picture from which the first of my sketches was taken, but was assured that it came from the hand of an old master. I would have thought it a representation of Cleopatra before Caesar if the female had been running toward the man 
instead of away from him. A gentleman present who examined the painting closely gave it as his opinion that the couple represented Tarquin and Lucrece. He informed me he had visited many art galleries of the old world and found several paintings which had been copied from this masterpiece by artists who paid homage to such creative genius. As he claimed to be something of a connoisseur, his supposition was probably a correct one, though he was not able to thoroughly account for the singular-looking bonnet that shadowed the head of the prancing Lucrece. It is certainly anything but a Roman headdress, and why it should be dangling from her royal top is something for critics to comment on and antiquarians to inquire into. Another little sketch attracted great attention, especially from the ladies, whose love for the beautiful is only excelled by their love for the good. It was entitled Love's Young Dream. I regret I am not able to give the artist's name. I could not get near enough to decipher the signature, owing to the crowd of ladies admiring the beautiful gem. The members of the graphic club were sketching. Accepting an invitation from one, I stepped into their room to see them draw. Quite a number of artists were present. The famous marine painter was there, who loves to paint the vessel going before the wind, when in its might it takes the ruffian billows by the top. It was pleasant to watch his pencil pile up the yeasty waves at will. It was also interesting to lean over the landscape painter's shoulder and see the branches sprout from his grand old oaks, against whose trunks it would seem that storms of centuries had spent their force. It was no less pleasant or interesting to perceive the horns shoot from the animal painter's cows. As the creature grows under his active pencil, we may be inclined to think she will be of the mooly species, and never shake a gory horn above a prostrate victim. But alas, a few hasty but well-directed strokes, and she stands forth more formidable than the armed rhinoceros or rampant unicorn. Then we hold our breath as we see the pencil slide away to some other locality before a tail is attached to the body, and inwardly wonder whether the artist has forgotten to bestow upon her that graceful adjunct, or is intentionally giving us a new species of cattle. We heave a sigh of relief when the pencil returns, after a brief skirmish along the ribs, to bestow upon the cow that terminal appendage, at once a scourge for milkmaids and a swing for dogs. End of section 59. Read by J.P. Watson, Fairly, Vermont, December 2021. Section 60 of Frontier Humor and Verse, Prose and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Doc D. L. Martin. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose and Picture by Palmer Cox. A Rolling Stone. This afternoon, while climbing a steep hill that overlooks the bay in company with a gentleman named Stone, I saw an illustration of the old maxim A Rolling Stone Gathers No Moss. We had almost completed the ascent when Stone's feet slipped from under him, and striking upon his side, he commenced a rapid descent. About four hundred feet of steep grade stretched before him without let or hindrance. I saw at a glance he was bound to pass over every inch of the space before he stopped. Onward he went, gathering speed as he proceeded and catching wildly around him at every revolution. But, as there was nothing growing upon the barren slope but stunted grass or brittle moss, his efforts to slow speed were in vain. After he had made about ten revolutions, his hat came off, and for a short time the race between him and his tile was truly interesting. It would have been an even bet, which would first reach the fence at the bottom of the hill. After making about half the distance, however, the hat swung in ahead of him. Whether it was the wind acted upon it I couldn't tell, but Stone overhauled it 
and passing over it materially injured its form as a roller by giving it an oblong shape and soon left the crushed hat wobbling far behind. He turned neither to the right nor to the left, but rolled as straight down the hill as a saw log down the bank of a river into a mill pond. Goats, nibbling in the vicinity, paused in their repast and looked pitifully at the gentleman as he went tumbling by them and evidently congratulated themselves on being goats that feel at home on the steepest hillside that nature can present to their hoofs. When, in his mad career, my friend Stone would reach some intercepting shelf, he would bounce about three feet into the air and continue down the incline with increased velocity. Nor did he stop his brilliant course until he brought up whack against the fence. Fortunately, he was unhurt, but was so dizzy that everything was turning around him for an hour afterwards. He declares that though he should live until he becomes so old as to forget the way to his mouth, he has taken his last look at the city and the surrounding bay from the summit of that hill, and when we think of his last descent from that high altitude, we can hardly wonder at the declaration. End of section 60section 61 of frontier humor in verse prose and picture this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org frontier humor in verse prose and picture by palmer cox writing in the streetcars a chills a man ye taken notes and faith he'll print it burns the greater portion of this day I have spent riding in the street cars. I find it is quite a pleasant way of passing a few leisure hours. Neither is it an extravagant way of entertaining oneself. On figuring up, I find, by choosing the longest routes, it costs just seven and one quarter cents per hour. This is certainly reasonable. There is always something amusing to look at as you pass along. There stands the nervous old lady upon the street corner. She wishes to ride and endeavors to signal the driver and prepare for embarking at one and the same time. She proves the truth of the old saying that a person may get too many irons in the fire. In her eagerness to attract the attention of the driver or conductor, she is not aware that in lifting her skirts she has elevated one or two thicknesses more than she intended or than is at all necessary poor old lady she does indeed present a picture that might well attract the artistic eye we in more becoming order turn our eyes from the singular spectacle and study the advertisements ranged around for our special benefit she emits a short quick cry half whoop and half squeal and signals repeatedly to do with the inevitable umbrella is brought into requisition and flourished around her head as though she was warding off a detachment of aggressive wasps. She gives the conductor a look of surprise, if not anger, because he completes the curve before stopping to take her up. The old lady means business and has never got it through her head that conductors have rights which she is bound to respect. She no doubt believes that on all occasions and at all times he ought to seize the strap and stop the car as suddenly as he would a clock by grasping the pendulum. Then there are the fashions which we can study without having to pay exorbitant prices for seats in the theaters. It is even better than to go to a fashionable church. Besides the advantages which a ride in the streetcar offers us in the way of studying the fashions, we often see strange sights well calculated to awaken humor. There, for instance, we encounter the sleepy passenger who, in charity, let us hope, is 
drowsy through loss of rest rather than loss of reason. Let us hope he is some physician who has been attending to his patients or a minister of the gospel who has spent the night by the bedside of some sinking penitent or supervisor who, while his constituents have been snugly dreaming away their troubles, has been legislating and growing hoarse declaiming for the public good. Doctor or supervisor, as the case may be, it is evident he is sleepy and cares not who knows it. Otherwise, he would pick up his hat, which has fallen off, before it has twice been stepped on by passengers staggering through the car while it is in motion. With a persistency truly amusing, he tips in the direction of some old lady who apparently hates men, especially when excessive drowsiness makes them familiar. He, however, is oblivious of her likes or dislikes, even of her presence, it would seem. He bobs towards her until his disheveled forelock actually tickles her under the ear, which sensation causes her to start suddenly and look around so quickly that a person must think the movement gave her a crick in the neck and her subsequent rubbing of the cords below the ear would seem to bear out the supposition as correct. Then, as we ride along, we can see the bold policeman standing by the corner of a building. He is earnestly looking down a narrow lane, taking notes, perhaps, but more likely watching the progress of a fight and wisely waiting until all the pistols are discharged before venturing to arrest any of the belligerent parties. He looks as though it would not take much longer reflection or many more shots to make him forego that duty in toto and turn around to arrest the poor Chinese vegetable peddler who, with his basket pole upon his shoulder, is trotting along upon the sidewalk and thereby violating one of the city's ordinances. While hustling the prisoner to the station house, he would escape performing more unpleasant and risky business. He is in the right of it, too, when a person comes right down to reason the case. The policeman may have a family dependent on him for support, or it may be upon the very stroke of the hour when his duty for the day will cease, and he can saunter to his home, leaving his successor to rush in and stay the slaughter. It may be argued that the policeman is paid to take prisoners and consequently to take chances. This is true, but he is not paid to commit suicide. For a broad man like him to move down a narrow lane up which the bullets are whistling can hardly be considered anything short of it. Oh, he is a cunning fellow, I tell you, and revolves the matter carefully in his mind before taking action. He has been too long a resident of the city and too long a member of the Star Brigade not to know that the city can better afford to lose two or three indifferent citizens than it can one able and efficient policeman. We turn from the policeman to contemplate the blooming blonde who comes bouncing in with her poodle dog in her arms. After she is seated, she amuses some of the passengers and displeases more by the affectionate name she lavishes upon the little watery-eyed pet in her lap. Some of the passengers would doubtless like to be the dog, and others would like to be a distemper that they might legally kill the cur. She temporarily ends her caresses by repeatedly kissing its cold, peaked nose to the infinite disgust of the majority of the passengers who, rather than witness a repetition of the silly act, look out of the windows and become suddenly interested in the construction of the buildings or fences along the route. And then there is the impatient passenger who is either limited in time or sense, probably in both. He foolishly attempts to leave the car while it's in motion in order to save a few moments. Immediately afterwards, he wishes he hadn't and sits down with considerable feeling to think over his rashness. There was a time, no doubt, when he could jump on and off a car like a newsboy. 
but that time has evidently gone by. When we consider the roughness of his seat and the unexpected manner in which he settled on it, we have to acknowledge that he sits with considerable grace. However, as he has lost time instead of gaining it by the action, he will perhaps try to catch a better hold of the old rascal's forelock the next time he is running past him. End of section 61. Read by Julie Taylor, January 15th, 2022. Section 62 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Paul Marcox. Simon Rand. No poet, however gifted, can get along without his muse any better than a navigator can without his compass. If the goddess is not at his elbow, the lyre hangs mute upon the wall and the pen corrodes in the ink, then what can the poor limited rhymer do without a muse to inspire him? As mine is at present leaning over the back of my chair in a very encouraging manner, I will strike my harp and lay the following heart-rendering tale before the world in verse. First gossip, was she false? Second gossip, a false as her teeth, old volume. In Siskiyou, a tanner lived, whose name was Simon Rand. He loved the miller's daughter there, Anita Hildebrand. The maiden loved the tanner too, at least the maid so said, and she the happy day had named, the parson would them wed. The golden day dreams lengthened as the season shorter grew, and Cupid slung his bow across his shoulder and withdrew. A golden-pointed arrow lay embedded in each heart. The little god conjectured they could never live apart. Fire will test the iron safe, and powder prove the mine, and tempest try the ship at sea, the woodman's axe the pine. And gold will sound the human heart, the maiden's love it tries. It is the plummet weight that proves how deep affection lies. One Jacob Tau a rival came to darken Simon's days. His clothes were fine, his purse a mine. He drove a span of bays. The fair Anita was his mark. He deftly played his hand. He turned her giddy head around and love from Simon ran. The tanner saw his dove-proof doll and scarce believed his eyes. But change was there in look and air and in her curt replies. He called one night in hopes he might back his affianced win. Word came by Sis, an old game this. Anita was not in. But ah, how keen are lovers' eyes when rivals are round. A glossy hat hung in the hall. He reached it with a bound. See, my child, a pleasing sight, said he with a ghastly smile. For into fraction, into might, I'll smash the villain's tile. He seized it and he squeezed it too. He bolted on the floor. He thumped it and he jumped it and he kicked it through the door. So through the gate he then escaped. And he was heard to say, By all the hides that I have scraped with life I'll make away. Next morning he was missing and the neighbors thought it queer. For he at work was ever found throughout the busy year. Noon came, but brought not Simon back, and then their wonder grew into a fear that he had done what he had sworn to do. A search was instituted, and all work was at a stand, for weak and stout alike turned out to search for Simon Dran. Across the mill pond and the flume, the grappling drag they drew, they scanned the trees and probed the wells the little village through. But tell or tidings none they found, so all the search gave o'er, and sat them down to talk and smoke around the tavern door. When Teamster Joe picked up a hoe that by his side was laid, and turning round to farm a pound, he slapped his thigh and said, I'll stake my strongest pair of mules against Mole Benson's cat. That Simon Rand, the missing man, 
lies dead in his own vat. No face was there, beard hid or bare, like tawny hue or dark, but on the instant plainly showed the weight of that remark. To feet they sprung, both old and young, and down the shortest road, by silly still in Burl's mill, to Simon's shop they strode. One pace in front leaned Parson Lunt, who let his dinner stand, and joined the throng that surged along in search of Simon Rand. Across his shoulder, stooped with the aged, he poised his garden rake, and those had need to urge their speed who followed in his wake. Then side and side, with equal stride, pressed Joe and Jasper Lane. Next, Elder Chase kept even pace with stout old Sidney Bain. Then two and two and three and three and sometimes four abreast, with hose and hooks and thoughtful looks, come clattering on the rest. The place was gained, all eyes were strained upon the brimming vat, but not an eye in depths could spy or pierce its scum of fat. A fearful place, said Elder Chase, as down he dipped his pole. No lover woe could make him throw himself in such a hole. A man would choose a hempen noose, a pistol, drug, or knife, if he designed through troubled mind to make away with life. A silent group, they kneel and stoop and shove their poles around, now left, now right, till all afraid. One cried, I've something found. It's him, I know, I must let go. I dare not see his face. When coming from the depths below, will someone take my place? Then Parson Lunt stepped to the front and clasped his hand in prayer and cried, We thank thee for his dust, his soul in mercy spare. Then took the pole from Selby's hand, who quickly sought the rear, yet dodged and peeped his best to see if Rand indeed was there. Up rose the heavy burdened hook. That's him, a dozen cried. But when they took a second look, it proved a brindled hide. Then impuous Brown, the village clown, turned from the bat aside and laughed until the tears ran down his cheeks as though he cried. Still round he went with body bent, his face one endless grin, because the parson praised the Lord, then raised the heifer's skin. The tolls once more sink as before to scrape the bottom slow. Another mass they strike and pass. It rolls along below. I have him now, cried Dennis Tow, the blacksmith's helping hand, while down his face in rapid pace the perspiration ran. With mighty grip and backward tip, stout Dennis manned the pole, which bent as though twould snap and go, and how would backwards roll. And woe is me, that tanner man, and woe is me, that maid, and woe is me, that staring group around that vat afraid. The hold was good, the pole had stood, and up the hook was drawn. The poor discarded Simon ran dead as a pickled pawn, and lo, a great cast iron weight fast to one leg was tied, which as he rose did oscillate and swing from side to side. Upon a door his form they bore back slowly through the town, and still behind them left a trail where dripped the water down. For every step fresh showers drew down from that litter bare, from garments soaked quite through and through, from mouth and nose and hair. Twere sad to tell a funeral show that in that town was seen, enough to know that Simon Lowe lies where the grass is green. Anita now is Mrs. Tow, and servants on her wait, and dogs with uninviting growl drive beggars from her gate. And Simon's shop has gone to wreck, no bark is needed now, no more before the greasy door lie horns of ox or cow. But on the anniversary of that distressful night, the superstitious people say within it burns a light, and there the tanner may be seen, his thin arms shining bare, bent o'er the bench as though at work, fast scraping off the hair. Anon slow rising from his toil, a woeful sigh he gives, and gazes long towards the hill where false Anita lives. Then turning round he gives a bound, and when he crushed the hat, 
and fastening to his leg a weight, he leaps into the vat, and with him goes the wondrous light that shed its ghostly ray, and dismal darkness wraps the place until the dawn of day. End of section 62, read by Julie Taylor, January 15, 2022. Section 63 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. The Value of a Collar. Dear me, what a terrible dodging life the poor city cur leads, to be sure, whose owner does not consider him of sufficient importance to warrant taking out a license. His excursions must necessarily be limited. He never dares to bark in the daytime, and now I think of it, that may account for his howling all night. To bark between the hours of seven in the morning and six in the evening would be equivalent to running his head into the pound-keeper's lariat. He knows it, too, the rascal, and hardly indulges in a yelp, even if his tail is trod upon. I have always noticed that the eyes of the cur that wears no collar, which would entitle him to the freedom of the city, protrude from the sockets much further than the optics in the head of the licensed animal. I have noticed this fact and pondered over it, striving not a little to arrive at some satisfactory conclusion in regard to the matter. It may be that this strange protrusion is brought about by the continual strain while on the lookout for the pound-keeper or his sneaking aids. Another peculiarity about the unlicensed cur his eyes are invariably the color of tobacco juice. Why are they so, you probably inquire? Be patient, and I will tell you. It is the result of the burning envy continually agitating his breast and adding a bloodier luster to his orbs. How must envy consume his very vitals when he beholds his younger brother, perhaps? trotting forth into the street, his neck encircled with the leather zone that ensures him respect and immunity from assault, while he must cower behind the ash barrel and wait for night to temporarily shield him from insult and injury. The old adage is hardly applicable to his case. He has no day, but he has his night, however, and he would be a fool not to make the most of it. How trifling a thing will draw the line between him and his licensed brother. One white foot, perhaps, a spot too many on the head, or want of one above the tail may have cursed him through the length and breadth of his existence. If he lives, it must be by his wits. Every man's hand or boot seems to be against him. A licensed dog can stretch lazily upon the sidewalk and oblige the pedestrians to go around him rather than take the chances of stepping over or stirring him up with a kick. It is dangerous business, this waking up a dog with your boot. You may take him in a time when not in the mood for permitting such familiar demonstrations. Perhaps he may be hungry, and since the dogs devoured poor painted Jezebel, their weakness for human flesh will occasionally make itself manifest. I, who have been thrice vaccinated by a canine tooth, and it took each time, too, speak knowingly on this subject. Now, as I gaze out upon the street, I mark the slow approach of the pound-keeper's dingy cart. Ever and anon it comes to a sudden halt, and skirmishers are deployed on each side, to search the alleyways and lanes along the route. Hark! What cry is this that comes quavering forth from that shaky prison? A bark! 
no never a bark but a quavering bleat from the pale lips of a poor old goat alas poor goat it too was evidently straying about unlawfully in someone's garden perhaps or stripping the posters off the fence before the paste was dry or the bill sticker a block away and in consequence he is now occupying a position that however exalted it may be in one sense makes him feel very ill at ease all the same his fellow prisoners are dogs of every breed under the sun there is no discrimination in that moving prison no separate cells the full-blood setter pup fares no better than the worthless poodle that couldn't smell a quail a yard distant unless it was roasting the big sour surly mastiff with bloodshot eyes and pendant jowl who long has been the acknowledged champion of a block and in his day lacerated many a paw hasn't even a growl to offer but crouches side by side with the poor maimed and mongrel cur that for years has been racking through life on three legs still the dismal-looking cart jolts along attracting the attention of the passing crowds still the villainous-looking aides who flank the vehicle trail their ready lariats and dart exploring glances into every nook and corner and as i gaze i marvel to see how quickly the outlaws get a knowledge of its approach and stand not upon the order of their going but precipitately leave for backyards and kitchens end of section sixty three read by bill mosley lano county texas u s a december twenty twenty one Section 64 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose and Picture by Palmer Cox. Quaint Epitaphs while strolling through an old cemetery this afternoon i was surprised at the number of quaint epitaphs there to be found for a while i almost imagined myself rummaging among the old time worn tombstones in some english or welsh burying ground many are written in verse especially on the stones erected during a certain period extending over about ten years which proves that during these years the city had a tombstone poet among her citizens. He was an odd genius, whoever he was, this graveyard rhymer. One peculiarity seems to have been his coupling with the epitaph, a brief account of the manner in which the deceased party was taken off. The first inscription, which attracted my notice as odd, was chiseled upon a large marble slab which leaned over the spot where a party who had borne the ancient and honorable name of smith rested from his labors the obituary ran thus smith ran to catch his fatted hog and carried the knife around he slipped and fell the hog is well but smith is underground this stanza should be introduced into public schools and adopted as a morning chant to impress upon the mind of the pupils the importance of a person's having his wits about him death brought about by such gross carelessness as smith showed is to say the least first cousin to suicide and doubtless there will come a time when smith's case will be inquired into under a large oak tree on the south side i came upon a tombstone which bore no date but which had evidently been erected many years the fence which once enclosed the grave had nearly disappeared nothing remained except a few rotten stakes protruding through the grass what once had been a mound was now a hollow which told the mute gazer decay had done its worst 
Through a rank growth of weeds and briars, a few pale neglected flowers raised their delicate faces, like virtues struggling heavenward through the retarding throng inhabiting this naughty world. The headstone was evidently erected before the poet's day, and he who erected it had composed the epitaph. It is more than likely he chiseled it also, as the letters were ill-shaped and irregular, and looked as though carved out with a pick. Here is a facsimile of the inscription. Cynthia Ann is buried here. Be easy with her, Lord, and you won't lose nothing. She was a plaguy good wife to me, but she wouldn't be druv. That Cynthia Ann had faults is evident from the tone, but I thought as I turned from the spot if her greatest fault lay in not allowing herself to be druv, her prospects were better than the average. What a contrast was the line inscribed upon a tombstone directly opposite. He sleeps in heaven. Mere speculation only and wild at that. The extravagant notion that a person sleeps in paradise must have emanated from the brain of some sluggard who thought that heaven without sleep would be a wearisome place. The sleeper's name was Greg, and from the representation of a pair of scissors cut upon the slab, I presumed he was a tailor. On making inquiry of the sexton, busily engaged, closing a grave at the time, I found my supposition was right. Greg was a tailor, but met death at the heels of a horse. To use the sexton's own words, which were spoken in pure Greek, Big water, he was a tailor, and it was myself that planted him there. He was killed in the barn beyond, while striving to pull the makings of a fish line out of the tail of old Gleason's stallion. When a person learns what his occupation had been and how he died, the assertion that he had gone to heaven strikes one as too ridiculous for anything. Not less amusing or quaint was the verse inscribed upon the plain marble slab which marked the resting place of Mr. and Mrs. Berardier. The stone was probably put up by some acquaintance of the deceased couple who knew that their marriage had been anything but a happy one. The verse upon it also informs the passers-by that they left no descendants to perform that pious duty. It said, Released from worldly care and strife, here side and side lay man and wife, and with the couple buried here expired the name of Berardier. End of section 64. Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA. Section 65 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox Mistaken Identity An amusing scene occurred this afternoon as I was coming up from the post office. It was a case of mistaken identity. It seems a somewhat dissipated old Irish woman was deserted some weeks ago by her husband. Through her domestic troubles and excessive drinking, she at times becomes quite crazy, so much so that her friends have to keep a constant watch over her to prevent her from doing mischief. She is very large and powerful, and when in one of her tantrums is no easy person to manage. It appears that when she has one of these crazy spells, she imagines she recognizes her husband's Milesian features in almost every face she looks upon. This afternoon, while the crazy fit was upon her, she escaped from her keepers and rushed into the street with dilated eyes and disheveled hair. With sleeves rolled above the elbows and clenched hands, she charged up the street, looking right and left for some person on whom to fasten. She was indeed ripe for an encounter and nearly the first person she met was a prominent clergyman returning to his residence from the mercantile library, 
with his newly selected book under his arm. She stood for a moment directly in front of the minister and riveted her red optics upon his face in an inquiring stare which soon kindled into one of recognition. Anticipating trouble, he attempted to pass around her and proceed quietly on his way, but she was too quick for him. Reaching out her long bare arm, she brought it around like the boom of a sloop, and with one wide sweep knocked his hat spinning to the sidewalk at her feet. He stooped to pick it up again, and while bent in the act, she seized him by the hair with both hands, and giving a guttural laugh not unlike the self-satisfied croak of a down-east bullfrog, exclaimed, Ah, Barney, you gallivantin' scalpeen! You can't desave me with your stovepipe. So you desart the wife of your bosom, would you? Aha! Come home with me now, or I'll be after taking your dirty old scalp along with me. A soft rabbit under the wide paw of a California lion, or a sparrow in the talons of a hawk, is not more utterly helpless than was the poor dominey in her terrible clutch. His position was anything but an enviable one. It actually seemed as if every hair upon his head was gathered and drawn into one mass over which her muscular fingers held complete control. He dropped his book and shouted loudly, partly through pain and partly anger at seeing the fate of his fashionable hat now lying under her great broad foot, flat as a German pancake. His cries of fear only made the crazy woman more confident of her abilities. She commenced backing along the street in the direction of home, and at every step, with an irresistible yank, she dragged the expostulating minister along with her over the uneven sidewalk. She had snaked him along fully two rods in this manner, and was making, to use a nautical phrase, such a good stern way that she was on the point of breaking into a trot when her heel caught on the edge of a plank. The result was terrible in the extreme. She fell backwards, pulling the unfortunate captive to the sidewalk after her, where they gyrated in the most ludicrous positions imaginable. A couple of gentlemen, emerging from a store at that instant, looked upon the pair in blank astonishment for a moment. Recognizing their own gifted pastor, they ran to his assistance and lost no time in raising him to his feet and turning over the crazy woman to an officer who happened at that moment to step out of a saloon. End of chapter 65 Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA